Good morning, everybody. I hope y'all are ready to start day two of Power to Fly's Virtual Summit 2021 series. The theme for July is uh, Tech for Social Impact, and we hope that you are just as excited as we are to continue some of the great conversations we've been having uh, starting yesterday. So throughout this upcoming conversation, um, if you want to switch the slides on my um, throughout this upcoming conversation, we would love to hear from you. So um, if you have any questions or comments for the speakers, I really, really uh, recommend that you put them um, into the, uh, the chat box. It's going to be on the right hand side of your screen. Um, that is also the place where um, if you have any kind of technical difficulties, you can tag myself. Um, my colleague Patricia is also in there. So if you have any kind of issues joining, um, you know, joining the session or uh, sorry, commenting and, and um, anything else really, just let us know and we will try and help you out as best we can. Um, so like I said, uh, if you are, if you want to participate in this, I do want to encourage you to refer to the code of conduct. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, share that into the group chat here in just a moment. And that's just there um, to make sure that this chat, like all of our virtual events, is a great experience for everyone involved. So we highly encourage you to connect with your community and um, you know, get to know each other and interact with speakers. Just make sure when you do so, you're leading from a place of kindness and respect. Um, the last but not least, if you are looking to earn SHRM credits from these talks, you can take a look at the code that's in the upper left-hand corner of the slide in front of you. That is going to be where you, that's the code you're going to need to redeem those credits for the Society of Human Resource Managers. So if you're not part of that group, don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the code. Um, so I'm really excited to bring up our speakers, but before we do that, I just want to touch real briefly on um, some of the great stuff that we have going on this week. So we've got a couple of really awesome things happening. Um, and the one thing I want to highlight is the, um, the job fair that we've got going on um, on Thursday. So if you go into the schedule, you should be able to see, or sorry, if you go into events on the, on the Power to Fly website, there should be a tab there that says virtual job fair. Um, if you have, you know, getting a ticket to, um, to this virtual summit series like you're in right now, um, allows you to go to this virtual job fair for free. So definitely go ahead and take a look at that. Um, the job fair is going to run from 12 p.m. Eastern time to 3 p.m. Eastern. And there's a lot of great companies involved. Um, Smartsheet is going to be there, Autodesk, Helm, um, which we talked to a couple of uh, people from their team yesterday. Um, so definitely check that out. There's a lot of companies in there that are open to remote positions as well. So it's definitely something you want to want to check out. Um, I'll be there in case you're worried about seeing another friendly face. And just you know, take a look at the job fair. Um, feel free to attend whether you are actively seeking or not. It's a really good way to get an inside look at some of these companies and really make sure that um, you are up to date on you know, what's going on in those companies to see if you are you know, kind of ready to connect with them. Um, all right, so as we get our speakers onboarded, the last thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is the merch store. So Power to Fly has a bonfire store, um, and that is a place where you can go to check out some really cool swag. And one of the things I wanna highlight there is that um, 100% of our proceeds from all merch sales are going to go, we're donating those directly to TransTech Social. It's an organization um, founded by Angelica Ross, um, who you might know from either past uh, involvements with these summits or her amazing work on Pose and American Horror Story um, 1984. So what this is, um, TransTech Social is an incubator for LGBTQ talent with a focus on economically empowering transgender people. So all of the funds that we donate, so 100% of the proceeds, no matter what you buy out of our bonfire store, um, and all the funds are going directly to TransTech Social and they will support um, technical boot camp fees for black, transgender, or non-binary people on their way to a career in engineering. So if you want to, um, you know, kind of get uh, get some great swag, maybe um, build out your athleisure wardrobe a little bit um, and support a great cause while doing it. That is definitely something I recommend. We still have some um, some amazing Pride Month uh, swag still in there in the shop. Um, it's really, really great. And obviously Pride is a protest and Pride is all year long. So definitely take advantage of that if you'd like. Um, all right, so I'm really excited to introduce you to, sorry, our first set of speakers today. Um, so first up, we have Brittany Cesarini. Um, hold on here, I just lost my spot in my document. There we go. 
Um, in leading GHC's communication efforts, Brittany Cesarini brings a love of words and an unwavering belief in the power of narrative to help people imagine and build a more equitable world. GHC is the Global Health Corps. Um, prior to joining them in 2016, Brittany led communications and legislative affairs for council member Fernando Cabrera in the Bronx, um, focusing on key health and immigration issues in the poorest congressional districts in the U.S. Brittany began her career piloting a community-based health program in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, uh, funded by Henry Richardson Labousse's 26 Prize. She holds a bachelor's degree in public policy, gender and sexuality studies, and African studies from Princeton University. Uh, Brittany is fluent in Swahili and an avid reader and writer. She lives in North, Northeast Pennsylvania with her husband and their young son. So welcome, Brittany. We're so happy to have you today. Thanks so much, Meg. It's great to be here. Joining Brittany is going to be Raymond Basiga. I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Please correct me. Um, Raymond is the CEO of Sparkplug, which is a software engineering and technology consulting company that partners with social change agents to create contextually ap applicable technology solutions that address social and economic challenges. Um, they provide unique insights and solutions to cater to the specific needs of the developing world um, while maintaining the highest global standards for technology service delivery. Prior to founding Sparkplug, uh, Raymond worked on disruptive technologies in the Technology for Development Unit at UNICEF Uganda. Uh, Raymond served as a Global Health Corps Fellow from 2011 to 2012, and as a MIT Africa iLabs Engineering Research Fellow for two years at Makerere University, University of Dar es Salaam, and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So welcome, Raymond. We're so happy to have you join us. Thank you, guys. Uh, Raymond will be joined in, uh, in conversation with Ian Anzwaba. Um, Ian, I am going to let you intro yourself and take it away with this amazing panel. Uh, great, uh, thank you for that. Um, hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Ian Anzabwa. Uh, I'm a talent advocate at Power to Fly. Uh, for any parties that have just joined, uh, welcome aboard the Power to Fly Tech for Social Impact Diversity Reboot Series. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet, um, well, e-meet every single individual that's chosen to take part in this conversation uh, with the one and only Global Health Corps, which is a leadership accelerator of health equity change makers. Um, since uh, 2001, uh, the Global Health Corps has built a community of health equity leaders by investing in leaders who bring real and sustainable, sustainable progress in the advancement of health equity. Uh, and today, um, as has been mentioned already, we are joined by Brittany Cesarini, the Director of uh, Communication at uh, Global Health Corps, in conversation with um, a Global Health Corps alumni and CEO of Sparkplug, Spark, uh, Sparkplug um, Raymond Besiga. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, Brittany and Raymond. Uh, great. So uh, before we dive uh, into uh, deconstructing uh, the Global Health Corps and the stellar impact it's had, uh, I'd wager it'd be prudent to get acquainted with Brittany and Ray a little more. Um, care, care to introduce yourselves, um, uh, Brittany, Ray? Sure, yeah, happy to. Thanks, Ian. And, and we've gotten some great intros already, so I'll keep it very brief just to say, really great to be here with everyone, you know, excited to be involved in this conversation around tech. I am definitely by no means a tech expert, but I do love stories and community, and I'm really, you know, grateful for how technology can fuel both of those things. And also thanks to technology, you know, we're having this very full circle moment for me where I'm here in my hometown of Scranton, I relocated here with my family last year and able to connect with people really around the world, um, interested in issues like diversity and social impact in tech. So very exciting. And as mentioned, my and at work, my role is director of communications for Global Health Corps. So my team really works to champion the cause of leadership as a powerful lever for change in global health. And we also work to build and amplify the voices and perspectives of young and rising global health leaders um, like Ray, you know, who are too often missing from decision-making tables in the sector. Um, so I'd like to just turn it over to him to intro himself as well. Hey guys, my name is Raymond. I'm the CEO of Sparkplug. Um, well, I, I think the introduction says pretty much about myself, but uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm glad to have a seat at the table. Um, I think it's important for just about everyone to have a voice and to be part of the conversation and yeah keen to see how we get that going with this uh, dialogue 
Uh, great. Uh, thank you for those intros. Um, and I suppose uh, diving straight into things, um, uh, Brittany, uh, I suppose uh, I'll begin uh, with you seeing as, of course, you are indeed um, presently engaged uh, with the gro Global Health Corps, uh, I suppose, to, uh, to an intimate degree. Um, maybe uh, tell us, uh, what is the Global Health Corps and how exactly is it unique? Yeah, thanks. So, so Global Health Corps, we often refer to it as GHC for short, so I'll do that throughout. Uh, GHC is really a leadership accelerator, as you mentioned. Uh, it was founded initially by Barbara Bush and some of her uh, close friends and peers in 2009. So we've been around for just over a decade now. And really to date, we've built this diverse global network of health equity leaders. Right now, our leaders count about 1,100 strong and growing. And, you know, you asked why GHC is unique, which I love that question because I, I think we really are filling this niche um, in global health broadly, but then also within, you know, and among leadership development programs, uh, GHC invests in health leaders really early in their careers. So while there are, you know, a range of opportunities for folks who are at senior level leadership roles or folks who are even mid-career, um, it's not all that common that, you know, young leaders who are really stepping into the sector at the start of their career are getting the kind of intense investment that GHC really provides. And it's not you know, a concentrated sort of one and done, um, you know, you join and it's a set period of time. It's really an early investment and it's an often investment. So, you know, we like to say that joining the GHC community is for life. And the way that folks join the community, just briefly, for those who are not super familiar with GHC, the entry point to our community is a 13 month paid fellowship program. So our fellows are gaining experiential experience. They're, they're working on the, the front lines of global health in Malawi, Rwanda, Uganda, and Zambia currently. And they work with a whole range of organizations, ministries of health, international organizations, um, small grassroots organizations that are community-based. And at the same time as they're working, they're making an impact in these organizations. They're also participating in GHC's leadership training. So, you know, they're building their skills, they're reflecting, they're taking time to step back from their work and see what's going well, what's not going so well, how is there room to grow? And they're also connecting with each other and building trusting relationships, which, you know, we've seen during COVID that, that those kinds of relationships are really the currency for, for making a greater impact. It takes, you know, more than individuals. And so the ability to be in community in a network is really important. And then beyond the fellowship, uh, folks transition to our alumni community and they continue to access, you know, coaching, mentorship, training, seed funding, you know, community building opportunities. Our alumni programming is really expanding and we're working with dozens of partners across the globe, really trying to help our alumni grow as effective, collaborative, influential leaders so that they can propel their careers and their impact on health systems. So, while yes, I am, you know, intimately involved with GHC in the day to day, I'd say, you know, Ray as an alum and many of our other alumni continue to be really involved in the community, you know, in addition to their sort of full day to day commitments at work and personally. This is a very apparent element, even of course, on uh, on uh, on the GHC website. Uh, why do you reckon it's fundamental to focus on leadership for better health outcomes? Yeah, sure. I, I can share, and then you know, Ray, if you'd like to add anything, definitely feel free. Um, you know, from our perspective at GHC. We see that you know, there have been amazing medical advances, amazing technological advances, but still many people are suffering and dying from preventable illnesses and injuries. And so you know, we see that there's this gap, that health systems are not as strong as they could be. And we think that leadership is a really important intervention to fill that gap. So you know, if you look at who leaders are and how they lead and how they show up, that can really be a matter of life and death for the communities that they're serving. Um, but leadership development is, is really this overlooked lever for change. It doesn't get all that much investment in global health. Um, you know, we think about systems as needing strengthening, but we often don't think about who necessarily is doing that strengthening, right? And that's people. Um, so we are focused on developing systems leaders, as I said, you know, who are intentionally developed at every level of their career early and often, um, providing them with the support and the resources they need to design equitable systems um, to strengthen them throughout their careers. Um, and we think that there's immense potential in this kind of intervention, again, as a complement to other sort of health interventions that are more focused on the, the medical and technological aspects of health. 
Um, so Ray, anything to, to add to that? Yeah, I think one thing I would add to that is the more interesting thing about Global Health Corps is that leadership is not just about people, it's also about context. Because uh, what happens is that people move into uh, a place or region or organization and they're working within that cultural context and with the people there. And then you're trying to figure out what kind of people do we need? What kind of skills do we need? to really build um, a, a foundation for the change we want to see. And I thought that was a really interesting approach and one of the greatest things about Global Health Corps. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. It, it is definitely an, an interesting point um, of leaders as drivers um, of, of agendas and initiatives and, and kind of grouping health into that space kind of helps drive it along even further. That's um, rather impressive, GHC. <laughs> Um, uh, moving along, um, still concerns, of course, uh, the GHC program. Um, uh, Brittany, I'm curious, um, how do you go about selecting candidates for the program? I know you happen to gross over it um, uh, really quickly um, at the beginning, but could you maybe uh, uh, give a, a bit a, a more detailed um, uh, outline? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, you know, we are recruiting, selecting training leaders like Ray and many of his peers, you know, that's sort of a yearly process for us. Every year we're welcoming people into our fellowship and into our community, and we consistently have high demand. So, uh, you know, we a lot of young people are excited about getting involved in global health. They're coming out, applying to our program, trying to get involved in the community and you know, unfortunately, given uh, current resources, we're able to select only about two to three percent of those who apply. So it is quite a competitive program and consistently high demand for it. Uh, and the, the folks we're really looking for in terms of how we select them, um, as I mentioned, we're targeting those who are early career. So specifically, we define that as um, people who are eligible for the fellowship is 21 to 30 years old. And Ray mentioned, you know, we're bringing people in from lots of different backgrounds. And that's hugely important, we think, to, uh, you know, advancing health equity. So we're really looking for people who don't necessarily have clinical backgrounds, but rather bring a range of skill sets. So architects, data analysts, supply chain experts, communicators, you know, policy experts, um, folks who are bringing lots of different perspectives and skill sets to bear on really complex health challenges. And then in addition to sort of their heart, you know, their, their skills in a functional area, we're also looking for people who show a commitment to what we call our leadership practices. So um, there are six of them. I'll just kind of briefly run through them. They are be committed to social justice, inspire and mobilize, be self-aware and committed to learning, um, collaborate, adapt and innovate and get results. So we're looking for people who, you know, have demonstrated that they are committed to doing these things, to growing in these. We call them practices because you grow, you know, throughout your career, you never sort of arrive and you've got it. Um, it's an ongoing practice. And our process for selection is pretty rigorous. It's a five stage process. Uh, it engages GHC staff, our current fellows, our alumni, our partner organizations, and everybody is involved in different aspects of assessing um, who is the best fit, both for the specific roles we're recruiting for, as well as, as I said, sort of overall fit with the community and our values. Uh -huh. I think okay. Ray's been involved in that process most likely, and of course went through it as a fellow himself. Um, so it can probably provide a different perspective there. Oh, yeah, and, and, and uh, I think I'll, I'll definitely get to that in a bit as well. Uh, but uh, before I, I dive into, uh, of course, um, Raymond's perspective, um, oh, Brittany, what do you think uh, the impact of the GHC has been so far? Yeah, sure. So, so GHC has trained, as I said, about 1,100 leaders since 2009, and they represent 48 nationalities and counting. Uh, the, the majority of them are women who are, you know, overall, we know that women are vastly underrepresented in global health leadership. So we're proud of that. Uh, about half of our community are African nationals, the majority of our people of color. Um, so it's a very diverse community. And as I said, lots of different skill sets represented, different perspectives. And for us, you know, we don't think about impact in, in sort of the typical manner as, you know, we're scaling. It's not, it's not linear just in terms of um, hard numbers. 
Our community does grow each year as we recruit and welcome a new fellow cohort. Um, we just did that actually a couple of weeks ago. We have our newest cohort just joined us at the beginning of July. So we're very excited about that. And our impact grows really as our leaders deepen their capacity to drive systems change. So they participate in our programming to become, as I said, more effective, collaborative, influential leaders. And we see that as a way to kind of catalyze this ripple effect of change throughout health systems. So, you know, just to give us an example of some of the specific metrics that we do assess, you know, things like 76% of our alumni report collaborating with each other for greater impact. 99% um, attribute their professional accomplishments in part to their GHC engagement. Uh, about 82% of them are in mid to senior level roles. So that tells us that they're continuing to grow in their careers. Uh, our alumni are twice as likely to stay in global health or social impact as finalists for the fellowship program. And that's important because, you know, in order to make an impact on health systems, you really need to be in it for the long haul. So um, we know that in global health, leaders are subjected to quite a lot of challenges. There is really a risk of burnout. So, you know, it's important to us that our alumni are, are likely to stay in the sector. And we think that that's because, you know, they have this supportive network. They have um, you know, programming that helps them build resilience, they can count on each other. Um, so they're, again, in it for the long haul, continuing to make an impact over the long term. Um, uh, great. Uh, th thank you for that, Brittany. Um, so actually, now I I'd like to um, hop on over uh, to, to you, Ray. Actually, I'm held off as well, because I'm um, being an alumni, you're, of course, privy to um, a, a somewhat, uh, I suppose, a different experience. Um, uh, with with the Global Health Core, could you tell us a little about a little about your um your Global Health Core experience? Um, for instance, um, what was your fellowship like, and uh, how have you stayed connected um uh, as an alumni? Um, great question. So it was a uh, well, Global Health Core was my very first experience with uh, Global Health. I, I I came in as an electrical engineer, um, uh -huh. computer scientist, um, and. Luckily for us, there was a, an orientation period for two weeks, just about at Yale University, and we got to meet all these leaders in global health. It was a baptism of fire in the best way. Uh, we learned a lot, and um, after that, well, the good thing about it was that you got, we got to meet all these leaders, and I was lucky to create a relationship with one of them, Paul Ellingshead. I think it was the the head of global social responsibility at HP at the time and he became my mentor um, and we became really good friends I visited his family a few times he visited me in Uganda a few times uh, but not just as personal friends where we were professional we it's a mentor mentee mentor relationship where we kind of mentor each other and are mentored by the other so it was a good relationship but in addition to that orientation experience i think you learn a lot from your peers uh every quarter where you meet reflect and adjust accordingly and try and make plans for the next three months or so based off of uh, the feedback you get from your peers your experience their experience and uh your your, your domain of expertise in a way so it was a really good experience in that sense um felt quite supported uh, great. Uh, thank you for that, Ray. Um, uh, I suppose more so, uh, I'm curious as well. I mean, seeing as you are you are indeed uh, working with Sparkplug uh, presently, could you maybe tell us a little bit about your company? And uh, maybe uh, are we <laughs> going to see maybe a GHC Sparkplug um, <laughs> come together anytime soon in the future? <laughs> I mean, well, uh, you, you never know. You know, we cannot really tell the future. But uh, what I can say is that... Um, uh, GHC lay, laid the groundwork for the formation of Sparkplug because after GHC, I worked with uh, UNICEF Uganda in what was then Technology for Development before it became UNICEF Innovate. And uh, we were working on maternal and child health projects. We were working on uh, primary school education, reporting metrics. Uh, I was personally working on a, an education project and being able to, um, so one thing, is that technology can be used for good, it can be used for bad things, but ultimately it's about the people that choose how they use it. And seeing how we were using technology units at the time allowed for me to transition out of that into starting Sparkplug with a, a premise to do social good, you know? Um, and I think from the get-go, we had really good partners like Clinton Health Access Initiative, 
We were building a commodity management platform for the national medical stores in Uganda. Uh, we're working with the Stocky Hearing Foundation. So it was a really good foundation for understanding what impact looks like from, you can have impact in global health without being uh, a, a public health professional. There's, I think there's many needs within the context of global health that can be held by technology and other uh, professions. And so that, that was the foundation for SparkPlug. Right now, we're mostly doing a lot of work in digital financial services and trying to uh, provide tools that help build the financial inclusion agenda. Uh, most recently, we've been doing work with the World Bank CGAP and MTN Group to create an open API for MTN Mobile Money. Uh, MTN is the, the one of the biggest telecommunications groups in Africa, and so being able to provide that tool for them meant that a lot more people were brought into the formal financial sector. Um, yeah, that that's that's what we're doing. Well, thank you for that, Ray. And um, it's funny, you should bring up uh, two elements that actually I latched on uh, latched on to um, as you spoke. Um, the whole, I suppose, technology and impact factor. Um, and I was instantly drawn to the whole element of COVID-19, our present predicament, right? <laughs> um, obviously, uh, during COVID-19, technology has played a huge role in keeping people connected, right? But um, what has that looked like within um, uh, uh, the global health core uh, network, uh, which of course spans the globe. Um, uh, Brittany uh, Ray, feel free to take it away. Um, uh, honestly, feel free to chime in, uh, both, both chime in as well if you'd like it. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I can go first. So, I mean, one way I can think about it is that um, there's a tool that we built uh, as far as like called Akabo. It's uh, Uganda's only crowdfunding platform online crowdfunding platform. And around about the time when COVID started, some of the fellows from the alumni network in Uganda created a campaign in Akabo and they were fundraising for uh, a hand washing sort of uh, a, a booth uh, in a market because uh, only market vendors were allowed to sort of operate. But, you know, the fear of them catching COVID, you know, the, 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 the alumni network came together to uh, fundraise for a, a hand washing station for them. And I thought that was really cool. One of the ways in which technology really helps is, well, one, um, it is cashless. So you just donate online and, and then you're able to remit this money to uh, you know, construction workers and then build this thing. So I thought that was really cool because uh, it, it allowed for that social uh, connection in a way. This, you're socially close, but physically distanced. I think that's, I mean, that's that's the main uh, takeaway from COVID-19 social dynamics, so, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Brittany, I uh, care to chime in as, as well. Of course, from a real-time perspective, having worked within uh, the GHC as all this played out. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll say that like many other organizations, you know, our programming was in person before, uh, you know, Ray's cohort and many others after were able to meet in person throughout their fellowship year. And we were able to really pivot our programming to virtual. So bo for both our fellows and our alumni, you know, we recognize that people were feeling more isolated than ever, would need to continue to be connected. And in particular, uh, we need to be able to lean on each other and, and sort of support each other in their local COVID-19 responses because it was something that everyone around the world was trying to, to respond to. Um, and of course, there are challenges with virtual programming. You know, we know that broadband access is not equal across the globe, um, but we also saw some really exciting opportunities where you know, our team does a lot of pitching young leaders in our network for global conferences, you know, trying to get them on those stages. And oftentimes we run into challenges around lack of funding for travel or visa restrictions and those kinds of hurdles, you know, in the space where more folks were doing virtual events, a lot of them were removed. And so there were a lot more opportunities for more diverse voices, more underrepresented voices to be present in those global spaces. So I think going forward, even as the world, you know, is still combating COVID, trying to recover from it, 
um, gradually. There will be some takeaways around, you know, we need to open up access. We need to continue to hear from these folks who, um, you know, who are, again, underrepresented in these spaces. And then, you know, on the GUC specific side, we just wrapped up Training Institute. We had done it all virtual. So Ray mentioned being in person with his peers and experts during his orientation training institute at the start of the fellowship. Uh, for this cohort, it's everything is on Zoom. So we've tried really hard to build that same sense of community. Um, just this morning, we have our incoming fellows overlapping with our outgoing fellows and they were meeting together, you know, sharing wisdom. The outgoing fellows are sharing some really hard won uh, lessons learned and giving advice and just establishing those relationships so that uh, the, the new fellows coming in feel that they have the support that they need. And then on the alumni program side, we also recognize that in communities, you know, where we had some hubs, some uh, critical masses of alumni, they were able to come together. We provided them with some funding and some programming support to create COVID-19 coalitions. So to do a lot of the work that, that Ray mentioned around things like, you know, we realize that people in our community need a hand washing station. That's a very real time need. How can we come together and, you know, design an intervention to meet that need? So we were able to mobilize um, COVID-19 coalitions in eight different countries where we have GHC alumni. Um, so have been working on that. And, and on the whole, you know, our team and community have, I would say the transition has been somewhat smooth to, to working virtually because we were accustomed to having a global team, you know, working across time zones, using tools like Zoom and WhatsApp and navigating um, those differences. So it's been both challenging and I think has opened our eyes to what other opportunities are out there that we can keep embracing. Uh, uh, thank you for that, uh, Brittany. I'm and so I, sorry to step in, y'all. I don't mean to, to cut y'all short, but unfortunately, we do have to move on to the next chat. I'm so, so sorry. Um, did y'all want to drop any information about where people can follow you or reach out to you? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there, Raymond Pasiga. Thank you. Yeah, should I, should I, I'll just put in the chat um, the GHC website and our Twitter handles. All right. Thanks so much. That's perfect. And I'm so, so sorry to have to cut us short, guys. This was a really interesting talk. I waited as long as I could because I was really wrapped with attention. So thank you so much for being here. And Ian, great job. Um, it was really, really nice to get to, um, to get to listen in on this conversation. So thank you to you all. Um, all right, as we move on into our next panel, I just want to say a quick hi to anybody who might just now be joining us. Um, we are part, we're uh, into day two of Powerfly's virtual uh, summit for tech for social impact. Um, I'm going to put some more information into the Zoom, or sorry, into the group chat as we go. But as we get started here, I would just like to introduce you to our speakers. First up, we have Sasha Lippman, who is the founder of Tech to Impact, which is a global digital hub for the impact tech ecosystem. Um, it has, it's an ecosystem of more than 400 founders, accelerators, and investors located all the way from the USA to Australia. Um, then joining her will be Babette Kirshner, and I'm so sorry if I have her last name pronounced incorrectly. Um, Babette is a communications professional with a focus on strategic communication, content creation, and storytelling for Tech to Impact. She considers herself a translator between organizations and their respective stakeholders and has helped startups turn their vision and mission into tangible values and action as a freelance consultant for over four years. Um, they will be joined in conversation with our own amazing Lauren Haggerty, who is the Director of Marketing and Community at Power to Fly, as well as the, uh, the genius behind our chat and learn series. So I will turn the stage over to you, Lauren. Take it away. Thanks so much, Megan. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you and really excited for this conversation uh, and to learn more about Tech to Impact and, of course, these two incredible professionals' journeys. So thank you both for being here, first of all. Um, let's start by talking about those career journeys and what got y'all to where you are today. So I'm going to start with you, Sasha. What led you to really start Tech to Impact? First of all, hello everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here and thanks for having us. Um, so from my side, I think it's a mixture. Um, I come from a mixture of impact driven and startup tech ecosystem background. I used to be part of ISEC, which is a youth led organization globally for more than five years in different countries. 
and landed accidentally in the startup scene for another five years. And that's how the whole combination between tech and impact inherently came with me together and working in more than five years in startup ecosystem. I've been working in accelerators, incubators, with investors, with startups. And I think the one thing which always was ringing my bell inside was why do we have so many great ventures which are positioned as nonprofits only or impact as a charity versus investments in investing in startups, which are not per se solving anything, in my opinion, relevant <laughs> and any real problems. So I think that's where the frustration of these years led to the point that we decided to found Tech to Impact to actually bring together and all the ecosystems, both impact and tech, and to really showcase and position uh, impact tech as a new norm in the ecosystem of innovation. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. It's amazing. And I'll admit that I actually was introduced um, to tech to impact from Babette. We met at a networking session and it was pretty much instantaneous. I needed to hear more about what y'all were doing and how you, you know, were leveraging all of these different pieces of so many different things that we'll get to in just a bit, but to really make a difference in this space. So Babette, what, what about you? What motivated you to join Tech to Impact? Um, I mean, I've, I've always, it might be a, a Gen Z cliche, but I've always really wanted to work for companies that really provide some, some value and some meaning and, and where my work would really make a difference in society as a whole and not just necessarily, you know, on the shareholder's balance sheet. And I've kind of been part of, you know, like impact startups um, when I was you know, younger and still back in Vienna. I used to study law before I embarked on my communications journey, but I was always really much drawn to the startup in the communication sphere. So it's kind of like, you know, this, this red thread that has been going through my professional career for as long as I can remember. And then with Tech to Impact, I actually uh, was introduced to the organization by a dear friend of mine who I've worked with at another impact venture, um, again, a couple of years ago. And uh, I, I mean, I would never really think that ranting about UK politics on my private blog would, would bring me to, to an organization as fantastic as Tech to Impact, but that's kind of how I started out. Um, and then it just, I don't know, being part of Tech to Impact and seeing all of the amazing ventures that we work together with just kind of like instantly drew me to become more and more and more involved um, up to the point where I'm now leading the communications team uh, at the organization. It's amazing. And <laughs> it's, it, again, it's fascinating what y'all are doing and, and really, uh, you know, how much it's impacting so many different, uh, you know, verticals. So tell us a little bit more about what Tech to Impact is, what y'all do, how y'all are helping people, and then we'll kind of get into some of the um, sustainable development goals, but let's give us like a high level overview of what y'all do. Sure. Robert, want to take over here? <laughs> <laughs> sure, of course. So we're a global virtual hub for the Impact Tech ecosystem. And at the centerpiece of everything that we do are our startup members, of course. So these are startup founders whose product or service works towards solving one of the 17 sustainable development goals developed by the United Nations. So these are 17 goals that we as society set ourselves that need to be reached within the next couple of years in order to ensure sustainable development for not just, you know, one country, but the entirety of society. So, you know, quite high level things. And there are amazing startups that are doing, you know, that are using technology to really accelerate the solution of these SDGs. And what we really try to do with Tech to Impact is give them a support ecosystem to thrive and grow in an environment where, you know, like where the impact that they make can just be accelerated to a degree where it really makes an impact on society. And then we also engage other stakeholders like corporates who want to be part of this driven innovation and also investors who want to invest in, in impact tech startups, um, as well as, you know, other partners like accelerators and incubators, just kind of being a little bit of the mouthpiece for, for impact tech startups, like Sasha mentioned in the beginning. Um, I think especially a couple of years ago, being an impact tech startup automatically put you in this category of being a charity or being non-for-profit, but this is of course not the case. And I think that's kind of really what we're also there to champion with, you know, everybody that we talk to, because we've kind of made the experience that, you know, as soon as you kind of really enlighten or teach people what it actually means to be an impact tech startup people are you know on board automatically it's a bit like you said lauren like you just want to hear more but it's kind of like about this spark about finding this tipping point with different you know stakeholders and engaging them in the best possible way to support our startups was there anything you wanted to add sasha 
I think I've mentioned a lot of things. <laughs> um, I think one maybe important thing to highlight is the overall mission of organization and what we are trying to achieve. Um, we were trying to play around a lot in terms of how to really word it out because we've been ranting about it so so long in so many long copies and explanations and public talks and everything. But at some point, some of our team members said, oh, it's like making it the new norm, right? And we're like, yes, thank you. <laughs> we needed this exactly phrase um, because in, in this point, if you look in the ecosystem of tech as such, of course, there is a very growing, fantastically growing trend um, in terms of impact being prioritized. And especially, unfortunately, due to COVID, it's more highlighted and showcased that we need to address things which are a bit more important than just having another dating app or something like that, right? So in this case, for us, what it means is means making impact tech the new norm is the mission of everything we do. Versus for, for if this, for example, if versus it's, for example, a conversation when it comes to giving startups a spot in your accelerator or putting them on your investment priority or giving them a space in your media magazine, right? So it doesn't need to be, I'm not investing in startups, so I'm not part of the whole thing. It's not because even by purchasing particular brands, you invest, whether it's your money, your product or everything you do, you invest your time and you invest your own money. So that's why we want to make sure that everything we can possibly do and the end results to this not anymore needing to be our mission because it is a norm. So that's something we're aiming for with pretty much everything we do. It's incredible. And again, so much to unpack here. And I want to save space in just a few minutes to for our audience to ask y'all questions. So if anyone has any questions, start typing them in the chat now. And we will ask these two incredible panelists the questions in just a few minutes. Um, but I want to talk more about, you know, kind of what you said, Sasha, about like, it's, it's hard to explain what you do and you really need to kind of talk it out and it can mean many different things. Um, and we saw on your website, I love this quote, technology per se is not the answer to all of our problems. We believe that it's the perfect tool to accelerate societal and environmental change. Could not have said it better myself. So can you elaborate on how Tech to Impact really facilitates that change? And you know, what are some of the technological resources that you provide people with or just resources in general um, for people who are interested in starting an impactful startup? Sure. Sure. Um, I think this phrase kind of is one of the, one of the things which our Babat put into words, which are in my head, which is a fantastic duo we usually have. <laughs> um, so I I've been fascinated by technology, and I think if you, if you reflect on the fact how much technology have evolved in the last couple of years and what's possible to do with technology now, it's mind blowing, right? From basic things like, hey, we can connect online and have a conversation media like we have now to things like, hey, let's just revolutionize the whole the whole financial ecosystem by blockchain and the cryptocurrencies and everything, right? Or there's so many tools we have or so many fantastic ventures we have in our space that I can rant about it for legit three hours in front of us. But think about it the following, like you have, for example, a VR, right? Which is you think about VR, it's, oh, it's just gaming or it's something which is like fun and cool and everything. But what if you look in the VR as the tool to address chronic pain and train your brain to stop chronic pain from the inside, right? One of the ventures we have in the ecosystem. Or if you look into the things which are connected to health stack even more when you look in the direction of let's look into cancer right so we have cancer issues how can we use technology to actually extract people's cells to test on them different medicine and see how it influences or looking more into the climate direction how things with drones can prevent forests from freaking out and firing the whole thing so there's so many elements of technology which can be done with things I mentioned, which are not complicated ones, right? But then there are also things like, like low, low tech and apps, which are giving access to people to be able to actually transfer money to overseas where there is no banks like in Lebanon right now. So this type of things is what technology is for us. And this is why we always say it's not the end solution because in the end of the day is one of our great mentors and friends as you're always saying, technology is as good as people are behind it. Uh, but it is a fantastic tool itself. Um, from our side, 
point, uh, we are more a bring, bring together kind of people. <laughs> so we do use different tools to connect our global digital hub, like Zoom and Slack and all of those typical things, because for us, it's not about technological advancement of tech to impact, but versus actually connections we can build between our tech startups and our mentors and our accelerator partners to actually multiplicate and the advancement of technology in the ecosystem we have right now. So yeah, and I think uh, just kind of like to continue with that, I think a really good example for that is our mentorship program, because of course, all of our startups that are you know, within that program have a technological solution, but they might have other needs like growth hacking or go to market strategy. So it's really about providing these these startups with, you know, an ecosystem where they can actually, you know, where they can actually grow and where they can actually achieve, you know, whatever they set out themselves to to want to achieve. And that also includes, you know, technology like we have virtual webinars, of course, that we give to them. But like you said, it's more, mostly about, you know, bringing people from all corners of the world together and kind of finding common ground. Amazing. And I wrote down, I had to, Sasha, the technology is good as the people who are behind it, because that's, you know, you have, we are huge proprietors of that at Power to Fly. And, you know, something that someone had said at one point is, you know, Power to Fly is a lot of or you know bots with hearts um, or hearts with bots so uh, it's you know technology is nothing without the people who you know are growing and learning and thinking um, which I think is really fascinating that y'all just have this vast array of opportunity for you know whoever is interested in making an impact and that actually nicely leads to this next question um, if someone were to enroll in the tech to impact ecosystem, what would that journey look like from start to finish? So we have a lot of folks involved. <laughs> so I think we're gonna split here with the button, take it from different directions. Um, so I'm gonna start with startups, right? Which are main heart of everything we do. It's very simple. We have a criteria for startups to join. So it needs to be impact driven, really impact first, of course, profit together, but impact first, where solutions are not just contributing by donating money or donating resources, but actually addressing one of the sustainable development goals. It needs to be tech. It can be anything from low to hardcore things like hardware, software, deep tech innovation, stuff like that. Um, and location doesn't matter. We have, as you mentioned, already folks from all the way from Costa Rica to India. <laughs> so location doesn't even matter for us at all. Um, and of course, that they, they want to join art. That's kind of, we don't force anyone to do that. Um, so the journey is very simple. Startup sign up. Um, we look over, we evaluate as green startups. Then if everything fits, we get them on board and they get, you know, access to our Swedish table, which we call our ecosystem. So you come, you take whatever you want and you bring whatever you can. Uh, we have a lot of things for startups. We, as we have a very close founders network. We have Slack with the whole ecosystem of 450 members. Uh, we have different access to knowledge hubs and learning sessions. We do a lot of showcasing. We try to really create connections versus just having names and numbers in the ecosystem sheet. Um, so that's where we do a lot of networking events, a lot of connections, and we try as much as possible to showcase every venture. So as simple as that, the entry is very simple to come. So if, if any if Impact Tech Ventures wants to join, we're always happy to get them on board. And it doesn't matter where they are or what exactly they do as soon as they fit the criteria. So that's in terms of startups. And in terms of the second, one of the biggest uh, stakeholders we also now bring on board is investors. Um, so investors are joining as investor partners. Uh, so we do connect regularly our investor partners with startups in the ecosystem. So whenever they are fundraising and we see that there is a great match with one of our investor partners, we make sure that there is introduction. We also host uh, welcome pitch nights and things like this for investors to really connect with the right startups because what we realized that startups are not anymore just hunger for the capital. They really want to work with someone who's right fit because I think the more now the conversation is also one of our mentors always saying is it doesn't need to be startups running after VCs, but VCs after startups because there is enough capital, but not enough good innovation itself. So that's, that's the attitude we also foresee and push it further. So that's um, in terms of this two stakeholders, and I think Babette can take on from the other two we have. <laughs> exactly, and then of course we have our our, our partners slash our corporate partners. So as a partner, the, the way it usually works is that on one hand, if you would just like to become a partner of the Tech to Impact ecosystem, it's pretty straightforward. We, we schedule a call with one of our partnership leads, and then we try to find synergies of, you know, how can we create, you know, the best, you know, win-win situation for, for both of the organizations. 
And then we also have our you know, purpose-driven innovation services to corporate partners. So this could, for example, include hackathons for students or, um, or even becoming you know, part of the global impact tech ecosystem as such, or organizing employee boot camps. You know, again, trying to really figure out what each corporate needs, um, figuring it out together with them and how we can create the most impact together with them, of course. Um, and then we also have our team, our lovely, <laughs> our lovely team of over 15 people at this point. It's, you know, it amazes me every single time I see us at our weekly meetings. And you know, the way it works, um, again, we're currently actually recruiting for a communications lead slash marketing lead, but the way that usually works is again, you get in touch with us, we see if there's a good fit. We 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 have a conversation about, you know, where are you here? You know, like what SDG is your favorite? That's Sasha's favorite question to ask <laughs> during the interview process. Mine is is quality education but uh, kind of you know just figuring out um, what 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 the best role for each and every person can be in the tech to impact ecosystem I think kind of as a team member what I really appreciate is the opportunity to just grow and to just you know dare to try things out and really kind of you know go out of our way to to make everybody feel really welcome and really really exactly. really exactly. empowered <laughs> exactly because for us the logic of the team it's uh, we want great people we don't want to fill in the positions only so that's why if you look in the whole team we kind of had people come and be like I like what you do can I join okay let's figure out what position we are making for you so <laughs> that's kind of how the whole team evolved and to be honest as a founder I can tell you it's been only one year right but everything I imagined it to be is completely involved on the steroid level because of the great talent I'm lucky enough to have like Babette and the other 14 people we have who are part of tech to impact also based all over the world at some point we actually like we're seeing each other now like a month ago me and Babette after working one yes. year to be the remote <laughs> so weird the it's very like, oh first year was so bizarre <laughs> seeing Sasha yes. in person yep so yeah it's amazing <laughs> dropping some uh, exclusives here for anyone who's watching and wants to apply love it please join <laughs> <laughs> um let's talk a little bit about I'm just watching the clock tick down here um about the responsible technology assessment so what is it and how does it work? You remember the phrase, right? The one you really liked about technology being as good as the people are behind it. That's kind of what was hunting us down since day one. I, the more I was selling to people is like, guys, technology is the, the way to go. It's another, it was this little small nudge inside and be like, mm, but it's also part of the problem, which is true <laughs> right? in some way. And I love this phrase. I'm going to give you one more phrase. Um, technology is neither good nor bad nor neutral. And this is so true. Because yes, people are behind it and yes, people stand behind it, but you never know if there is a wrong decision done, where it can take you. Like look at the Facebook, what happened with Cambridge Analytica, right? And there's so many, we can give you millions of examples, right? If there is a crazy thing like the dispenser soap in the bathroom, which doesn't react to color skin, like what is this? Like, how could you not test it out? So things like that, which um, we realize that if we promote technology as advancement and technology as the way to go, we also need to be responsible enough to make sure it's not the way to go other direction. So the assessment itself was the result of one intensive conversation with our partners from the Institute of Technological Ethics all the way in Australia, because we like working globally, um, as a discussion of like debate we had here in Vienna in terms of technology it was saying, hey, let's do one webinar. Oh, let's do something else. And let's turn it into the whole frigging project of assessment and make it big. So that's how it escalated. So we started... Uh, to look into the main topics where every tech founder can evaluate themselves on because it's not, you know, ethics is such a subjective topic from one side, but also has a lot of standards things people don't look into. And for some reason, it's still perceived as, oh, I'm going to look into it when I'm rich and gigantic corporate versus, hey, I want to look into it now to make sure the decisions I'm making are right ones and so don't create another evil. So that's why we create a responsible technology assessment, which is free and accessible to anyone in the world at any point they want to take it, which is to 10 to 15 minutes assessment when you go through 20 single select questions and you get an in the end to score how ethical is your business towards society, especially your technology, because we look in um, main, di main dimensions, which are six of them, but we'll tell a bit more about it, but that's kind of the logic behind it. And that's why responsible technology and impact technology, these are the two main topics we address as tech to impact right now. And Babat, maybe you can tell more about the topic. Yeah, so basically, I mean, a little bit like Sasha also mentioned, I think a big part of, you know, being a responsible business is, is being aware that you have blind spots. You know, like you said, I, I'm, I'm entirely sure, you know, when Mark Zuckerberg set out to create Facebook, he didn't necessarily think of the democratic implications that that might have had. 
But, you know, the question is, you know, why shouldn't businesses think big? Why shouldn't businesses analyze different aspects of their business? And then the six ones that we decided on were, you know, of businesses that they need to to at least be aware of are on one hand business ethics. So this means, you know, company values, gender diversity and racial diversity. And then the next one would be social cultural understanding, which just means that you understand your consumers and you are aware of, you know, the need for inclusive language and you know, inclusivity as such. Um, in, in your technological solution. And then we also have things like technology design. Um, this things include things like algorithmic bias. I mean, we also have uh, main blogs where we, we had a very big content creation <laughs> push uh, for the responsible technology assessment as well, because you know it kind of goes hand in hand with telling people a little bit more about what it even is. And then one of them, uh, one of the articles was very much focused on cautionary tales of technology. And then I think one of the, one of the implications of, 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 of data or algorithm make bias was that um, an, an app that is used in the US to determine how likely um, an offender is to reoffend was very heavily skewed towards, you know, people of color, which of course, you know, that's that that's not the way that that technology should should be enabled to use. And then we also have four um, three main risks, one of them being health risks, the other one is democratic risks and then social risks. So this can include everything from your app causing addiction, anxiety or depression, or maybe your 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 technological solution enabling, you know, misinformation or uh, enabling antisocial behavior um, or bad actors and how prone that is to hijacking. So it was really supposed to be kind of like a self, like it's not an, it's not a B Corp certification. It's supposed to be the very first, like one of the first steps for you to start thinking about what does it mean to be responsible and ethical as a business, regardless of, you know, size or shape or location. And we've actually kind of uh, taken it one step further. Um, maybe Sasha could talk a little bit sure, more sure. about that um, as well. I mean, we, we realized quickly. very quickly that, um, it's great starting conversation, but a lot of people don't know what they don't know. And that's why soon, uh, by the end of the year, we're launching Responsible Technology Academy. So if any folks of you here want to participate, it's open to anyone who works with technology or who understands technology, want to learn better. What are the elements? What are the things you need to know as a business or as any tech creator or tech user um, in terms of running your company in responsible matter and what you should be careful and avoid? So we're going to make it into a three-month program with peer-to-peer -peer learning, with a lot of insights and understanding for people to really be aware how it works and not just put it on the shelf or for later. So that's how it goes. You'll have to drop the link in the chat so we can share that with everyone on the line. But I have one more question and then I want to just get all of your promotional links and how we can reach you. But I love this last question. Um, what are some of, or what are some tech for social impact startups that have come out of your incubator um, that we should look out for that you're excited about? <laughs> <laughs> okay, how much time do I have? One hour, three hours? <laughs> okay, to be fair, guys, first of all, techteamimpact.com slash startups, and you see all of them. We have an impact tech creator where you can browse them, see any issues you want to address and which technologies they do. So just for you guys to look into the bigger scope of picture. But whew, where do I start? <laughs> oh, where pick is the gene, I can tell you which solution we have. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, of course. Um, so one thing which I'm very fascinated about is, of course, in the direction of health tech. So, for example, we have a great solution in Spain, which helps epileptic people with preventing seizures. So you can actually have a calm, calm life in, in having understanding where your seizure might come in. So you can be in a safe space, for example, or looking more into quality education. We have great technology startup from Tunisia helping kids with dyslexia to adjust to learning materials and actually be able to work with them. We have great startup from Austria, Dreamwaves, which one of our great members who is transforming the whole audio navigation for blind people to be able to go around the cities and to actually have easier life versus just being reliable on, on Braille and so on and so forth. So things like that, of course, and of course, more, uh, more in-depth tech solutions, which are preventing for forest fires, which are looking more into the direction of clean water sanitation, for example, folks from Germany, which developed a spin-off from university, which developed a powder, which absorbs microplastic, you know, this memes was, uh, can I get a plastic bag and really have it inside the fish kind of thing, which they're addressing with their solution. We do have a lot of 3D folks, um, also a lot of hardware folks who are creating 3D bionic arm 
and things like that. And of course, we have a lot of apps for addressing mental health, the apps for helping you actually to change your behavior to a more sustainable one, and so on and so forth. So <laughs> can talk about it forever. techteampact.com slash startups, you can check all of them. And we also have an editorial line called 99 Change Makers, where there are actual stories of people behind the ventures. I would really recommend you folks to go and read it. I think we have right now more than 10 folks, um, their positions, which are very interesting stories, how they came to the solution. Incredible. But if I'm missing anybody you want, you want to bring up, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's I think it's, of them. <laughs> it's a lot. And I think that's really kind of also what really the energy, you know, my energy personally also going with Tech to Impact. I think it just gets, you know, each and every month we're, we're continuing to onboard new startup members. And it's just, you know, the biggest story to kind of, you know, you read and you're like, wow, you know, this is possible. Like, this is amazing. And then the next step is, okay, we're really going to make this, you know, we need to get help this, you know, get bigger. Exactly. Love it. In one minute, how can everyone here find you? You said techtoimpact.com slash uh, startups. That's where they can see, um, you know, who you work with. But what about each of you individually? Or is there anything else that you want to promote or share? Here you go. Send all the links. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Perfect. Everything That's... in there. <laughs> perfect so our website is there. Website is there. Our latest 99 change maker feature is also there. And you can, you know, reach us on, on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Instagram and then us personally through one of those accounts. We're usually tagging each other as well as our team dog Pluto. So very connected. It should all be there. <laughs> Please, guys, if you are a startup, join us. If you are an enthusiast who likes what we do, we want to contribute and work with us. Just message us. We are one of the fastest teams to respond. We think in general. Uh, if you're an investor and you're investing in startups, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to onboard you in our ecosystem. Same if you're an accelerator incubator. And of course, if you're working with technology, or you're a corporate or scale up or anyone working with technology, check our resources. We are happy to bring you on board for our Responsible Technology Academy um, and to help you to learn more about that. So just follow us, reach, reach us. We are happy to support everyone. The more of us, the better. <laughs> and thanks very much for having us here. Thank you both so much. This was lovely. I have thoroughly enjoyed speaking with each of you. And just thank you for all the hard work that you've done. It's amazing getting to know you. Likewise. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> thank you very much for having us. Looking forward to connect with everyone. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you all so much. That was an absolutely amazing talk. I'm so, so glad to have gotten to, to share in on that. So thank you both. Um, as we move into our next session, I just want to highlight that this upcoming session is going to be a mid-morning networking session. So if you've attended any of our icebreaker or gather round events previously, um, this is uh, it's going to be a, an extended version of the ones we've been doing this, uh, the, in the mornings. So this one's going to be 60 minutes. Um, we will share the link to the gather round um, event in the chat. And that way y'all can head over there and participate. So join us for some fun dance party um, of some speed networking events. Um, you know, no small talk required. So don't sweat about that. And we will see you there. Thanks.
All right, welcome back, everybody. I hope um, I hope uh, plenty of you were able to join us for our mid morning um, networking session. I know that I think everybody had a really good time, and hopefully, um, it was something that was enjoyable for uh, you know a lot more of our uh, of our community. Hopefully, it's a good place for y'all to um, to connect and expand your network. So. Um, as we get going on this next session, I just want to say to anybody who might just be joining us, welcome. My name is Meg. I'm part of Power to Fly's virtual hosting team, and I'm so excited to be here with you for Diversity 2021 Virtual Reboot for um, July's uh, theme is Tech for Social Impact. And I hope y'all are ready to continue some of the amazing conversations we've been having yesterday and earlier today. So um, throughout this upcoming conversation, we would love to hear from you, from our audience, from our community members. So please feel free to add any comments or questions you might have for the speakers into the group chat. It's going to be on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and then once we get started, um, if you do have any kind of technical issues, please feel free to tag myself. My colleagues Patricia and Arushi are also in the chat. So we're there to help you if you have any kind of technical issues. Um, if you are looking to earn SHRM credits from today's session, you're going to take a look at the code that's in the upper left hand corner of the slide in front of you. And um, what else? Oh, I am going to briefly refer you to the code of conduct. I'm going to put that into the group chat here in just a moment. It's just there to ensure that um, this experience, like all of our virtual events, is a great experience for everyone involved. Um, just make sure that as you're connecting with your community members and um, you know, uh, interacting with the speakers, that you, um, you know, lead from a place of kindness and empathy, and, uh, sorry, kindness and respect, my bad. Um, all right, so to introduce our speakers, I am really excited to bring you our keynote speaker. Um, up first is Gavin Sue Lennox. Um, as the Chief People and Culture Officer at Stitch Fix, J Gavin was responsible for employee-related initiatives that ensured the company found, grew, and retained the brightest, kindest, and most motivated talent in the world. Previously, Gavin held key people operations and business leadership roles at high growth consumer centric companies, including Minted, Blue Bottle Coffee and Square. Gavin began his, his career at McKinsey and Company, where he spent nearly a decade in both consulting and recruiting leadership roles in North America and Asia Pacific. Gavin received an AB in East Asian Studies from Harvard College, an MBA from Harvard Business School and a master's in public policy from Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome, Gavin. He's going to be in conversation with Deanna Stinson Rees, who, um, as the CEO and founder of E3 Professional Services, Deanna used her 10 plus years of combined experience in human resources, learning, and development to transform and propel the success trajectory for seasoned professionals in their career journey, as well as helping organizations improve performance and retention, especially with their diverse teams. She began consulting professionals about 10 years ago, and Deanna takes a special interest in working with women to help move them into senior level VP or C-suite roles. As we all know, there is a huge disparity in women, especially minority women, um, presence in these levels of leadership, and she works to help uh, combat that. She also partners with businesses to provide results-driven corporate trainings. Outside of work, Deanna dedicates time to supporting teen moms and single mothers struggling to stay afloat in the Houston and Chicago land area. Deanna believes that mindset change activates behavioral change. So welcome to both of you. Um, I'm really excited to turn the floor over to you and uh, listen in on this amazing keynote. So take it away. Thank you so much, Meg. Such an awesome introduction. And thank you, Jevin, for being here today with us. I'm so excited to jump right in. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Good, good, awesome. So let's jump right in because time is going to fly. So I want us to start by allowing you some space to really tell us a little bit more about yourself, you know, where you're based, any fun facts about yourself, um, if you picked up a pandemic hobby, things of that sort. Let the audience know a little bit more about you. Yeah, I uh, live in San Francisco. Oh, are you getting a little bit of an echo? You okay? Mm, no, I'm good. Me. I'll let you okay. know if it comes up though. Perfect. Uh, I live in San Francisco with my husband, uh, two kids, a three-year-old and a nine-month-old. The nine-month-old just went upstairs to nap, so hopefully I think we're good. <laughs> uh, and we have a 60-pound Airedale Terrier who is basically like another person in the house. Um, so we are uh, we are happily ensconced here in the Mission neighborhood of San Francisco. And um, it's, uh, it, yeah, we have this very sort of fun, you can kind of see it in the blurred background a little bit, but we have this little kind of courtyard of two homes. And Actually, the other home is owned by a lesbian couple um, who I went to business school with. Um, and so we all bought it as this very kind of 
modern family communal you know <laughs> redefinition of what it means to be neighbors and friends and yeah. um, you know their their daughter grew up you know there for a few years and uh, we actually took their nanny when uh, they moved back to Singapore so we have this very kind of fun communal life here uh, awesome. in terms of hobbies pandemic hobbies um, I this is not a new hobby but I love to bake um, so this is I think something that a lot of other people sort of uh, leaned into during the pandemic um, mm-hmm. But that is not super great for fitness and health. <laughs> so the new pandemic hobby is running. So actually, okay. uh, I've, I've run two half marathons uh, during the pandemic, and now I'm actually training for a third. Awesome. Awesome. Fun fact, I used to run track. If you ask me to go run now, not happening. But the fact that you're running marathons, like, I am so Deanna, jealous. it can happen. I quit high school cross country, and here I am. <sighs> you know decades later I'm I'm back so you can do it (laughs) (laughs) there we go there we go awesome awesome you also had a recent career transition can you tell us a little bit about that yeah so I just finished up with Citrix actually about a week ago after over three years um it was an amazing amazing run uh it's an amazing company so we'll talk a bunch about it during during this hour together Mm -hmm. um but I also am a big believer of, I think, um, and actually our CEO founder, Katrina, talks about this a lot, of every year sort of reflecting and saying, what's the year ahead? Um, mm-hmm. What does this company need from me? What do I need from, you know, the role, the team, and so on? And just like, how, how do those sort of things go together? And then obviously thinking about your family and all the other things in your life. And, you know, as I was sort of launching into this fourth year, uh, on one hand, I was so excited about everything that was ahead of the company, but also I think just uh, like many folks through this pandemic and through, you know, just honestly a very, very challenging year and a half in terms of yeah. racial equity and injustice in, in this country, um, just sort of said, you know, what, I actually, I, I think I need to take a break, um, which is hard because I, I love this company. I love my team and there's still a lot of great work to do, but um, uh, I sort of owe it to them to sort of have that honest reflection of like, do I have a full gas to tank, a uh, full tank of gas? Uh. Yeah. Yes, yes. You know, the fact that you mentioned just being able to take that pause and reflect is super important because a lot of times we forget to do that. And the work that we do, um, that many folks do can be taxing. And so, like you said, making sure you have that full tank of gas is super duper important. Um, what first actually attracted you to the company? Um, I know until recently you served as chief people and culture officer at Stitch Fix, but I want us to take a step back and kind of look at what attracted you to come to the company, especially from a people and culture perspective. Yeah, I, um, I got to know the company a few years back, um, and I was at Minted, uh, was not looking and, um, you know, did the whole, let's have an introductory conversation, what can it hurt kind of thing. And, uh, and I went, I went into the office and I saw a sort of decal on the wall of the interview room and Citrix has a cultural set of values that we call the OS, um, our operating system. And I, so I saw the OS for the first time on this interview room wall and, um, you know, my teams and colleagues say that I am, um, a fairly snarky <laughs> um, person uh, who kind of is an optimist. So I'm snarky optimist is what they call me. Um, and so my immediate sort of reaction of seeing this beautiful culture decal on the wall was cool. Lots of companies have very pretty pictures on the wall. Lots of companies have pretty words on a wall. We'll see if it means anything. And what happened was um, I had a lot of interviews because it was, you know, for a senior leadership role. And on both sides, I think you just want to take the time to really make sure that's the right fit. And as I got to know more people and I was speaking with, you know, leaders, the VP level, the C-suite level, uh, even a board member. Um, the first thing that I noticed that was really interesting was that um, the OS and elements of the OS kept coming up in conversation. And even then, snarky optimist, um, first Kind of couple of times, I sort of said, "Oh, well, this is a, this is a plan, right? Like they're they're interviewing me for a people and culture job. Of course, they're going to talk about the culture." And it just kept happening. And to some point, I was like, "This is this can't be manufactured, right? It'd just be too awkward for them, right? It's just it keeps coming up in conversation, really organically, um, in them talking about the work and talking about what's important and what's challenging." So that I thought made me um, really start to believe, you know, this is a company that takes it seriously. This is a company that really wants to do it right. 
Um, the second thing that I thought was really powerful was as I got to know these leaders, I really saw elements of the OS in them. And again, not because they were sort of saying, I you know, embody this value, right? But just as they talked about the stories of the work that they had done, even time before Stitch Fix, um, the things that they were wrestling with, um, the ways that they had grown as leaders in the company, it really brought the values to life. And again, I sort of said that that's actually what you are really striving for in this work. Um, and to some extent, I would say, while I wish it was table stakes, uh, at a lot of companies, it's just not the case. Um, and so, you know, it's an amazing company from a business perspective as well. Um, it's so innovative, has done incredible things in the world of retail and so on. So, you know, I was really excited about those things as well, but very specifically around people and culture, that's what caught my eye. That's very interesting. First of all, I love snarky optimists. Okay, so I'm going to kind of borrow that if you don't mind. Yeah, go for it. Join the club. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think that that's really awesome to hear. And I want to lean in a little bit more because when you mentioned that um, how their values were kind of embedded as um, or translated as their operating system, uh, I wanted you to talk a little bit about values driven versus, excuse me, a culture driven mindset, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I saw this question and I loved it. I think it's a really interesting question. I, I actually don't think that they're in opposition, um, but I do think the question is an important one. I think it comes from the fact that um, for too long, companies and, and kind of even you know, news headlines and so on, right? They talked about culture in a way that wasn't value-centric. They talked about, how to, what your offices look like, or um, you know, what the coolest perk is that you offer, or like what's on the menu uh, at lunch in your fancy cafeteria, whatever, right? Like your, you know, how many offsites you have, like what you know, it's it just it's all these sort of like activities and um, you know trappings of uh, of of, a, of an organization that I think it's not that I don't think they can that they they can't embody culture, but I don't think that, that those things are culture. I think actually culture is about values, right? It's, it's about what are the things that you stand for? And even more importantly, not just sort of what you say you stand for, but when push comes to shove, what really carries the day in terms of the hard decisions that you make as an organization? Um, one of the things I talk a lot about in culture is it's the way that people treat each other when the doors are closed, right? It's not, a, you know, and all, again, the way that you act in front of a big company, all hands in front of lots of ways, obviously still matters, right? That your, your culture comes through there too, but it's really around a really tough meeting between three people. What gets said? How do you resolve that challenge? After the meeting, does someone give feedback to the other person on how that meeting went? How do they do that? <laughs> is that other person open to the feedback, right? Those are the things for me that, um, that's actually what really culture is about. And that's actually really about values, what you believe and how they come to life. But I do think um, the two have gotten disaggregated in a way that I think isn't very really helpful, but um, I'm glad that it started to come together. Yes, I love it. Values, I like to, to think that values is what informs and what is the uh, premises of culture, right? That's what's going to shape it and determine what it looks like. So I love how you broke that down. That was great. Uh, Let's actually, I want to stay on values a little bit more. So let's think about when you are, when you were working with a global team, like you did, how did you ensure that your team or the entire team was working towards the same mission and the same set of values or embodying those same set of values? Thinking through some battle scars on this one. <laughs> it's, 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 some of the, it's some of the work I love doing most, but it's not easy. Um, so I'll go back in time a little bit uh, to talk about a couple other organizations that I, uh, that I led at uh, where we wrestled with this challenge. Uh, the way I often think about it is you want to have a universal set of cultural values, a universal set of ways that people think about being at an organization together or working together, striving towards great work together, um, that is really consistent. Right? You have to have this great kind of foundation. I think it's really hard when people talk about, well, it's this company, you know, in name, but really, if you go to this business unit or if you go to this country market, it's totally different. Right? Um, you get people sort of talking about haves and haves nots, um, 
do you really want to have a great organization where people move around in different roles and teams as I've gotten to do in my career and felt really lucky to do so. Um, it's really hard to do that if people are really worried about, well, gosh, you know, Deanna loves her experience, you know, over here in the Boston office or, and now she's thinking about going to, you know, I want to pick a city and make it feel like they're in the bad city, but um, maybe, well, maybe she hears that the Copenhagen office is even better than Boston office. And she's kind of bummed out. Why is that, you know, why is that the case? I, I, I lived in Boston for 10 years. I don't know. Um, and so um, you really want to have that universal experience. But then I think to say that there is no difference at all is, is foolish. Um, like they're going to be local flavors of that, right? Um, it's just we have a saying, it's just, um, we say things that are spicy. So to, to be spicy, it's, it's when someone says to me, you know, I don't, I don't see race. <laughs> like, okay, are we, are we still doing that? <laughs> like, like the whole point is that you actually have to see race, but you do it in a way that is thoughtful, that accounts for, I mean, now I'm going on my soapbox, but, you know, accounts for all the historical inequities and the ones that still exist that we have to sort of challenge ourselves to do, but it's not actually to pretend that nothing's there, right? Um, and so similarly, uh, to make it real, you know, two examples. So McKinsey, uh, when I was there, um, you know, we were in, oh gosh, like I think 50 or 60 countries around the world, um, you know, sort of well-established um, blue chip uh, consult management consulting firm. And, and we had this pretty strong sort of central culture, but we were in all these really different countries. And some of those countries um, had really different cultures, frankly. Um, national cultures than uh, the US and Western Europe, which is where McKinsey started. Um, and so sometimes I would say um, that created some pretty hard challenges. And so uh, when I was, I moved to Shanghai uh, to lead Asia Pacific recruiting from McKinsey uh, and I was working with a lot of Chinese consultants. Uh, one of the things McKinsey talks a lot about is uh, a value that we call obligations to set. So this idea that if you have a perspective that you think is different than what's being shared in the room. It doesn't matter if everyone there is more senior than you, if the most senior partner is pounding the table for a different perspective. If you really believe that there's something there that needs to be discussed or that someone's missing something, you have an obligation to decide, right? It's not even just uh, you're empowered to do so, like you're obligated to do so. That's the right thing to do for the team. It's the right thing for the client. Sounds awesome. Not, of course, yeah. To learn how to do it, it's not easy, and so on. But it's um, you know, as a 22 year old fresh sort of college grad, it's it's a very empowering thing to, to sort of experience. You talk to sort of Chinese new college grads, and they look at you and they're like, "Are you crazy? <laughs> I would never do that to a more senior colleague. I would. I mean, and I'm a Chinese American, so I actually sort of felt both sides of this a little bit, right? Like growing up in a traditional Chinese uh, family, um, you know, you would not. You, you would not disagree with an elder in the family. And so, so how do you sort of make these two things go together? And, and of course you can't just sort of tell, I mean, we had almost a thousand Chinese colleagues, right? Well, ignore your, ignore your national culture, ignore your family culture, right? The obvious you said is the McKinsey thing. But to say to them, hey, I know that you have a strong sort of cultural inclination to not speak up in those situations and to not disagree and that's fine, don't ever dissent. Is also problematic, right? And so it's it's actually quite tricky to sort of uh, talk about it. And, and the way that I think we ultimately sort of work through it is, is just just be really open about it. These are two things that you're experiencing. By the way, many of those Chinese colleagues came to McKinsey because they wanted a global experience, right? If they wanted a more hierarchical sort of culture, they would go to a Chinese state-owned enterprise. They would go to a different organization. And so, uh, you know, my sort of belief, if you're thinking about these, this sort of global culture and, and the sensitivity that you need to navigate these different local contexts, is just to really be open about it, to say, here's what we're striving for in terms of a, a sort of global uh, consistency that we stand for as an organization. And here are the things that feel specific to this local context that might be a different flavor or even, frankly, be slightly in opposition. And how do we sort of talk about that? Um, another, sorry, such a spicy um, thing that we talked about. Um, that I experienced there was um, when I went to McKinsey China out of you know over almost a thousand colleagues, um, I was there was only one other out LGBTQ plus um, individual in the entire region, uh, and when I went to talk to him about it, um, he told me not to come out. And I had been out my you know for five years at this point, 
in my career in McKinsey, North America, I had been recruited openly out um, uh, on college campus and so on. And so this was, you know, kind of opposite day. So like, wait, we're at the same company. <laughs> and they said, look, it's just, it's not, an, it's not a supportive culture here on, on this dimension, which reflects the national kind of climate. Um, and this was something that I talked with a number of other colleagues in um, developing countries in Latin America and Africa and so on who said they had experienced very similar things, even though McKinsey as an umbrella organization was amazing, like really, really supportive. Um, and so it's interesting, like I went back and I, I essentially kind of went back in the closet a little bit for the first time in my career in several years, um, but basically just sort of made choices around like I'm not, I would never lie. So someone asked me point blank, like, do you have a partner and so on? Like, I would always be truthful. Um, but I was certainly approached it a little bit differently than I did in Boston and New York. Um, but I sort of said, like, I want to I want to be open. I want to take a stand. But I do just have to figure out how to way to do that personally that's right for me. And I think just still honestly reflective of where we are at this moment in time in this sort of local society. And uh, the great sort of you know, optimistic ending to this is... Um, uh, a number of other people came out during my time there um, as a sort of, I mean, frankly, saw the American guy come over with his boyfriend, later husband, uh, you know, and so people started, I think, to finding more confidence themselves, um, as of course, China continues to open up, although it's not, you know, still has its own challenges. I forgot for a brief moment that I was muted to try to minimize any echoing but wow 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 such powerful stories and the fact that you had at one point in your career you felt like even though you had already kind of been living in your truth and you were open about your truth that you had to kind of bottle that back in you know for the sake of your career at, at some point in time and how as a wider organization is like on the outside or you know from a large scale view or bird's eye view things look oh so great and so nice but when you start getting into the different intricacies um the culture just looks different that's really good to hear and I, I hope the audience is really letting this digest because as you um go through your career just you being individuals in general it's super duper important to understand those various facets and intricacies words are trying to escape me today <laughs> of understanding a company's culture is very multifaceted it's not just you know a blank slate or something that you know just for face value so I'm so glad you were able to dive a little bit deeper into those areas um, and since we kind of got to talking about culture and kind of the evolution of how companies evolve with their own like DEI work that they're doing internally. I do want to look at Stitch Fix's approach to social impact, uh, specifically looking at sustainability and equity. I want us to talk a little bit about, or you tell us a little bit more about Stitch Fix's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I would say with Stitch Fix, we have a long um, kind of heritage and commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and it really, as these things should sort of start with the top. Uh, so Katrina um, is, is actually quite, I think, sort of admired and well-known in the, in the tech and retail industry for having assembled a really diverse board, a really diverse executive team over time. And... Um, yeah, this is all you can actually go on our social impact website and find our diversity statistics and so on. And to be clear, we still have work to do, so that's not that we've done everything. But um, in many places, and particularly around um, these sort of leadership uh, levels, and then also um, in our technical organizations, our gender representation, both at a, for our sort of individual engineers and data scientists and other technical roles, as well as in leadership positions, is um, well, you know, historically has been a, sort of around 30%, um, probably even a little bit higher. And um, you know, while it's still short of 50-50, which I think is the sort of long-term aspiration, um, those of you who know the statistics um, for gender representation in tech, um, they, that kind of blows away the field. Um, and so, um, you know, I think there's been a there's been a commitment from the beginning um, that Katrina has really led from the front on. Um, and that's not to say I think there hasn't been um, a recognition that uh, this work is really never done, right? So it's really just recognizing, like, okay, well, what is this next chapter and and what are the things um, for us? And so for us, um, you know, BIPOC representation, um, particularly in our technical roles, um, continues to be something that we're very attuned to and, and leaning in on. And I would say one of the things um, 
One of the things that we have been really focused on in this past kind of year and a half um, is really around community. And so um, one of the things that we recently did was um, launched um, what other uh, many other organizations call ERGs. Uh, we are quite determined not to call them ERGs, actually, because uh, that, it's fine if you call them ERGs. But uh, just for me, it's like it's, an, it's another acronym. Like I just kind of, you know, uh, we have an amazing um, diversity, equity, and inclusion leader, Dre Tree Addy, uh, and she and I talked a lot about how do you, the small choices that you make around language like really matter. And so how do we just sort of do things that feel more human, more sort of evocative of what we're trying to achieve together. And so we, so we decided to call them communities because that's what they are, right? Communities of people with shared experience and shared challenge. Um, but the thing that we did, um, so to create these, I think in and of itself is not groundbreaking to be clear, right? Um, but I would say that we really tried to learn from what we felt were some of the mistakes um, or learnings of other organizations in how we went about this. Um, and so the first thing um, that we did was really thinking about the charter. And so we chose a, a number of communities um, and really sort of created a mission and statement and a charter for them that said, this is really around, cent cent this is really around centering on the experience of the most marginalized communities, um, particularly in the context of business, right? Um, and, the biz and sort of the business that we do, right? In terms of retail and tech and so on. And, and just be super upfront about that. Right? And so these, are, these communities exist, um, they can, I think, fulfill a number of purposes, but first and foremost, they are centering on in sort of the, the lived experience um, and the voices of these marginalized people within our sort of company and um, helping them, I think, sort of make a company better, both in terms of, you know, sort of for their own experience and for other employees, um, but also for our clients, right? And um, and then actually really kind of creating uh, an organizational structure around that um, that really ensured that we spoke to all of our employees. And so one fun fact that um, people often don't realize about Citrix is that, you know, of our many, many thousands of employees, um, almost 90% of them are hourly. Um, so we have a lot of data scientists, we have amazing engineers and marketers and um, everyone you could think of in terms of like a really disruptive e-commerce retail company. Um, but we also have thousands of part-time stylists um, who you know, work with our clients and, and help them find amazing things. Um, we have thousands of warehouse associates, not, you know, not a secret that many of us have, um, I think, you know, when I've gotten through the pandemic, we're not through, you know, the, the frontline workers and warehouses and many companies across, across the world. Um, and, uh, and of course, we have um, several hundred customer support agents uh, that we call client experience. And so, so, the, so the bulk of our organization is actually hourly. And when I was um, really sort of starting to shape the strategy for our next chapter of diversity, equity, inclusion work, and, and, and actually going to hire Drapery and interviewing candidates, um, this was one of my key questions. I said, I still have not heard of any organizations that I think are really serving hourly employees on DEI in a really compelling way. And we have from the start, again, sort of hats off to Katrina, we have from the start created a company where we did not have second class citizens. Really. Um, Small, but uh, for me, has always been a really powerful example of this. Um, so you said, you know, when did you sort of start falling in love with Citrix as a company? Um, uh, in one of my final interviews, they, they brought me to a warehouse um, so I could sort of walk the floor and meet the team members and just sort of see how technology and, and sort of human workers sort of uh, combine. And, um, and I'd spent a lot of time at the headquarters office uh, at that point. And so as I was walking around the warehouse and meeting people and so on, I looked over to the, the snack kitchen area and I saw that they had the exact same snacks as headquarters. Small, but not small. <laughs> I can tell you many other companies that have that kind of employee population sort of breakdown, they do not have the exact same snacks in the warehouse. And so this is such a, such a, it's kind of a small but vivid example for me of sort of like, okay, this is like what we've set out to do as a culture. And so we've already given up the game if we create communities or ERGs or so on, and we kind of ignore the hourly population because to be real, it's harder, right? They're, they're much more distributed. They have set schedules. They're paid on an hourly basis, right? Like there's just a lot more sort of contextual constraints relative to Sort of headquarters workers, if you will, which most sort of other companies um, have focused on. 
Um, but we created a structure um, where um, that was basically first and foremost something that we had to sort of solve for. And we actually just announced internally our community leaders and every one of the communities is co-led by a leader um, from kind of, if you will, a headquarters function and from a, from one of those three sort of um, majority hourly functions. And so it's just that something that we've really put at the center. Um, so that's been a really big push. I would say the other big push um, um, that we've uh, done around is uh, around pay equity. And so we shared uh, some of our results about a summer ago and I'm, I'm being careful because we're actually about, uh, the team is about to share our latest sort of year of impact and things that we're working on so on in a month. And so I'm kind of like, they're gonna kill me if I steal their thunder. So I'm like carefully checking. <laughs> um, so more to come, tune in, Stitch Fix social impact website, you can Google it. Um, but um, but we did share a bunch of this a year ago and um, you know we, we have a fairly provocative approach to compensation um, in which, um, if we have interviewed you and hired you into a role, we will pay you the same as anyone in that role across the company. So there's no dis there is no manager discretion on how much to pay you. There's no range of saying like, well, Deanna showed up a little bit better in the interview process than Jevin. And so I'm just going to give her a like 5% bump. She seemed, you know, I don't know, a little bit more with it than Jevin on that day or uh, well, but, you know, Deanna was great, but actually Cindy over here, like, I mean, just be blunt, like she went to like my alma mater and I, we really hit it off and we talked about, I mean, this is the shit that happens, sorry, but well, what spice, uh, sailor language for, a uh, for, a uh, conference. I see, I see, <laughs> but this is, I mean, there's research that shows this, right. I mean, these are the things that happen. Um, even with people who I think have, you know, reasonably good intent, it's just the things that seep into the unconscious. And so we, again, credit to Katrina, uh, what I've just sort of done is taken the next chapter of that and really continue to refine the strategy and so on. But as she said, I, I refuse to do that. If, if you are right for the job, I'm gonna take the negotiation out of the equation. You should just know that you're gonna get paid fairly, that anyone else doing that job in a great way at the company is gonna be paid in the same way and that you're not secretly getting paid less, which by the way, is lots of people are finding out can be the case. Um, and so those are two, uh, obviously there's so many other things um, uh, that I could talk about, but those are two things I'd say that we've had, um, you know, sort of significant mind share and time investment on and uh, are starting to see um, real fruits. That is so awesome. Two things, well, first, okay, for anybody that's listening um, and or watching uh, simultaneously, and you are in any type of managerial role, leadership role, focused on these efforts, or even just any professionals out there, Jevin hit on two major things that a lot of companies struggle with when it comes to DEI, which is A, that pay equity. So like huge shout out to Stitch Fix on like being so intentional and meticulous about how y'all are like showing up in that space, but also the attention to the details. That example you use about the break room or the lunchroom area, how they had the exact same snacks you hit the nail on the head when you said it's small, but it's not small because it's like, exactly. It's like, it may look like something small, but it's major because it shows we don't think we're any better than the folks that are hourly or the folks that are not in the corporate office or at this location. It's even just, it's equity across the board in terms of something, I, I think food is vital because I love food. So I'm gonna say something as vital as food. <laughs> Because I love food. But for those of you that are listening, I really want to make sure you guys were able to take away those that those key points. Um, if you took away nothing else from this segment of the interview and from the conversation, those are two major things that companies struggle with. And those are some really good examples of how you start to really get to the core of equity because that's what companies really struggle with. Yes, you may see diversity. Yes, folks are being included. But that equity piece is where a lot of companies miss the mark. So thank you for really highlighting that, Devin. Um, I want to, oh my God, I have so many things to ask you. Okay, hold on. <laughs> so, because I'm like, time is ticking. I just go and set the clock like, okay, Deanna, stay focused. So I want us to like kind of take a step back and I want to talk a little bit. I want to give the folks that are listening a little bit of uh, time to get some advice from you in terms of if someone is moving into a leadership role, you know, what are some of your early or um, what are some of your earliest challenges or pitfalls or what are some of the earliest challenges um, or pitfalls that 
leaders may make as uh, individuals are moving into leadership roles. My turn to speak on mute. <laughs> I think there are two particular pitfalls that people who are moving into people leadership, uh, well, honestly, even experienced people leaders can make. Um, I've seen many others um, uh, sort of, I think, wrestle with, and, and I'd honestly at times in my career, I probably wrestled with both. Um, the first is feeling like leading others is, key to leading others is knowing everything and being able to do everything that that person's job entails better than they can. And it's, it's interesting because I think early in your career, it's kind of, it is kind of true actually, right? Like you sort of get to this next level, like you actually probably are actually just fundamentally better and able to do better, you know, most things. And, um, and honestly, there are even cases where I would say like your first, you know, sort of first moving to people leadership and so on, like if the coaching that you're doing, depending on the type of work and so on, right? Like you, you might actually say like, I can actually do this faster. I can do it better and so on, right? And so really my job is actually just to make sure that they are learning that and so on, which by the way, is a pitfall in of itself because sometimes you say, it's just faster if I do it myself, which finally lets me you're not helping. You're actually not making the team better, right? And I get it. Sometimes, sometimes you got to make that call, but I think if you're constantly making that call, it's faster if I just do it. Um, you're going to wake up in six months uh, with a whole lot of pain. Um, but I think this idea that you need to know everything and do it better um, can really boomerang back at you over time. Um, because for me, it actually um, really is rooted, I think, in imposter syndrome and, and anxiety around, well, if I don't have all the answers as a leader, if I don't know how to do it better than them, then what happens when they ask me right, this question that I'm stumped by? And I had this really um, sort of pivotal moment in my own leadership journey where um, I had joined this company called Square, an amazing company. Um, you know, it was a really exciting time to be there. Um, you know, we were growing really, really quickly, um, lots of crazy stuff going on. Um, and honestly, I just come from McKinsey, uh, first time in tech, first time at a startup and was totally in over my head. <laughs> super scared, like didn't really know, you know, just like, oh gosh, this is so different and so on. And I spent that first year, I think, honestly feeling like, well, I'm supposed to know all the answers. And if my team or if other colleagues ask me questions, like I need to know all the answers and that's actually what succeeding is. And um, it was a really rough year and I actually changed teams and I moved over to lead sales operations, um, which is uh, some organizations, they have, you know, big sales teams and then they have a sales operations teams. Uh, their job is literally to make the sales team succeed. So we do all the analytics, we do set the strategy, we think about the compensation plans, we develop the trainings for them. And so it's like literally everything like, you, you know, you're on, you're on stage, we're, we're, you know, stage crew. And, um, I took over this team of three people. Two of them had done sales operations for several years at Salesforce. So like one of the biggest sales companies in the world. Um, and the other guy uh, had not done sales operations, but was really, really technical. Like um, I used to joke them is his screen looked like the matrix. It was just always a like green code, like flowing down. And so all of a sudden I was kind of like, I, I have no credibility whatsoever with these guys of claiming that I know how to do their jobs better, that I know all the answers, right? I'm, I'm brand new to this. Square was really kind and decided to take a chance on me to do this. I, I don't know. Right? <laughs> and um, the thing was, it was, there was a moment where I was like, I think I can either be terrified of this or I can actually feel really free. Because all of a sudden I said, like, I don't have to have all the answers. That's not... That's not what this is. And um, it was really the moment in my career where I learned how to lead through questions. So I said, my job isn't actually to have every single answer. My job is actually to ask great questions, to be, to be curious, to, to ask, you know, yeah, not just random questions, right? The questions need to move the work forward, need to sort of help them raise their game. But actually doing that from a place of not having perfect expertise um, sometimes is actually really powerful. And so it was just this really, really important moment for me as a leader where I, I think I I change my frame and I, and I share this advice um, pretty pretty freely since then. The second piece of advice, um, or at the second pitfall I should say, which is coupled with advice is um, feeling like being a people leader is about being people's friends and making them happy. Now to be clear, 
I don't think that you should make everyone unhappy. <laughs> but actually being a great leader means no one's always going to be happy. And this is really hard. Like there's moments where someone's going to be mad at you. Someone's going to be upset at you. You're not going to give them a promotion. You're not going to, you're going to give them tough feedback on the work. You're whatever it is. Right. And it's this interesting balance, I think, of being a great leader of saying, of course, I care. I want people to be happy, right? Like, of course, I want them to be inspired. I want them to feel motivated and so on. And so that data, if I hear that they're not, right, it's not that you can just dismiss it. But if you just sort of center on like, are they happy and smiling today? And is, you know, just whatever they ask for, I'm going to give it to them. You're probably actually not going to make great decisions. Um, and so what I found over time is having this North Star around, well, what are we trying to do together as a team? And what are the principles by which I hold myself accountable as a leader and being really transparent about that with the rest of the team so that actually, even if they're upset about a decision you made or so on, if they respect it, they understand where it came from. Um, it's just a very, very different dynamic. And um, that is something I've worked at a lot over time. I would say I'm still working on quite a bit, but um uh, was probably the second big aha I would have, I would sort of share around potential pitfalls. Really, really, really good advice. I love that. And real challenges being also someone, you know, integrated into that people space. It's like, that is something that like, I never even like realized or thought about just in terms of this desire to feel like sometimes like, Oh, you know, you have to make everybody happy because like you're the person that's been designated to work on this project related to people. But it's like you said, having that North Star on, you know, understanding those, how you're going to hold yourself accountable to certain things in terms of uh, what you're trying to accomplish in that role. That's really good. Thank you. Look, if y'all haven't been taking notes, I've been jotting down little notes. I know y'all saw my little pen moving while <laughs> Jesse was talking. We got a few comments from the audience. Um, Susanna mentioned in regards to our conversation uh, related to communities and ERGs, she said, what you shared is so similar to what she saw at Costco and put a lot of effort into including temporary employees into their ERGs. Now, she also had a, a question she follow up and asked, in tech, temp employees is actually a huge, a huge issue, excuse me. But there is a fundamental question, which is if the employees work full time, are they still, I guess, considered temp or should they still be considered temp? Yeah, uh, yeah. great question, yeah. Susanna. <laughs> there we go. Um, great question, Susanna. I think there, there are a few questions I think kind of bundled together. So maybe I'll sort of um, bring them apart for clarity. Um, the first one, I would say, there's just a specific legal question in there, honestly, <laughs> just around, hey, if they work full time, are, are they considered temp, are they full time employed and so on? And um, without getting super into it, there's just there's a lot of, I would say, legal dialogue between the state of California uh, around what that means. And so I would say, you know, clearly companies need to be compliant <laughs> and meet their obligations uh, and so on. So, yeah, sort of putting that aside. But I think um, this broader question, uh, and I think your example of what you saw at Cisco is awesome. Um, but I think it's still pretty atypical. Uh, how do you think around? How do you think about ERG structures and what they stand for in companies, and who's allowed to participate? And I think um, you know, on the temp on the temp employee question, I would say again, yeah, a little bit tricky because there are actually some legal obligations that you have to sort of be aware of around like who can participate in what and what time, and, and so on and so on. So I think you have to be aware of those things, but my sort of, I would say, lean is keeping that in mind. I think the more inclusive, how meta, right, that the you can be, the better. Um, while um, I think just respecting that, like, depending on how a tech employee's role is defined and so on, right, like, you just have to sort of um, account for that structure. But, but at the end of the day, they're, they're, they're working at the company, they're experiencing the company, and if um, ERGs are I think constructed in a way that ultimately can make the organization better, um, then there may be ways for them to participate um, that makes sense. And maybe those ways you have to sort of define them and structure them well and so on, right? But um, I think if you can doing that in close partnership with your legal team, um, I think that's a great thing. And, and I would actually extend that metaphor or that idea even further. Um, you know, something that uh, we talked a lot about at Stitch Fix is how do we actually think about 
our responsibility and our opportunity to bring this work to those we partner with in the world, right? So not even just sort of temporary employees or contractors or, or consultants or whatever it is, um, but actually the vendors that we work with, right? The, 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 the apparel brands that we carry and so on. And I'll just keep, kind of give you a, a concrete small example of that. Um, I don't take credit for this. The merchandising and the marketing teams over this past year in particular have just done really amazing work in thinking about what are all the ways that we create product that we represent people in our advertising and so on, right? And, and what are ways that we can actually really hold ourselves accountable to sort of moving that needle forward and uh, or moving that needle. And one of the things that they, again, small, but not small. One thing um, that they recently did was essentially do a language audit around, well, what do we call different pieces of apparel in our systems as we sort of, you know, started speaking to clients? Is there appropriation in any of that? Are there things that um, if we really sort of, you know, bring a new lens to it? And frankly, some of them are used very widespread in the fashion industry. But if we sort of just sort of step back and say, we speak to members of our communities and so on to say, how do we feel about this? Um, we, might we change that? And so we, so we recently um, changed uh, a number of items that have a particular construction that are similar to a Japanese kimono. And we no longer call them kimono anything because they're frankly, A, they're not kimonos. <laughs> and, uh, and B, it just sort of felt like not sort of appropriate for us. Um, but what I love and was so inspired by what the team did was um, they actually went back to, uh, these, these are sort of uh, you know, items that we carry uh, in our selection for our clients. Um, but they went back to the apparel makers, to those brands and said, we wanted to let you know that we've made this change in all of our internal systems and how we talk about these items to our clients. And here's why. This is why we think the language is really important. We would strongly encourage and love for you to do the same. So it's really sort of thinking about the work as like these concentric circles of like, gosh, like you can, you can keep sort of spreading your impact. And, you know, I'll be, I'll be sort of honest about it, right? Like it's a business, right? And so when I say, um, not speaking on Citrix to the half, I'm more for a general company, right? Like, would you say, is it right to then say, okay, a company said like, I'm not going to change the name of the item. Like you just drop them or so on, right? Like, I think those are spicier questions, if you will. Um, but I think they're nevertheless from where a lot of companies are today to what I think they can be doing in terms of having that dialogue and using their you know, their presence in the market if they've been successful to really, I think, at least make sure the conversation is happening. Another example from Stitch Fix um, is when we uh, went and did our IPO several years ago. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with an IPO process, a uh, typical IPO process, uh, you as a company select a couple banks that help you do this roadshow and you pitch the company and you try to get all these investors to buy in, hopefully the stock goes up and all this stuff. And stock market's been a little bit weird this past year, but putting that aside, that's how an IPO is supposed to work. And, um, and one of the things that the team did, this is before me, so I, I won't take credit for it, just you know, praising the team. The team did before me was um, they asked all of the banks who were pitching for the IPO, and these IPOs make banks a lot of money, right? So they really want these, they, they really want these gigs. They asked them to submit all of their diversity statistics as part of their pitch. And they said they're honest and like, look, this is not the number one criteria. So we're not like, we're not selecting just on this, but it is a criteria. And we're also not just gonna say, well, who has the best statistics? We actually wanna hear the why behind your statistics. Where, why are you where you are? How are you thinking about it? What are you working on and so on? And without naming names, sorry, that's our rice maker. It makes a very happy, happy song when it's done. <laughs> That's uh, we're still still in the final stages of the pandemic with these moments uh, in public. Um, there was a there was a very well known bank that I will not name, um, but that one would think like, gosh, they would probably be one of the top contenders, and they, and they lost the opportunity to take Stitchfix to IPO uh, again. Not because I don't think they had particularly worse representation statistics than any other bank that pitched, but the way that they showed up on it was like first they kind of submit statistics that were kind of obfuscating like kind of trying to hide it a little bit and then we called it 
we called them on it and said like what is this like yeah you need to represent it in this way like this is so on and then they kind of tried to talk it at, talk it away and, and we sort of said you know what we think there's a values issue here because we're we were really clear with you about what matters we're very really clear with you again that like this is this is an opportunity for dialogue it's not going to be a deal breaker thing per se and you're not showing up in good faith and if you're not showing up good faith on this like why do we think you're going to show up in good faith on like the broader work together wow yo snaps okay for that because people definitely tend to turn a blind eye if you would when it comes down to like the big money right they'll turn a blind eye for the sake of the dollar so the fact that stitch fix like really held to it like that is just amazing like to hear and side note when your rice maker was going off I was thinking in my head, I'm going to get those kids because I told them to be quiet and I hear somebody's toy. <laughs> so when you said that you saved the kids because I was going to get them after we were done. So <laughs> thank you for letting me know that was the rice maker. Uh, but I know we are pretty much uh, wrapped up on time. Time, I told you it flies by. But Jevin, before we go, and thank you so much again for your insights I was taking notes and I really hope that our audience was able to take notes and I hope that they continue to follow you because I feel like you have so much more to give so much experience to share that I can learn from and that so many others can learn from so before we kind of sign off I would love for you to take a moment and just let folks know where they can find you how they can stay in contact with you or stay up to date with what you have going on yeah, uh, you can find me on, well, I don't really tweet, unfortunately. This is also an awkward question because I'm, like, I'm not, probably not the most prolific social media participant, but um, I am on Twitter, Jevin Suet Twitter. Um, I don't tweet a lot, so <laughs> you can follow me if you want. Uh, you can, you're welcome to follow me on LinkedIn, just as a, as a um, disclaimer. Um, I don't add people that I haven't interacted with uh, sort of significantly and so uh, please don't be offended if you add me on LinkedIn and I don't accept because it, it'll probably just because we haven't had a, a major interaction um, but you're certainly um, LinkedIn lets you follow people as well so you're certainly welcome to follow me in terms of the things that I might speak out there um, and then uh, my Instagram is not my name it's um, it's Platypian P-L-A-T-Y-P-I-A-N it is a public account um, it's more of my kind of personal family account and, uh, and the funny backstory to that one is um uh, my favorite animal is a platypus. And the reason why is, uh, for those of you who don't know, platypus is a, an animal that only lives in Australia. Um, it is a very, very weird animal. It has a duck bill. It kind of looks like an otter with a duck bill um, and flip, you know, sort of webbed feet and so on. And, uh, and the, the, the sort of European explorers that first discovered it thought it was a hoax. Like they thought someone would just like, like stitch together an animal to like, like pump them basically. Um, and I sort of love it because I think it's this example of like, you know, the world kind of always wants to put you in a box, right? Like the way that the human brain is, is, is you want to classify things that makes it simple and easier for everyone, uh, which, you know, in some, for some things is good, for humans is bad, I think. <laughs> uh, and the platypus is an example of saying like, you can't put me in a box. Like I can be any combination of things that I want to be. Like it's just, you know, whatever sort of speaks to you, um, that is uh, what a platypus is. And so platypian is my making the platypus word into an adjective. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That is so cool. Thank you so much for that and for your time today. Um, Wow, I wish I had more time with you. I'm definitely going to sync with you on LinkedIn because I had a conversation with you. You so. did have a conversation with me. <laughs> I'm hoping I get accepted. But like he said, you know, you can always follow folks on LinkedIn. That follow button works. And um, if you are so inclined maybe to want to reach out to him um, in any capacity, you can always put um, a note, a personalized note in your invite. So maybe sharing like, hey, I heard you on the Power to Fly Summit and I wanted to talk to you more about X, Y, and Z and see if that can maybe, you know, spark some additional dialogue and conversation for those of you that want to reach out to Jevin. Otherwise, thank you again. I'm going to pass it over to Meg. This was so great. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Jevin. Thank you so much, Deanna. It was a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank so. you both so much. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I absolutely loved getting to listen in on that conversation. So thank you to you both.
Um, as we move on into our next session, I just want to highlight for anybody who is interested, we are going, um, if you're looking to earn SHRM credits on this up, uh, on these chats today, you're going to need to take note of the code that's in the upper left hand corner of the slide in front of you. Um, and as we get started, or sorry, before we jump into our next session, I just want to highlight, um, in case you didn't know, um, we are having a virtual job fair on Thursday. So I'm sharing a link in the chat right now to where you can sign up for that virtual job fair. Um, it is going to be a really great event. We've got, um, let's see, one, two, three. We've got like almost 10 companies signed up to come to that, um, that fair, including um, Helm, Headway, Unstoppable Domains, Smartsheet, and Autodesk, who are all open to remote positions. So if you've started going remote during COVID and do not want to go back, um, I don't blame you at all. I've been remote for almost three years now, and I never want to go back. This is wonderful. So if you are similar, um, Definitely, and you're, you know, even if you're not looking, it's a really great way to go check out some new companies, get some face time with your hiring teams or team members, um, so that you can, you know, make that personal connection or really find out more about the company. Um, and like I said, if you are actively looking, that's a really great, you know, it's a really great thing to take advantage of. But even if you're just kind of, you know, like 40% of other Americans out there who are just, you know, curious about what else might be out there on the job front absolutely come join in. It's a really great time. Um, I'll be there, so you'll see at, le at least one friendly face. Um, and the job fair is going to run from 12 to 3 p.m. Eastern on Thursday, July 15th. Um, so before we jump into our next chat here, um, the other thing that I want to highlight for y'all um, is our, um, where should we go? Oh, our merch store. So I'm going to share the link with you here in just a second. And one of the things I want to highlight about our merch store, because we, we mention it kind of, you know, off and on, um, but one thing I want to highlight for you is that our merch store is not just, you know, us trying to like, you know, expand our revenue or, you know, uh, diversify into a new field. Um, our merch store is one of the most important ways that we make um, charitable donations on the behalf of both Powerfly as well as our community. So this, um, what you're looking at is some, a selection of some of the items that are in our merch store currently. Um, what we like to do and what we like to, to share with people is that 100% of the proceeds of anything you buy in that shop, we are going to directly donate to a, um, an organization called Trans Tech Social. Now, in case you haven't heard of them before or you're not familiar, Trans Tech Social is this amazing organization founded by Angelica Ross. Um, she has been our, our guest on several summits um, prior to, to this month, and she's also, um, you might also recognize her from her amazing work on Pose or American Horror Story 1984. Um, she's truly a wonderful person, but she had founded Trans Tech Social as an incubator for LGBTQ talent. So the focus of that organization is on economically empowering transgender people and doing that through upskilling and, um, and, and education to open or to, uh, to new opportunities. So the funds from this campaign, so like I said, anything you buy from our merch store, 100% of the proceeds are going to be donated directly to um, Trans Tech Social. They will be used to support technical boot camp fees for Black transgender or non-binary people on their way to a career in engineering. So it's a really great way to, um, you know, kind of expand your athleisure wardrobe, um, make a, you know, make a, a good um, contribution to a really great organization, and look cool while you're doing it, man. I mean, some of these are really awesome um, designs, and I don't just say that because I got to help, um, I got to help pick, you know, some of the products that we put them on. So um, definitely head over and check that out. I have several items from the shop. It's really great. Um, the last thing I do want to highlight before we go into our next session is that um, returning to the virtual job fair for a second, um, this, so the virtual job fair is going to take place from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday the 15th. Now, the biggest thing you have to know for that is um, if you are planning on going and you are an active job seeker, I highly recommend that you take a look at your Power to Fly profile. Um, you can check it out um, by, uh, by selecting your, um, your avatar from the upper right hand corner of your Power to Fly page. Um, once you go in there, you know, make sure everything's up to date. You can add in links to your LinkedIn account, all that kind of stuff. Um, that is going to be a really great way to, to put yourself on the, you know, put your best foot forward for all of these companies. 
Um, every company that attends a virtual job fair will get, um, you know, get your name and your power to fly profile on a list to say, hey, this person is interested. And I think it's based on who, which rooms you visit, but it might just go to every company. I'm not sure, but I will clarify that. Um, but the other thing to know about that, once you've got, you know, all of your, your stuff ready to go, your, your, uh, your power to fly profile, your LinkedIn page, everything's updated. Um, make sure that you keep your eye on our upcoming chat schedule. I'm going to share the link for that in the chat here. Um, what we've got going on, we've got plenty of more virtual events happening, and we want to make sure that you all are, um, are, are aware that one of the virtual events we're going to have um, coming up in the next couple of weeks is going to be a, um, it's going to be a mock interview session. So what we do is we head on over into our gather around um, platform. So in case anybody has joined the, um, you know, the, the networking events that we've held in the last couple of days or ever, um, it, it's gonna work very similarly to that. We will pair you up with um, somebody else that's in the, um, in the event. You'll get randomly paired and then you will get a chance to go over some common interview questions, answer them, you know, ask them and answer them of each other and get some really great um, objective feedback on your performance, especially if you're interested in some of the partner companies from the virtual job fair, it's a great time to really brush up on your interview skills. I go through and do it constantly, um, not because I'm looking for a job, but because I communicate for a living. So I wanna make sure that, you know, the way I'm, I'm trying to come across is actually landing with my audience. So even if you are, you know, just looking to expand your network or you're thinking that you might be interviewing um, somewhere coming up, you know, please feel free um, to check that out and come join us. It's, um, it's not a huge event. I think it's only like 30 minutes. Um, but it is always a really great time. And we really want to, um, you know, provide that, that uh, resource for our amazing uh, community members. So as we get jumped into our next session, um, we can turn the slide up to show Tiffany. Great. Um, I am really excited to welcome everyone who might just now be joining us. Um, thank you so much for joining us for day two of Power to Fly's Diversity Reboot 2021 Virtual Summit Series. July's focus is on tech for social impact, and we hope that you are, are just as excited as we are um, to continue the amazing conversations that we've been having for the last two days, or sorry, the last day and a half, my bad. Um, if you are, you know, as part of our network and part of our, our events, we always want to make it as easy as possible for our community to participate. So if you have any questions or comments for the, the speaker in this upcoming conversation, please feel free, like we want to hear from you. So please feel free to add those to the chat box. It's on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and if you have any kind of technical issues, please feel free to tag myself. My colleagues, um, Arushi and Claudia are also in that, um, that chat. So we can try and help you out with any kind of tech issues you might be having. Um, if you are looking to redeem SHRM credits from today's session, you're going to look at the code that's in the upper left-hand corner of the slide in front of you. Um, and I am going to briefly refer you to the code of conduct that my coworker Arushi is putting into the chat right now. That is there to ensure that, like all of our virtual events, this, um, this session is a great experience for everyone involved. Um, now, I am so excited to introduce our speakers. Um, we have Tiffany Johnson joining us. Tiffany is an ethical data advocate with 14 plus years of strategic data and technology experience in advertising and consulting. She is an ethical data advocate and strong believer in helping companies and individuals discover their own path towards ethical data ownership, transparency, and use. Tiffany believes in challenging the conversation on how we collect data and how that data can help businesses stay innovative. She's worked on IBM, Samsung, Nissan, Idemia, and other accounts. She can be found on social channels at TJ Does Data. We'll share that info in the chat in just a moment. Um, and we're so excited to have her joining us today. She's going to be joined in conversation with our own amazing Sanmaya Mohanty, who is our virtual summit assistant um, and a recent and amazing addition to the PPF family. So Sanmaya and Tiffany, take it away. Yeah. Hi, Tiffany. Uh, Hi. Hi, Tiffany, how are you? So glad to have, have you speaking with us at the Tech for Social Impact Summit. So to begin the summit, you know, uh, why don't we start with uh, your journey and uh, you tell about yourself and how, uh, what was your path to becoming a ethical data advocate? Absolutely. So I have been in the advertising world for, for quite a few years um, and really enjoyed, you know, like you do a lot of travel, right? When you're in this world um, and you always inevitably, like you go to the airport bar and you sit there and you say, 
um, okay, so what do you do for a living? And people ask me that question. I'm like, oh, well, do you have Google? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I've got Google. You know, I'm like, cool, you, you use Facebook as well? Oh, absolutely use Facebook. I'm like, good. So I'm the person that collects all your data. Um, I know where you live, I know how many kids you have, I know how much money you make, I know what kind of job you do, um, I know what kind of beer you like to drink and not just because I'm sitting next to you. Um, I actually know uh, a lot about you as a person um, and I take all of that data and I turn it into insights and I uh, sell it to other companies and then I also um, sell it to businesses and we market uh, products specifically aimed at you. Um, and so, you know, inevitably people are like, wait, how can I stop this? Is there a way to turn this yeah. off? I'm like, nope, can't put the genie back in the bottle guys. But uh, um, but eventually over time, what I come, came to realize is that um, this was a model that, you know, entire industries, companies are built on. Um, and, you know, something we have so much data at our fingertips. It was never meant to be used quite like this. I think that over time, as things just accumulated, um, we yeah. realized we just were collecting more and more data about people. And it started to like tip over that point of becoming a little creepy, right? You know, when we can tell like what kind of um, doctors you visit, when we can tell what kind of what you drink, like we can tell like all of this information about you. Um, and at some point I was transferring over um, what we call first party data. So, uh, so records of people um, for one of the, for a client, um, millions and millions of records. Um, and at some point I sat back and I was like, well, I don't know if we should be doing this, right? Like there's yeah. like, you know, what can you be doing in the industry? Um, and you can do almost anything. We have amazing hmm. technology, but how often do we take a step back and ask what should we be doing? Yeah. And I started to ask that question and right about that same time, um, got to meet some really great uh, people in the data privacy and data ethics world, um, you know, including, you know, we've all heard of think about Cambridge Analytica, mm -hmm. um, I was in the news, you know, a few years back and uh, got to meet one of their whistleblowers, Bernie Kaiser, and, you know, really started working on data ethics and privacy um, and started to lead that actually at, um, at one of the companies I was at, you know, creating a vertical, how can we become more ethical in our data use? Uh, and, you know, and how do we take into consideration the trends uh, as people become more and more aware of the kind of data that we're collecting, how we're using yeah. it, um, and what can we do to change the conversation? How can we have better conversations about this? So that's, uh, that's a little bit about my background and how I came into this passion. Cool. Just to note, you know, if I was sitting beside you in that airport, I'd be freaked out by listening to all of that. But that's the truth, right? So there was this Apple ad uh, back in the day that, you know, that showed us, okay, so we know all this about you. To, so, you know, this is not, uh, so in the iOS ecosystem, we are kind of keeping this uh, data, op uh, data closed, but for other ecosystems like Android, maybe that's not the case. So there was this ad and I could totally uh, recall this ad and, you know, the story that you recounted, that just fits. So, uh, so I mean, uh, your title reads data ethical. I mean, you're totally into the ethical aspects of using data, right? So what motivated you to dig into data privacy and data ethics? Was, was that the Eureka moment that you just, you know, kind of explained that, okay, I'm dealing with a huge list and, you know, uh, data lakes. And so is it what I should be doing with the technology or what was it? I'd love to know. Uh, it really was. Um, it really was the massive amount of amounts of data, the massive amounts of data that was being collected and used. And um, and I really thought like people should be able to own their own data. Uh, and it turns out that um, this concept of data ownership not a new concept, something that was really gaining traction right around the same time that I was having some of these thoughts. And, um, and so what really got me into it, and, and I do want to differentiate at least one thing here, there is a big difference between data privacy um, yeah. and data ethics, right? Um, so data privacy is, is definitely legal compliance. When we think mm -hmm. about legal compliance, we think about, um, you think about GDPR. So that yeah. was another one of the things yeah. that, you know, came along in the ad industry, um, you know, not a huge impact in the U.S. because obviously it affects the European market, but we had mm -hmm. a lot of global clients who had to keep that in mind as well. Um, and so starting to look at these kinds of trends and then beyond just data privacy, because we don't have uh, a ton of laws, even still in the U.S., we still don't have a ton of laws. Yeah. We've got 
um, California CCPA, that's the California Consumer Protection Act. We've got um, Florida has a, a you know, has has passed a bill about data privacy. Um, I currently advise um, a couple of New York State senators on some of the New York privacy legislation, um, and that's compliance with the law, right? So beyond yeah. that, but beyond that, there's this other aspect of it that is this trust component between companies and consumers. Um, no. And consumers want to trust the companies they're doing business with. And you often find too that there's a solid relationship like if um, between trust with consumers and companies. And so, um, and so it was really from that that I started to look into, okay, so above and beyond um, just legal compliance, what are the benefits of being more ethical in your data use and asking, um, you know, what should you be doing? How should you be protecting your consumers? How are you using that data? Um, is it in line with your corporate policies? Is it in line yeah. with how you think um, your company should be treating your consumers? Uh, and so that's really you know, kind of how I got into this and, you know, and making that differentiation again, incredibly important because ethics is above and beyond that legal compliance. It's taking that next step. And I think it can be very beneficial for companies and also obviously for consumers. Absolutely. So, so adding on to that, so do you think there's been, so after the uh, Cambridge Analytica fiasco kind of got exposed and everyone got to know that there's a company that has around more than 200 plus data points on each individual American, right? That's, that was the count if I'm not wrong. So, yes. uh, so do you think, or what are the current trends that are happening in the data privacy and the ethics space and how things are getting changed? Like two years before the line, two years down the line, I believe not many people were aware of, you know, the need to protect your own individual data and how your data is being used to retarget ads and, you know, marketing materials towards you. So how do you think the landscape has changed and what are the positive, uh, I mean, things that are happening in this uh, arena and what are the latest trends? Absolutely. So I think that things have really, so I think Cambridge Analytica was a bit of a catalyst, right? It really started to shift and become much more mainstream um, when everybody heard about, you know, how uh, they had collected so much data on people, but then how yeah. they had use that data too. Um, and I think so what we see a lot in, um, we do a lot of polling and, and a lot of research as well. We see a lot of research that comes out that um, some of the big trends, some of the things that have shifted really um, over the past couple of years, and I think are continuing to shift is, so we have so much more technology, so much more ability to track everything that you do because you're holding this phone, you know, in your yeah. hand that it is, um, it tracks everything where your location is, what you're searching, um, and it even tracks app to app, um, you know, how often you play games, that kind of thing, yeah. um, all of your interests. And so we've gotten to this point where we collect so much data, and that's one of the big trends is this, that's increase in data collection, right? And along with this, some of the research that we've found as well is people are now aware of it. They're like, oh, when I, um, when I get in my car and, you know, it is a Monday morning and my, um, you know, my Google says, pings me and says, oh, do you want to drive to this place that you normally drive to? It's like, wait a second. I mean, yes, I do want to drive there, but that's a little bit creepy. Why do like, I know that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so I see like, so we see a lot of that too. And then we see a lot of people who are, they're like, they know this, but they're like, well, what do we do? Like, they're just, they, they feel helpless in this situation. They feel like they are, you know, all this data is being collected. They're becoming more yeah. educated about it. They're, they're aware of it. Um, and it's because of all this targeting. It's because when you have a conversation, all of a sudden you get targeted yeah. with ads about that conversation. Um, Absolutely. And so they see this and they're like, well, what do we do about this? How do we stop this? And they feel very powerless, right? Um, yeah. And so they look to companies. They are um, in, it was a huge number in, the, in one piece of research that I quote often, it was 91% of the people that were polled. Um, and, it, and, it, and this was a, um, an internal research survey that we did. 91% um, of people said that they expect businesses uh, mm -hmm. to protect their personal data and to be responsible for that personal data. And so that's a huge amount of people. And so we looked at that and took a, you know, a little bit further look and realized that you know, consumers are aware that what companies are doing and they're like, hey companies, we want you to be better. We want you to, uh, to yeah. start protecting us. And so a lot of the trends that we're seeing now are more permission-based um, data yeah. collection. 
So saying, so going to the consumer, and this requires having a plan, and this requires knowing how you're going to use that data, what data you're going to collect, and going to that consumer and saying, hey, so we're collecting this data, um, mm -hmm. and here's how we're planning to use it. Are you okay with that? So it's a lot of permission-based data. And I would have to tell you that my hope, um, now two years might be a little, you know, I, I you know, it might be a little impractical on this one, but okay. it is my hope that in two years that we have some more concrete ways that people can own their data. So think of like your bank account right now. You log in, you see where your money is, you see yeah. where it's going, you see where you know it's coming in, you have all those numbers. So think of it as a data bank account. You log in, here's all of your data. You can see mm -hmm. where it's going out, you can see where it's coming in. Um, and then you get to say who owns, who actually gets to use your data how do they use it um mm -hmm. do you make money from it maybe you get promotions for it uh and yeah. then i also think that it just leads to better business in general because then you as a business you don't have to question it anymore you know that that person wants to hear mm -hmm. from you you know that yeah. that person um has actively sought you out and is saying yes please here's my data give me i i'd love to know what is the latest sneaker release um yeah. what is the latest like whiskey that you've developed i want to hear about that what Absolutely. is the latest um, you know, the latest trend in clothing. Um, and they want to hear about that and they want to hear about it from your company. And so you know how to target much better as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, integrating active consent. So, so I, by, by giving permission, we are giving consent technically, but that's passive consent, right? So yeah, I can totally imagine that. Like for instance, now Google is giving, I mean, there's this option that where you can download all your user data. Facebook is giving that option too, but if there was a centralized place that, okay, where you can see this, that all the data, all the companies and all the big MNCs are targeting about you, um, taking from you all that in single place and how that is being used. So that would be really great. So, uh, so basically I other than- that, Like that's it exactly, but a centralized location that is personal to you, that okay. you get to control, um, I think okay. is really the big differentiator here because right now there are centralized data hubs. Um, <laughs> Google is one of them, Facebook is one of them, Amazon. Um, well, they collect a lot of your data, but you have no control over it. So that yeah. centralized place where you get to have control, um, that is like, that's the ideal world, right? That's, that's the, the hopefully the future of data. Absolutely. So as you just mentioned, you know, so as an end consumer, so I'm, I've been using a lot of products like let's say Google Home or Alexa. So I feel, I mean, whenever I have some conversation and the next day I see an, an ad pop up, let's say in Amazon or, you know, Google gives me a YouTube ad. So yeah, we do feel helpless. And uh, what's, what would be your suggestion? So as a data, ad, data privacy advocate and data ethical, uh, ethical data advocate, What's your take? So how do you protect your data? I mean, what are the steps that you do take to kind of, you know, stay secure, that stay in control of your data? So I will have to tell you that it, nothing is perfect right now, right? Yeah. Um, that it is, it's a, it, like, I, um, nobody reads all of those T's and C's, first of all. Yeah, um, yeah. But I do tend to, I tend to favor companies um, uh, and also products that do things like block cookies. Um, so I know that, so Chrome was ending cookies, right? We've, we've been talking about, um, and cookies just for relevant context, cookies are little snippets of code that sit mm -hmm. on your browsers that collect information about you and they follow you around the, the web, right? Um, and so there are browsers that do block these already. Um, and Brave browser is a great one. So I use Brave, um, which okay. blocks any kind of data collection. Um, and then also means that I see fewer ads and anything I do, like I have a choice. I say, yes, I want to see this ad or no, I don't think mm -hmm. that adds to me. Um, and so I get a lot more choice with, you know, those kinds of things as well. Um, also I'm a, actually, I will tell you like a big fan of Apple right now. Again, no okay. company is perfect, but, um, I like Apple's ability to have a little more control over what apps are collecting my data, saying, no, I don't want you to track. Uh, and I think that these are the kinds of things that if you pay attention to just a little bit here and there, what you'll find out is, um, is that you can make different choices, right? Still be functional yeah. in terms of how you are surfing the web, how you're downloading apps, how you're playing your favorite games, but being able to make those choices. And when that little window pops up, actually reading the question, um, like yeah. so nobody can read all those T's and C's, but if it gives you an option, um, I will tell you, I always take that extra second or two to say, yeah, I don't want to be tracked. 
Um, and then there's also companies that are starting to form right now. Um, you know, one good example I've seen is Big Token. Um, Big Token is a company that allows you to, and it's an app that you download. Um, but what it does is it actually gives you, uh, it's properly permissioned, it gives you games to play, surveys to take. Um, but it says, are you willing to share your data with these, you know, these companies? And if you are, then um, you can, you know, choose to share your data. And these are the kinds of companies that are really starting to give you options to own your yeah. data, to see what it looks like, and to trade your data for discounts, for money, for, um, mm -hmm. you know, promotions, things like that. And so, like, there are companies like this that I see coming up. So I think supporting companies that, um, up and coming companies that allow you to really start to control your data, paying attention to that. Sure. Um, yeah. And even taking those few extra seconds to say, oh, please don't track me or, um, or if you're fine with being tracked, that's okay too. Like, it's okay mm -hmm. if you want, like I said, if you want to hear from those companies, by all means say, yeah, go ahead, track me because I want to hear from you. Um, and that's perfectly okay as well. It's just giving people the choice. And I think, um, you know, advocating, I uh, advocate for companies to give more choice. And then also for consumers, you know, some of the things that you can do to protect yourself is to just spend those couple extra seconds, um, yeah. to, you know, look at things. Um, Absolutely. So, I mean, if you're getting tracked, so you very well get, you know, some other ad added benefits from it, be it, you know, getting payment for you, because end of the day, the big cops are making money from this data. So if you get paid a small portion of it, that would be just, you know, the butter on the topping. So uh, adding on to this, uh, you know, this debate, there's a huge debate going on uh, with respect to search engines, because, you know, search engine is a place where most of us spend, I mean, uh, with respect to, I mean, we spend all of our, all our queries, what we want to search, what we want to buy. So there's a huge debate going on between uh, Google and DuckDuckGo. So what's your take on that? Uh, so between uh, Google and DuckDuckGo? Yeah. Uh, so this is another one of those choices, right? Um, yeah. And it is you like, and I'm all about choice, right? So like I mm -hmm. advocate for data ethics and I think that there are many things that we can be doing better as companies um, mm -hmm. and as businesses, but also this relies on the consumer too, to decide that they want that choice and to make choices that make yeah. sense for them. Um, and so I think, and I've, and I've definitely seen this debate a little bit, but um, that's another one of those choices. It's the difference between using, uh, if you're gonna use Chrome or you're gonna use Firefox, and then instead of um, using those, you use Brave Browser. Mm -hmm. And so Brave Browser might mean that you have to go download it um, and then, you know, like, and, and actually use that one. So DuckDuckGo, I think the same kind of concept, right? Yeah. Um, so do you, want to do you want to keep using google and if you do that's fine um i'm well aware of what google tracks on me in terms of my search what they're collecting how they're saving it um but i will say that even i i still use google it's habit i go there i search for it um but it is but DuckDuckGo is it's a choice it's another one of those choices where you say oh here's an alternative solution in the marketplace how can i better support companies that give me choice um, and are transparent about how they're using my data, because those are the really the key components, I think, of data ethics. Absolutely, because, you know, there's no size, no one size fits all concept in this market. So, you know, for someone, DuckDuckGo could be the better option. And for others, Google is the way to go out. And uh, so just to add on this, uh, so you started your career in data. I mean, and maybe as a data engineer or data scientist, then you, what was your journey? I mean, uh, for, everyone, uh, for, for everyone who's tuned in, and you know who who are starting in their their journeys in the data science field. So for for instance, I'm a data analyst. I'm studying data analysis, and I'm uh, studying data engineering uh, in my masters. So uh, so what what is the ideal path like to becoming a data privacy and ethical data advocate? And uh, so what are the skills you need to have? And how did you land there? What would be your suggestion for that? Absolutely. And so um, and. Uh, because the, from the data analyst side, um, I mean, yes, absolutely. Uh, started out actually in my career, um, I was a computer programmer initially. Mm -hmm. um, before I actually ended up, I got my master's in advertising um, okay. at Syracuse University. But even then, um, I had gotten into mostly digital, um, like digital advertising, digital media buying, and um, and it is not always an easy field to get into initially. Um, yeah. So you absolutely 
need to have a lot of persistence and a lot of patience. Um, and then also what we're seeing skill-wise in the marketplace today, the one thing that has really just um, defined how I approach things differently than you know than a, just an analyst or like a, a computer engineer, um, which these are these are amazing roles. But when you start to learn these um, engineering and computer programming, you start to look at how you analyze data, um, and you're building dashboards, you're doing all this, and you come to this mm -hmm. point where you start to ask why, right? Um, just like when you know, when I'm processing all this data, yeah. I start to ask questions, right? Um, so I think it's an inquisitiveness and. Um, and one of the key things is being strategic. So asking, why am I doing this? Why does this matter? Um, so if you're going to be analyzing data um, and you have all those amazing technical skills that come with this kind of role, um, then you have to go that step further and you have to look at this data and how you strategically apply it. And I call this yeah. ethical data strategy as well, um, because I, data ethics on its core is, is fantastic. Um, you know, here's principles, guidelines, things that you should be doing, but then how does that impact a business? business? Why yeah. does it matter? Um, and I think that strategic step of asking why is really um, skill-wise. What we're hoping to see, like, and when I do interviews and when I look at um, for people to join my team, these are the kinds of things that I look for is people who are inquisitive, people who ask why, people who um, start to really analyze things and, and go that step further and be super strategic with the data they're yeah. collecting. So basically, you know, uh, is my skills, is the skills that I have in the data domain, are they affected the society for good? So if they are, then I should probably continue. And if they are not, I should probably question. So that's the crux of, you know, your message. So yeah, uh, so moving forward, you know, uh, so basically I wanted to ask, you know, so you have this journey, right? So looking back, what do you think, you know, things that you could have done differently uh, what are the areas that, you know, you look back in, ret in retrospect that, okay, these are the things that I could have done differently. So, yeah. Um, so that's an interesting question, but I will tell you that um, I am one of those people that lives with very few regrets. Um, and as far as doing things differently, um, not a whole lot. It's been a, like, okay. it's not, you know, um, it was not a smooth journey uh, at any mm -hmm. point in time um, to get to where I am. However, I know that um, in terms of, I wouldn't say that I would do anything differently aside from looking earlier in my career and looking earlier to say, um, to really start to interpret how you respond to situations instead of reacting, right? So we all have bad days. We all have a boss that yells at us. We all have um, something that goes terribly wrong. We have, we feel underappreciated, that kind of thing. And this happens everywhere. Um, and so I would have to say to that is, uh, learning, the only thing I would have done really differently is learning earlier on how to respond to situations and not react and be a little mm. calmer, understand that life is long and um, and not every moment, you know, is a moment to panic or a moment to uh, to have like a bad reaction um, and to, to kind of process that a little bit differently. But I do know that every bump in the road, every hard time, every good time, every person I've met has led me to what has been so far an amazing career. And I can only yeah. hope that that is what happens for everybody is that they appreciate the hard times as well as the good and know that that's what leads to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. Great nuggets of wisdom, Tiffany. So we have a question from Tessa. So uh, I'm curious as to how you see Apple's express opt-in affecting the advertising industry and its activity on which so many businesses rely. For example, the current data I have seen on how, how many people are opting into Apple's permission prompt shows that the ability to track has gone from 70% to around 10 to 15%. How do you think advertisers will be able to address this gap and continue to effectively market their products and services to the digital platform users? So first off, um, this is, oh, it's huge. It's gonna have a huge impact. Um, okay. But two things to keep in mind is one, um, that uh, every business should be have should have their own first party data collection system, right? So every business should be going out to their consumers, knowing who their consumers are, asking them for permission to use their data outside of the Apple platform. Second, um, if all else fails, you do know that Apple is spinning up their own ad platform um, where you mm -hmm. can purchase ads through Apple, which is 
a very, I mean, a very smart move on their part, a little tricky, but a smart move on their part um, because they, Apple is still collecting data on you. They're just not um, allowing those apps to collect data on you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so very, you know, fine distinction, but there are ways around it. And also if you are only relying on that third party um, data collection from Apple, then the rest of your data strategy is severely lacking and needs to be paid better attention to because there, those are the ways that you solve for that outside of Apple. Cool. So as we are ending to the uh, moving to the end of the session, so where can we learn more about you and how can we connect with you? Absolutely. So um, I, I hopefully this has been shared to you um, yeah. in the chat or like, um, so LinkedIn, great place. Um, I yeah. post regularly on LinkedIn. Um, also, you can find me on pretty much any social platform uh, at TJ Does Data. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I speak on Clubhouse from time to time. Um, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram uh, under, under TJ Does Data. Cool. It was nice to have you, Tiffany, and uh, everything I got to learn from you and the audience that learned from you. So looking forward to have you soon and thank you. Thank you for speaking with us. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time today. Yeah. Meg, you can jump in and I'll pass the mic to you. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, that was an absolutely amazing chat and really, really informative, especially to somebody who does not really know much about data on my own. So thank you so much for that. Um, as we move into our next session, I just wanna highlight, um, if you are looking to earn uh, SHRM credits from today's sessions, you are gonna need to refer yourself to the code that's in the upper um, left-hand corner of the slide in front of you. So or, sorry, upper, upper left that way, sorry. Um, and then if you are just joining us, I wanna say hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining Power to Fly for our Diversity Reboot 2021 virtual chat series or virtual summit series, my bad. Um, today, uh, the, the theme for July is Tech for Social Impact. And we hope that you all are just as excited as we are to continue the amazing conversations that we had yesterday and then today. Um, as we go through this upcoming conversation, I wanna make sure that all of you understand our events are participatory. We want you all to get the chance to um, communicate and interact with our speakers. So. In, um, in that vein, if you have questions or comments that you'd like to share with our speakers or with our panel, please feel free to put those into the chat box you see on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, it's, uh, it's a really great way for you to um, you know, kind of participate and drive the conversation today. Um, the other thing I wanna highlight for you is that if you um, have any technical issues, please feel free to tag in myself. My colleague Arushi is also in that chat um, box and we're happy to try and help you with any kind of tech issues you might be having. Um, again, though, the last thing I'm going to talk to you about um, for the chats is I'm going to refer you to the code of conduct. I'm going to put that into the um, group chat here in just a moment, but that is just there to um, ensure that this session, like all of our virtual events, is a great experience for everyone involved. So whether you are um, interacting with your community members or connecting with the speakers and the panelists, um, just make sure you're leading from a place of kindness and respect. Um, all right, so last but not least, if you are looking to earn SHRM credits for this upcoming talk, again, you're just going to want to refer to the code that's in the upper left-hand corner of the slide in front of you, and super excited to jump into the next session. So I would love to introduce you to our speakers. First up, we have Kate Agnew. Kate is, is a Senior Director of Software Engineering at Optum, where she began in 2017 on a team tasked with modernizing and introducing scalable technologies to healthcare. Now managing a team of 60 plus software engineers, Kate has created multi-million dollar impacts and is always looking for ways to take on more. Prior to Optum, Kate had various roles, including employee number seven at an AI startup and campaign manager in a city council race. Um, she obtained her BA from McAllister College and an MBA from MIT. Outside of work, Kate previously served as the managing director of the nonprofit Girls in Tech Minneapolis and currently serves on the board of a girl-focused STEM charter school the Laura Jeffrey Academy. Kate is also a commissioner for the city of Edina and the communications director for the McAllister Alumni Board. So welcome, Kate. Kate will be joined in conversation by our own amazing Raquel Grenet. Raquel is a recent addition to the PTF family and comes to us with an impressive track record in digital media sales. Prior to this, she spent nine years with Mogledom Media Group, which focuses mm -hmm. on the African-American online audience through their sites, Bossip, Madame Noir, and Hip Hop Wired. Raquel maintains an impressive wine collection of 177 bottles and considers herself a hostess ex uh, extraordinaire. Her personal catchphrase is ABC, anything but Chardonnay. 
Uh, Raquel, so happy to um, and excited to, to you know, listen in on this upcoming talk. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Kate, thanks so much for sitting down with us and speaking with us today. Um, I want to get started by asking you a couple questions. Why don't we begin? Again, the session by learning more about you and your career journey so far. What motivated you to start your career in healthcare, and what exactly is United Health Group? Yeah, great questions. Uh, so, thankfully, I had someone reading my entire background, so I don't need to go go too into that. Um, but I've been at United Health Group now for about four years, and in my 10 year career that I've had so far, I've really been within the technology organization the entire time. Um, I did an internship during the, the two years of my MBA at DreamWorks Animation actually um, as a brand manager. So that was the one time that I, I kind of dabbled outside of IT. And I was really interested in, in helping to shape the next generation through the content that they are consuming. Uh, but then was reminded that technology is my passion. So ended up at United Health Group. Um, so really United Health Group, people, people have often heard of United Health Care. Um, that is a part of the United Health Group. Um, and so is Optum. Optum is a health services innovation company with a mission of helping people live healthier lives and helping make the health system work better for everyone. Um, so, you know, when I was really looking at where did I want to take my next journey in my career, I, I looked at the, the state of our society right now and thought about the role that healthcare plays and healthcare plays a huge role uh, and there's a lot to improve within within the healthcare space. So have joined on with that and, and really enjoying the work that I do. Great. Well, and just like Optum, you're driven towards equitable health for all. Can you share how you brought change in your organization? Yeah, so there's there's one example that I, I want to draw on, and it was actually prior to my time at um, United Health Group. Um, but before I talk really about this, um, which is specifically, you know, giving uh, parental leave access to all parents, um, the reason that I want to talk about it is is that it is so tightly coupled with the gender pay gap. Um, but before that, kind of a note about terminology that I'll be using. Um, I often use the words birther and non-birther to acknowledge that not every pregnant person identifies as a woman and that not every kind of non-birthing parent is necessarily a father. Um, so you'll also hear me refer to mothers and fathers, um, but in the end, my goal is really the same, um, that all parents who are welcoming a child into their home deserve equal time away. And so, like I just said, though, one of the main reasons for that is because it's so tightly coupled with the gender pay gap. Um, so think about, you know, the policies that a lot of organizations have. Um, they might have, you know, a maternity leave policy um, that gives the birthing parent a certain amount of time away from work. Um, other companies refer to this as primary and secondary care policies, um, which really plays a role in determining the amount of leave that that parent can get. Um, and I reflect back on, you know, when my when my first daughter was being uh, coming into our family, um, as I was about to give birth to her, we were going through this policy with my husband's company. Um, so there, they treat everyone as, are you a primary or are you the secondary caregiver? And I just remember thinking, like, wait, why why do we have to choose? Like, aren't aren't we equals? Aren't we both going to be the parents? Um, and then too, I was like, well, I want you to be the, the primary. Like, I would love it if, if you're kind of taking the lead at home and, you know, I can continue to do, do my career and do all my extracurriculars that I'm so passionate about, right? But really what they were getting at is, is who is the mother, but they called it primary and secondary. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, terminology does play a, a really big role in this because by rooting in these terms of primary and secondary, you're really setting the standard and the expectation that mothers are the caregivers and that fathers are the breadwinners. Um, and then that translates to not being equals in the home. And so for me, it's been really, really important to have within the organizations that I'm a part of um, equal paid leave. Um, and and that can be a huge undertaking, right? Like how do you, how do you even start that conversation? 
And so when this happened to me, thankfully, I was at a smaller organization. Um, I think fewer than 100 people at the time, maybe 80 or so within the organization. And one of the first questions that I asked is, you know, why is this policy the way that it is? You know, I, I often think that there are policies on paper for a reason, um, or sometimes, you know, it's just, this is the way it's always been, but, but there's something behind that, right? Um, there was an intention behind a, a policy being set. And so I asked a lot of questions. Um, I think that for this one in particular, kind of trying to dig into why, why did men, particularly men in the organization, or why did the non-birthing parent not receive equal pay were some of the questions that I was asking. And it was easier for me to ask them as a woman. Um, sometimes I, I think of, you know, me going in, you know, I can fight for more um, maternity leave, right? But they might think, oh, well, she just wants to you know, there are reasons for, for her to have that intent. I think it was easier for me not to be someone who necessarily was going to be receiving that parental leave directly myself to kind of poke some of those holes in and ask some of those questions. Um, and so then I really found out kind of why, why it was the way that it was. I think in this smaller organization, no one had ever really asked or created a policy or, or presented a proposal. Um, so that's what I did. I, I did a lot of um, research and information gathering and put together a, a description for why it was really important for all parents um, to have that, that equal time away from home, um, or excuse me, from work to enjoy the, the new child at home. And presented that to the head of HR and then to the CEO. And ultimately it was, it was something that was adopted. And I think that that's, I mean, it's a really great story because I love that the organization um, did that, but at the same time, that's like the easy button, right? Like it, it's not that easy um, at other organizations. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how to take on some of these challenges at, at some of the the larger organizations. Um, but one thing I do want to note, right, um, I, I said at the beginning that, that this is very tightly coupled with the gender pay gap. Um, and I, I kind of want to give some, some stats <laughs> to back that up. So I, I did take a couple here. Um, the Groton Institute recently published research that shows that the average 25-year-old woman who goes on to have a child can expect to earn two million in Australian dollars where this research was done, 2 million, million less by the time she is 70 than the average 25 year old man who becomes a father. And th that's really a startling statistic, right? Um, and so when we think about how do you start to boil the ocean of the gender pay gap, there's a lot of different levers that are gonna come into play. This is one small lever of, of treating, you know, all parents as equals in the, the home life so that they can also be treated as equals um, in the work life. So that's something that's super, super important to me. And, and I love that I was able to help make that change within an organization. Well, why do you feel it's important for the non-birthing parents to have paid family leave? Yeah, I think it's really because of that, that primary and that secondary terminology, right? You know, when you think about the bonding that happens with a, a new child early, early on, um, it's super important for, for both, both parents or sometimes, you know, there's more than two parents in, in a situation, but it's really important for all parents to have that time and to, to have that bonding time. Um, and so, that it really builds the foundation for those parents to become equals in the home. And I think that that's really at the root of what I'm trying to get to is, is become equals in the home. And that leads to being equals as well in the workplace. Great. And I know you're a big change maker at your organization, but how did you bring change to the transgender community? Yeah. Um, so this is one that I was actually able to do at United Health Group. Um, so I'll set the stage a little bit. Um, within our organization, there are tons of different um, systems and they all relied on someone's legal name. Um, when you kind of go back to why that is, like it, it sort of makes sense, right? Like you have one name and it's easy just to have one name within all systems. And the legal name is needed for for tax purposes, for social security and, and paycheck purposes, right? Um, but what happens then when you require an employee to use their legal name throughout the system is that um, it, 
I think in primary, it, it has to, to impact the transgender community. Um, so there are people who may be going through transition who have not yet legally changed their name, but go by a different name. And so there are very real situations where on a daily basis, people's companies are dead naming them to, to the environment and to their, to their community. And it was really about removing that and allowing people to step up and say, this is the name that I want to be referred to within my own organization. Um, and I, th I think that there are other reasons too, you know, it doesn't just impact the transgender community, um, but there are many different reasons why someone might not want to go by their legal name. And it's really about the inclusion aspect, right? Like that's what we're talking about here is diversity and inclusion. And if you are an organization that really wants to invite um, the LGBTQA plus community into your organization as employees, how are you then in including practices that is inclusive to them and not, you know, bringing them into an organization, but then making them feel not welcome, then you're going to lose those employees too. And so for me, it was really important to, why not allow someone to use their preferred name within a system. And so for this one, um, this is actually a change that I did help make at um, United Health Group, um, where started asking the questions of, of who is it that makes these decisions and, and who can help. And I ended up reaching out to our chief um, inclusion and diversity officer and kind of just pushed enough to get a project owner assigned to the pro project, um, which I think was a feat in and of itself. But this is one of those, those uh, initiatives that is a little bit more complex than simply changing a policy. And I know that I'm, I'm oversimplifying that too, um, but there are hard coded systems and technologies that, that center around a person's legal name. So pull together a project team to actually assess what is it gonna take from an investment perspective, um, dollars, as well as how many people need to be involved in this effort. And then what is the scope of the effort? Um, this project has been going on for over a year now. Um, finally went through a couple of the first releases, which means that in a lot of the kind of jointly, um, we have a, a Bravo system. So it's a, it's a system where anyone can go in and like give Bravos to a, a colleague and say, thank you for helping me on this. That was one of the systems that relied on someone's legal name. That was one of the mm -hmm. first ones that we prioritized to say, let's, let's give people their preferred name as an option here. Um, and so it's still ongoing. Uh, there are, you would probably not be surprised actually, but like hundreds of systems that are, are connected to these names. And so it's quite an undertaking, but I think really, really important to get it at the root of, of being inclusive and allowing people to, to enter into the organization as they are. Okay. Well, why and how is change and equity interlinked? So during Pride Month, um, Washington's representative um, posted about companies, um, Washington State, um, posted about companies who put a pride flag in their logo, but then also gave do donations to, you know, representatives or organizations that are against LGBTQA rights. Um, it's really important for me to work at a company that is not only you know, that outwardly celebrates, um, but really inwardly supports and creates that change. Um, so, you know, one of the other things that I've done within my company is I, I include my pronouns within my signature. Um, and I did this so that it's accepted. Um, and then I didn't just, you know, kind of do it silently, but I sent a note to my peers explaining to them why I did so and encouraging them to do so as well. You know, I really think that as we invite humans in, into our workplaces and as our colleagues, it's about bringing your entire self. And that's why I really think that, that making these changes that need to be made within organizations um, to really give equity and, and create an, a welcoming environment for everyone is just, it's what we need to be doing. So for members of the audience who wanna do the same thing at their organizations, how did you approach this situation and what are some of the action-oriented steps members can, uh, this audience can take to lead change at their organization? So I think first, figure out who owns the decision or can be a decision maker. Um, so whether it's a chief culture inclusion diversity officer, a CEO, head of HR, just figure out who has the power to make and approve that change. 
Um, then build a case. Why is it important? Who is it impacting? What is that impact? And then you start to get into the details. What will it make to, what will it take to make this change? Uh, is it a policy change? Is there actual technology implications, right? When I, when I talk about preferred names, we had to go through an entire technology overhaul. Um, I think it ended up costing like $10,000 per system across tens of different systems. Um, but in the grand scheme, right, that, that's not that much of an investment when you consider the impact that it makes to employees. Um, so start with who can make the change and then just really build the case and continue pushing. I would say, don't take that first no as, as a no. Say, okay, well, tell me more about that. Why, what's preventing it? Or what are some of the blockers? And really try and get to the heart of why is this there? Um, and bring in more people, uh, you know, have more of the conversations at different angles, because it's not always going to be the first person that you go to that has the ability to make that change. Great. So um, my final question really to you is, what are some books or podcasts that you recommend to the audience on rallying change within their organization? Uh, so I have a couple of books that are just like my favorite books. Um, they're not necessarily about change, but I love Mindset by Carol Dweck. Um, that's something that's really helped me. Um, there's also a couple other books, um, Redefining Realness by Janet Mock, um, Motherhood So White by Nerfetz T. Austin, I think is a really, really good book. Um, books that I have on my list though, that I need to read that really are about creating this change um, include um, Unbound, A Woman's Guide to Power, uh, Just Work, uh, Get Stuff Done, Fast and Fair by Kim Scott. Um, she has other books too that I think are really good. Um, and then there's two others, The Adventure of Women in Tech um, by Alana Karen, and then Diversity in the Workplace by Bari Williams. I think that these are all just really important books about like what is happening within organizations, how do you create that change? Um, and then given that I was asked the question, um, another book that I would recommend is Run for Something, uh, because honestly, I think we should all run for office, uh, and I'd like to myself, so that's why it's on my list. Uh, as far as podcasts go, there was actually a podcast that I was listening to on my walk into work five years ago that ultimately led to changing that parental leave policy, um, which is The Riveters. I don't think that they do that anymore, but the episodes from a few years ago are really great. Uh, and then No One Is Coming to Save Us is another kind of new um, four episode podcast mini series about the infrastructure of childcare, um, which I just think is really awesome. Great. Well, I guess now is the time to turn to audience questions. So we'd love to hear from you guys. What kind of questions do you have for Kate? So I'm not seeing anything in the chat room. Meg, can you tell me, do we have any questions popping up? Uh, I'm taking a look there right now. The only one I'm seeing came in a, in a DM to me and it says, it wants to know if, if Kate has gotten any blowback on the birther terminology because this person says they agree that, um, you know, primary and secondary parent or mother and father is very limiting. Um, but have there been, has there been any blowback from people um, who maybe are adding children to their their family not by biological means. I think that's a, a really good point. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why I really am just trying to create change for all parents. So like I said, anyone who really is inviting or bringing, not necessarily inviting, bringing a child into the home, right? Whether that's through adoption or through any other means. Um, and so I, I use, um, often the birther and non-birther terminology. When I'm referring to some of these policies that are really rooted in the act of birthing. Um, so for example, a lot of organizations often break parental leave into two different categories. They'll say you have a short-term disability leave uh, term, um, which is also dependent on the type of birth. So vaginal delivery, you get six weeks. And for cesarean delivery, you get eight weeks of, of paid um, short, well, depends on it, but short-term disability. And then there is often a parental leave policy, which is separate. And so I think that that's why it is important to um, 
embrace the reality and understand that there are different policies that exist for birthers and non-birthers. Um, but I think that the change that I want to see is that any and all parents get equal bonding time, equal leave um, to spend with those children that they're bringing into their homes. That's great. Um, I have a question here. Any people that you would recommend following on Twitter or LinkedIn for the kind of content which you've been covering? You know, so, so I'll say one, follow me on Twitter, and then I just tend to retweet and amplify a lot of people. Um, so there's, I, I follow a lot of representatives. Um, so those who are in Congress um, who are really trying to make a lot of these changes law, right? Like I gave some really good advice on how to, well, I think it's really great. I gave some advice on how to create this change within your own organization. Uh, but that's really piecemealed. Why, why are we in a, a situation where, I have to give a talk and implore people to go and talk to their head of HR to go and make this change, right? I really think that this is change that should become law uh, and should should really come down from that stance. Um, and so because of that, I, I am heavily involved in politics and, and supportive of those types of policies. Um, but until that becomes law and, and more of a reality of our situation, I think that this is one real um, tactical way that individuals can make change too. Well, now, where else can we see you? Are you going to be someplace else? Where else can we follow you at? <laughs> so I do think that my, both my LinkedIn uh, as well as my personal website will be posted. Um, but, you know, I, I like to close out really every speaking engagement that I do with this. Uh, if you are a woman, a person of color, LGBTQA+, plus, are neurodivergent, disabled, or really any person who doesn't feel like they have the network they need to succeed in this industry, please feel free to reach out to me to network or for career conversations, whatever. Um, if you connect with me on LinkedIn, just be sure to include a note describing why you want to connect. Um, and again, I'm pretty sure both the link to my LinkedIn and my website will be posted in the chat. Perfect. Well, great. I just want to thank you so much for sitting down with Power to Fly today. We very much appreciate all this vital information that you've shared with us, and it has been lovely. Um, let's see what's here. Do you know we are hosting a virtual career fair on Thursday the 15th? Um, for the audience, please come. There are plenty of rooms to um, sit into and learn information about various companies. And then, Meg, I guess I'll turn that over to you since we have a couple of minutes left. Um, before yeah. the session's over, but yeah, sure. Talk. I'm happy to pick it up. Um, Kate, before you bounce, one thing I want to recommend to you in case you haven't read it is a book called Spouseonomics. It's, um, it's about how to use economics to um, maximize the greatest, you know, the largest investment that you make in your life. And I found it really interesting coming from a cisgender heteronormative couple into, you know, like navigating uh, relationships with friends that don't have that same like traditional whatever um, relationship. And it was really, really impactful for me, especially because I don't have a background in economics. And so it really set up a, a whole new like field and a whole new, um, you know, time for me to really think about how we divide work and how, how these conversations happen and how we, how we really maximize the time that we have with people, but also like the communication that goes into um, that level of relationship. So it was really, really interesting. Thank you. I, yeah. I, you're welcome. Um, all right, so I, again, huge thank you. Um, just kind of echoing what Raquel said, both of you ladies were absolutely amazing. It was really great to listen to this chat. Um, and I'm so excited. I'll get to go back and review the, um, the recordings that we have of these chats. We're going to post those um, in the coming weeks, usually mostly in the next two weeks. Um, so huge thank you to both of you ladies. And um, as we get our next speakers onboarded, um, while we have a little bit of time left, I want to talk um, to you all a little bit more about our merch store. So in case you hadn't, um, you hadn't seen this before, um, I'm going to share a link in the chat in just a second where you can go to check out um, our merch and see what we've got on offer. Now, um, one of the things I wanna highlight for you um, in regards to this is this is not you know, a shameless like cash grab or we just want you to be wearing our stuff or we're expanding into retail. One of the things we like to do um, you know, for the first time starting last year with our inaugural summit, um, we started into this like merch area. And the reason we did this is because we found it to be a really great way that we can, um, you know, kind of spread the word about Power to Fly, but also support really great organizations. So 
as you can see on the slide in front of you, um, this is a selection of some of the um, some of the merch that we have available for sh for sale in our uh, bonfire shop. Um, the biggest thing that you need to know about this is that 100% of the proceeds, so every every single cent um, from anything that you purchase in this store, so 100% of the money that would be profit on this is going to go um, and be do uh, directly donated to Trans Tech Social. Now, if you've never heard of them, Trans Tech Social is an incubator for LGBTQ talent with a focus on economically empowering transgender people. So they do this via upskilling or career pivoting into um, industries that are more progressive, less judgment, more um, and more you know better opportunities for transgender people who historically have been very ostracized and very marginalized, whether intentionally or unintentionally, by you know prevailing culture within the U.S. as well as you know outwardly. Um, in case uh, you are unaware, the founder of Trans Tech Social is the amazing Miss Angelica Ross. Um, you can catch uh, some of her great um, chats on past summits that we've had. Um, she's also obviously more commonly known as an amazing performer from Pose, um, as well as um, her amazing work in American Horror Story 1985 or 1984. I think it's 1984. Um, so if you are interested in you know, expanding your uh, your athleisure wardrobe or just looking good while you, uh, you know, mow the lawn or hang out at home, um, please um, take a look at this merch shop. It is a really great way to, you know, get some comfy new threads to wear, but also support an amazing cause. Um, like, I, like I said earlier, all of the profits from this are being donated directly to Trans Tech Social, but the funds from what we're selling here are going to specifically support technical boot camp fees for Black, transgender, or non-binary people on their way to a career in engineering. So it is a really good way to make sure that you are actively helping people who need it um, without, you know, having to think twice or having to, you know, figure out who you should, um, you know, who you should uh, donate to or anything like that. We guarantee this is a really great cause. Um, now, the last thing I'm going to talk about before we jump into our next session is our upcoming um, summit. So we are actually taking a break in August. We're not going to be putting on a monthly summit, but I'm going to share with you all in the chat right here um, the link where you can register for our upcoming summit in September. Now, this, uh, this summit is going to focus on early career connections and mid-career pivots. So it is a really great place to go um, and to attend if you are a student, if you're a recent grad, if you are somebody who is looking to transition um, you know, into a new field definitely come to this. Um, there's gonna be um, some amazing chats as well as a bunch of companies that are looking for interns and entry-level professionals. Now, like all of our virtual events that are, sorry, like all of our, our summits, um, that event will have a virtual job fair attached to it in September. But if you wanna get a jump on this, I would highly recommend that you attend our virtual job fair that's happening on Thursday. Now, um, you can see on the screen there, um, a selection of some of the really great companies that are going to be joining us. I'm sharing a link in the chat to where you can um, register for this virtual job fair. It's 100% free to attend. I very much encourage you to, um, to come, up, come register, sign up. If you are an active job seeker and cannot attend this fair, still register. It is a great way to make sure that you, your name, your, your Power to Fly profile, your LinkedIn information, whatever you connect to that Power to Fly profile, is sent to the, the companies that participate in this job fair. Um, the other thing you should know, it's gonna happen from noon Eastern to 3 p.m. Eastern on Thursday. But if you can't stay for the whole thing, that's okay. If you need to jump in, visit one room and then jump out, that's okay too. Um, the other thing I like to highlight is that several of the companies, um, including I think Helm and Autodesk and Smartsheet, I believe are all, um, in, in addition to several more, are all, um, uh, including and open to remote uh, hiring options. So if you are like me and do not want to go back to a, you know, to a physical office, definitely take a look at those companies. Um, the other thing I like to, to highlight for people is that if you are part of the 40% of Americans who are maybe not ready to leave your current job, but very curious to see what else is out there, maybe you're reevaluating some of your, your perk priorities um, during you know, COVID and during the, the uh, lockdown and quarantine and all that, um, you are not alone, and this would be a really great place um, to come and, um, uh, you know, get some face time with um, these amazing organizations 
learn more about them from the inside. You can get um, you can get connections with uh, which, with the hiring managers, as well as hear from some of the um, the team members directly, which I think is more impactful and honestly gives you a much better um, idea of what a company's culture is like. Um, all right, so if we go to the next slide. I'm super excited to introduce you to our amazing upcoming speaker. Um, so Michael D. Tubbs um, at, started making history at the age of 26 when he was elected the youngest mayor of any major city in American history. As mayor of Stockton, California, Tubbs was lauded for his leadership and innovation. Under his stewardship, Stockton was named an all-American city in 2017 and 2018, saw a 40% drop in homicides in 2018 and 2019, led the state of California in the decline of officer-involved shootings in 2019, was named the second most fiscally healthy city in California, and was featured in an HBO documentary film, Stockton On My Mind. Um, Mr. Tubbs raised over $20 million to create the Stockton Scholars, a universal scholarship and mentorship program for Stockton students. Tubbs has been named a fellow at the Harvard Institute of Politics and the MIT Media Lab, a member of Fortune's Top 40 Under 40, a Forbes 30 Under 30 All-Star alumni, the most valuable, um, as well as the most valuable mayor by The Nation um, publication. Tubbs is the founder and chair of Mayors for a Guaranteed Income and currently serves as the special advisor to California Governor Gavin Newsom for economic mobility. So welcome, Michael. Um, we are so, so happy to have you here. Um, interviewing Michael will be Kadira Harris. Kadira leads global responsibility for Matterport, which is a spatial data company leading the digital transformation of the built world. Kadira has dedicated her career to helping companies be socially responsible and intentionally centers equity and inclusion in her work. Kadira is passionate about supporting the next generation of leaders and enjoys mentoring and developing others along their career journey. She has her undergraduate degree from Marquette University and a graduate degree from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. So welcome, Kadira and Michael. I will turn the stage over to you. Take it away. Thank you, Meg. Michael, wow. You've got receipts. You who got some receipts. And that's what I really want to talk about. I just want to jump right in and thank you for um, taking time today to have this conversation. I want to talk about your journey. I mean, just, just walk us through what did that look like? How did you decide? How did you get there? Talk a little bit about what that looked like. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be brief. So if I don't answer your question, feel free to jump in. And, and thank you for that far too kind introduction. It's funny, all those accolades and you can still lose um, <laughs> re-election. Re um, but so I'm born and raised in Stockton, but born and raised in the part of Stockton I spent a lot of time working on. I grew up in poverty. My mom had me as a teenager. My father is, is still incarcerated. So I was lucky enough to go to Stanford. Um, and while there, I realized that the people I went to school with weren't necessarily smarter than the people I grew up with. And that sounds very simple now, but that was such a revelation because I was told I was so lucky to get in that everybody would be smarter than me, that, oh my gosh, they took pity on you and they were so kind and gave you a seat. I'm in class, I'm like, they, they are not smarter than the people I went to that I grew up with. They just had more resources and more opportunities. And much like your work, that's what really lit a fire in me. It's like, well, no, let's create a world that's more equitable, that's more fair and more just, and really allow human potential to flourish. So longer story short, I had no intention of actually going back to Stockton ever. I thought I had hit the jackpot with college and I was gonna go ahead and do other things far away from home. And then I entered in the White House for President Obama and my job actually was working with mayors and councils. And I did not enjoy the job, but I learned so much about how at the local level people were moving change. Then around the same time, one of my cousins ended up being murdered in Stockton. And it was really sort of that pain, that anger, that 21-year-old angst that made me really question, like, well, what was I doing and how was my community better served by me being personally successful? And that's what I decided when I was 21 to run for city council. So I won my city council seat, spent four years representing my neighborhood and learning so much about how things work and how things don't and, and about like why things happen and why things don't. And after my four years as a council member, I was crazy and said, you know what? I could do even more as a mayor. <laughs> so that's when I decided to run for mayor and spent four years doing that. But I think underlying all that was sort of just the lessons out this really empathy, but also great, I held in great regard the people who raised me, how I grew up, my three single mothers, my mom, my auntie, and grandmother who raised me, the, the 
the middle class, lower middle class mentors who are my basketball coaches, like just regular people who I just hold in such esteem and sort of elevating their stories and fighting for a world that works for them and for everyone um, is really sort of what, what, what brought me to sort of where I'm at now and, and what, what I was doing for the past eight years. You know, that that is um, so amazing. And I think, you know, listening to your story, there are so many people who can identify with your story, right? Your upbringing. But I think what is amazing is I'm listening to you talk about these folks in the room aren't smarter than me, right? It, it's not that. But exactly to your point, it's about equity and access, right? Which is why it's so important for us to really, you know, as you've been talking in the work that you've been doing as mayor and beyond, how do we level the playing field? right? How do we level the playing field? Okay, so one of the things that I heard about that you um, had done was an income experiment, right? So talk about the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration. What is it for folks that don't know about it? What does that look like? Yeah, and I'm gonna paint the scene for you because now it's it's like, there's like 30 mayors doing it now. And so now it's like, oh yeah, duh. But when I started in 2017, I was 27 years old, first year as mayor. This is before my friend Andrew Yang even announced he was running for president and even started talking about his universal, his freedom dividend, universal basic income. And I said, you know what, we're going to do a basic income experiment in Stockton. And, and part of it was, again, just really sort of deeply rooted in an understanding that most of the issues we see aren't issues of people, but issues of policy. Like the fact that people are economically insecure, the fact that we have more income and wealth inequality today than during the Gilded Age in the late 1920s, isn't because folks who don't have money are dumb, lazy, and don't want to do anything. It's literally a system policy issue. When you look at sort of 400 years of a nation's history where people were for 300 of those years denied a dollar for their labor that created all the wealth. Or then afterwards, we're giving predatory loans to share. It's, 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 so because of that, I said, you know what, we're going to demonstrate this idea that I learned from Dr. King, the fact that we should give everyone an income floor so that folks are able to do the things we want people to do in terms of being parents, partners, and productive citizens. Um, so we found 125 families randomly selected throughout the city, and we gave them $500 a month for two years. And what we saw is that all the tropes, and even now we're continuing with it with this unemployment insurance debate, were just false. Like people didn't stop working. The crazy thing is those who received a guaranteed income were two times more likely to be not to be fully employed than those who did not. <laughs> Meaning that like, those without money were unemployed, but those who are giving a little bit of money were able to pay for transportation, were able to pay for childcare, were able to have some time with which to work. We also saw sort of impacts on health, that those who received the guaranteed income were healthier. They moved from depressed to regular levels of stress and anxiety on the Kessler scale. They reported being able to breathe. They reported being able to respond to emergencies. And I'm really proud of that work because now we see it with the child tax credit where every single 80%, 88% of families with children are gonna be given $300 a month for children under four. We see it now with sort of the 58 mayors that are now part of Mayors for Guaranteed Income and with the pilots that are sprouting up across the country. But I think particularly for folks watching, and it always at the end when the success is happening and things look good, everyone looks smart and everyone looks like they're clairvoyant. Everyone looks like, oh, duh. When we started, it was real scary. <laughs> like, I was like, this, I was like, am I right? Because no one else is doing this. And, and these folks have been doing this for longer. So maybe I'm, maybe everyone can't be wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, right? And, and I think courage begets courage. So for folks watching and listening that the status quo is the status quo, oftentimes because no one has really interrogated it. And everyone just assumes that someone thought of it. <laughs> like everyone just assumes yeah. like, well, it's this way because, and most of the things are this way or this way for the opposite reason, because no one thought of it, because no one questioned it, because no one was like, wait, why are we doing this way? And I'm sure you know in your work, just by being in the room and asking questions, you've changed outcomes and changed process and policies. When in the back of your head, you're probably like, clearly someone had to ask this question before. Like, clearly I'm not the only one to ask, why am I right. not like me in this room? Or like, so. Right, right. No, that is true. <laughs> that is so true. And, and you're so right. It really is about 
you know, interrogating, interrogating the systems, you know, like the, like you said, the work is really about, you know, we get to addressing some of the issues when we look at the systems change. How do we change the whole system, right? Like that's just, let's not just address the, the, you know, the surface issues, but let's get to the system of it. Now you, you, you raised something about, you know, initially this being scary and, and now that it's popping up in other places, you've been involved in some of that, right? As it's been spreading, right? So talk a little bit about what has the response been, right? Like like you said, it's, it's good now when it's successful, but like talk a little bit more about what that response was like when this first started oh, popping up. Man, well, I mean, the idea was kind of radical, right? We're gonna give people money. Um, and then there's also who's giving people money. The young black mayor, the 27 year old black mayor of Stockton, his big idea is giving people money. Right. Oh my gosh. I got in, I was in Twitter wars with Sarah Palin, Chuck Woolery. Yeah. I knew when I was on Fox News or Bill O'Reilly's online platform because my office would get these crazy calls. We had people who were upset. And I'm like, why are y'all mad? This, first of all, it, and when we did it, it wasn't even taxpayer dollars. We had to do it with philanthropy. Mm-hmm. So I was, conf- I was actually confused that people were that upset. <laughs> I was like, well, I guess people are using city dollars okay we could have that but this is someone else's this not 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 your money and but people were upset for a couple of reasons i realized people were upset because number one it really questioned some things people held sacrosanct it really held it really it really caused them to question like well wait have we been doing this wrong well wait what happens if people have the ability to choose what jobs to take, what jobs not to take? They have a little bit of money. Wow. What, what, what happens when people have free time and they choose not to work two jobs or not to work for poverty wages? It's like, wow. And I, and, but I think it also really hit on some notions of deservingness, right? Because I think ingrained in all of us is this notion that we have to, I think, actively dissuade ourselves from that because we know how hard we work. So then we assume that people who aren't successful as us must not have worked that hard or must not be as naturally talented. Right. And particularly when you're like the first or the only, like you get, you get all these, this um, exceptionalism praise and it could, it could really mess with your brain. And I think part of it would cause people to think that, yes, maybe I work hard, but maybe the person who doesn't have money also works hard. And maybe there's other reasons why I was lucky enough to be successful and they weren't. So I think that was part of the angst and anger. And I mean, a lot of pressure because people were already calling it dead before we started. <laughs> people yeah. were already saying like, there's no way it can work. And what gave me real, real solace was that and I would tell my staff, they were, they would feel some of the anxiety and they would say, I would tell them, well, look, you guys, this is fundamentally about trust. Right. And I was like, if we trust people to make the decisions to get us in office, we should be able to trust them to make money on how to, how to spend money. Like the fact that everyone's going to, someone's going to take this money and you, you str- like the worst thing that can happen with this great opportunity. I was like, that's a deficit of imagination. And that, that, that's a issue we have with not affording other people the same benefit of the doubt we give us. And as a person of faith, I was like, this is really in line with my faith tradition. Like you love your neighbor as yourself and you do as you do to the least of these, Jesus said you do to him. So I was like, no matter what happens, if I, when it's time to go up there, He's going to say, what did you do? I'm like, I gave you money. I gave you $500 a month, no strings attached. <laughs> I, I made sure you were taken care of. That's right. <laughs> right. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Okay. So now as we, um, you know, obviously we have to talk about the pandemic, right? And talking about post-pandemic economic recovery, kind of staying on that same subject. What do you think about, you know, government's, um, or how governments and people are going to think differently about this idea of universal basic, you know, income and, and those types of benefits. Like, talk to me a little bit about yeah. how you think that's all going to shake out. I, not to be morbid, I'm a very optimistic person, but it would be tragic if after two years of a pandemic where half a million people died many of whom died because they had to go to work during the pandemic, right? Like, like think, think about that. Like people literally died because they couldn't afford to stay home during the pandemic where they said everyone needs to stay at home anyway, <laughs> right? That, that's so wild to me, right? So I, I, I really hope that we understand that this 
economic security, guaranteed income, universal basic income is a form of pandemic preparedness. It's contingency planning. And we live in a time of pandemics. It's not just COVID. At some point this year, there will be a fire that will make people not able to be able to go to work. At some point this next year, there'll be an earthquake. There'll be a flood. Like we live in a time of pandemics. And what we know is that economic security is key to allowing people to recover, to allow people to survive. And I think we see it even now more clearly. I was reading some research yesterday that said the, the highest number of people who aren't vaccinated are people who make less than 50,000 a year. And I was arguing with someone, I said, no, it's not because those folks are dumb. It's not because those folks don't want to get vaccinated. It's because a lot of those folks work jobs where they can't take time off without losing money, where they don't have paid time off, where they work hourly, where they have, like, when do they have time to go to get this vaccine? A, and then B, the vaccine has side effects. So it's going to be a three days without pay when I'm, when the eviction moratorium is lifting this month. And, and, and like, so I, I, I really hope, it, but I, I, am, I am optimistic because when we started in 2017, the conversation was, can we give people money? And now in 2021, we're giving parents money every month, regardless, just for being parents, like unconditional cash to parents, which is a huge first step. So I'm, I'm optimistic, but it is an issue of public health. It's an issue of national security, and it's an issue of pandemic response. And we have, we literally have to allow people to fortify and build economic resilience, so that when the next thing happens, we're in a better position. Because COVID caught so many people flat-footed, because the majority of Americans couldn't survive one emergency, like one five hundred dollar emergency before COVID nineteen, and then the big emergency happened where people weren't able to go to work, where folks were laid off, where small businesses had to close. Where, where folks weren't taking gig economy, Uber, Lyft drives as much as they used to. And, and, and people were really struggling. Um, so super long answer, but yes, I hope it changed people's minds. <laughs> no, that, that was amazing. And goodness, we could talk about that for the next two hours. Um, I, I do want to jump to a question in the chat and then possibly come back to that, but it's tied. Uh, the question is, how did you decide on the basics? How much money, who would be in the trial program? How long would it last? who evaluated the results um, of the project? It was a question I had, so I'm, I'm yeah. thankful that this person asked this. Yeah, so the project was evaluated by um, Dr. Stacia and Dr. Amy. They now run the Center for Guaranteed Income Research that we helped start with them, which is evaluating all the almost all the mayoral led pilots in this country. Cause I saw there's another question about where other places are. So right now we have 58 cities in Mayors for Guaranteed Income. We have about two dozen pilots. Providence, Rhode Island just announced a pilot, Cambridge, Massachusetts, bunch of cities in California, Madison, Wisconsin, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, it, 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 et cetera. In terms of the criterion, we had a whole design team. So we had sort of our partners at the Economic Security Project, which provide a lot of the funding for the project. We had my team, including Suki Samra, who runs Marriage Grants and Income and ran um, the, the Stockton pilot. We sat down and we thought about sort of given the money we have, <laughs> How many people can we serve that in a way that's statistically significant, which we found was over 100 people? And for how long? And we settled on $500, not because $1,000 isn't better or $2,000 or whatever, but because we felt that that would be enough to make a difference and it would be enough to get to 100 people. And it was responsive to the stat around the fact that at the time, one in two people could not afford one $500 emergency. Um, and then... We have, even in the state of California, the, the state assembly, Senate and the governor just passed a $35 million guaranteed income pilot for the state of California, prioritizing pregnant women and foster children. Um, but, but we see momentum there. We see kind of city governments, et cetera, um, all piloting the idea. So I'm incredibly proud and excited to see sort of how, again, courage begets courage and, 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 and part of the power to fly is actually flying, <laughs> even if no one else is. And knowing that in doing so, you'll liberate people to begin to, to flap their wings as well. Wow, I, I love that. My goodness, like I said, we could we could spend you know the next hour talking about economic empowerment for so many reasons. But I, I want to shift a little bit and talk about some of the other things that you're passionate about, specifically around crime and public safety, right? 
Um, there's another program that I want you to tell us about, the Advanced Peace. What does that look like? You know, how has it been impacting um, citizens? What, what is that? Yeah, I am. In, thank you for asking that question, because I, I ran for office because my cousin was murdered. So my maniacal focus was on reducing the number of homicides and shootings in Stockton, particularly because in California, the leading cause of death of Black and Latino young men between 18 and 40 years old is gun violence. Like, uh, not car accidents, not freak accidents, not hard. It's gun violence, right? Preventable gun violence at, at that. Um, so I've been, like, laser focused on, on, on that issue. So the advanced piece and the ceasefire programs we ran in Stockton were actually kind of precursors, again, to the conversations we're having now about alternatives to policing. And it's really about sort of how do we empower community members? How do we empower folks who may have similar backgrounds to the young men? Because 90% of gun violence is men um, actively involved in, in, in gun violence. How do we give them as much attention from case managers opportunities as I get from law enforcement. And that wasn't meaning that cops weren't doing their jobs. Like we wanted, if someone murdered someone or someone shot somebody, they should be brought to justice, right? But clearance rates for gun homicides naturally are 50%, which means for every murder, or 50% is probably high, it's like 30%, I think. So for every murder, the majority of murderers don't get caught. So they're still in our community. Like there's, and we have to do something about that. So what it was, was about sort of dispatching sort of case managers and social workers who will work with the men who are, and then the other thing is those who commit gun violence are also victims of gun violence. I think that's the tension that's difficult for folks to grapple with. Like the folks inflicting harm have also been harmed that the perpetrators and the victims are oftentimes the same person who's shooting and being shot at. Um, so long story short, we kind of gave them intensive case management, intensive life skill, intensive coaching, and int intensive support to transition. Because if you live in a life where you're shooting or being shot at, your life is like, everything's kind of crazy. Your housing insecure, your food insecure, your couch surfing, you, you can't stay anywhere because you're being hunted and you're hunting. So it's just, a, it, so the, the courage it takes to even change and to even disarm is admirable. And after six months, they're eligible for a cash stipend. They're eligible for kind of dollars in exchange for their job of being a fellow. And people get so upset with that. And I would say back then, but even more so now, fellowship, like people, I get, fellowships come with money usually, like, and they are fellows. So they're getting paid stipends, like fellows. Right. For a lot of people, that was like a bridge too far. Like, why are you giving these people money? Like it's cash for criminals. It's like- no, it's cash for fellows. Like it's a fellowship and every fellowship I know of pays something. But what we saw in Stockton again in 2018, 2019, 40% um, reduction in homicides. In fact, 2018, 2019 were the only time in this millennium in the 2000s where we had back-to-back -back years with less than 40 homicides, even though our population was increasing and our population was larger. So per capita, probably two of the safest years in terms of shootings and homicides in the city's history. And even in 2020, when most communities saw like a rise in, in homicides and shootings, we saw a rise in domestic disputes, but in terms of group gun gang violence, the kind of things we're focused on, that number stayed flat, even during pandemic where it was rising everywhere else. So super proud of that work, the folks who ran that office um, and also the men themselves. Cause I mean, that's tough. Like, I, I, I don't know, it, it's a very, very difficult life. Wow. So the proof proof was in the pudding, but oh, again, yeah. you know, it's uh, you know, when it comes to, to addressing crime and public safety, sometimes it can just we've got 50 different opinions on how it can be achieved and folks don't want to get on board. Um, so I'm looking at the the time and I'm like, gosh, I am hungry for more of this conversation and just to know more about your work and, and what you're involved in. I know you have a memoir. I want you to plug that. Um, but I also just want you to share with um, folks watching, how else can we connect with you? How can we learn more? Yeah, my Twitter is at Michael D. Tubbs, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-D-T-U-B-B-S. And same thing on Instagram. Um, I think my website is mtubbs.com. <laughs> Maybe. I, I'm pretty sure it is. And then on November 16th, I have a book coming out called The Deeper the Roots. It's a memoir. Um, it, it's, it's funny because I finished it in October. Um, and then 
November happened where I lost re-election. So I had to like write a couple more chapters. So it talks about being married during COVID, which was crazy. It talks about, I think that's, and I, first I was a little bit embarrassed, but now I realize like everyone loses or gets rejected. Like that's part of life. So it talks about like losing and how to bounce back for that. Particularly when you think you did your job really well. And particularly when everyone told you you did your job really, really well. And how do you kind of bounce back for that? And how do you kind of remain rooted in values and, and sort of what you're here to do and being more invested in doing something versus being something? And talks about growing up in Stockton, talks about the programs we mentioned, talks about the, like Parks and Rec has nothing on this, talks about the crazy council meetings I was, I was, a, I was a part of. Um, and I'm actually, I actually just reread it for final edits. It's actually good. Like I'm a reader. I was a little bit nervous, but then I read, I said, oh no, you wrote this. It's, 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 it's a good read. Um, it's called The Deeper the Roots. I love it. Michael D. Tubbs, this was a highlight for me. I um, am so honored. Thank you. Um, thank you, Power to Fly, for this. This was wonderful. Everyone pick up the memoir, go to the website, Twitter, Instagram. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. And great question. I enjoyed our conversation. Absolutely. Take care. Okay. That was wonderful. Um, thank you to you both. I cannot wait to read your memoir, Michael. That was staggering. I, I just can't wait. It's going to be so great. Um, all right. So as we roll on over into our next session, I just want to say um, hi and welcome to anybody who might just now be joining us. My name is Meg. I'm part of Power to Fly's virtual hosting team, and I'm going to be your, your host and moderator for the rest of um, today's session. So as we get going, um, if you are just now joining us, welcome uh, to day two of Power to Fly's Diversity Reboot 2021 virtual summit series. The theme for July is Tech for Social Impact, and we hope that you all are just as excited as we are to keep these amazing conversations going um, that we've been having for the last day and a half. Now, if you have any questions or comments or thoughts on this upcoming conversation, we really wanna hear from you. So like all of our virtual events, we try and make them as participatory and interactive as possible. So please, um, if you have any questions or comments for the speakers, please feel free to throw those into the group chat. It's gonna be on the right-hand side of your screen. And the other thing that I wanna highlight for you is that if you, um, if you have any kind of technical issues or anything at all, please feel free to tag myself, my coworker, um, Lauren is also in the chat. Um, I'd love to be there to help you if you have any kind of tech issues that we can help you out with. Um, now, if you are looking to earn SHRM credits from this upcoming conversation, you're gonna wanna take a look at the, at the code that's in the upper left-hand corner of the slide in front of you. Um, if you are not part of the Society of Human Resource Managers, don't sweat it, you don't need the code, you don't need to worry about anything about it. Um, last but not least, I'm going to refer you to the code of conduct um, that my coworker Arushi is sharing in the chat right now. That's just there to um, ensure that this session, like all of our virtual events, is a great experience for everyone involved. So as you are interacting with your community members and connecting with speakers and panelists, just make sure you're leading from a place of uh, kindness and respect. As always, you know it's it's really what we we've come to um, we've come to expect from our community members, just because. Y'all are so great and open and interested in learning and curious. And so it's just one of the things we love best about our community. Now, um, I'm really excited to introduce the speakers for this next chat. Um, first up, we have Dr. Joan Fallon, who is the founder and CEO of Curemark. Dr. Fallon is considered a visionary scientist who has dedicated her life's work to championing the health and well being of children worldwide. Curemark is a biopharmaceutical company focused on the development of novel therapies to treat serious diseases for which there are limited treatment options. The company's pipeline includes a phase three clinical stage research program for autism, as well as programs focused on Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, and addiction. Dr. Fallon holds over 300 pat patents worldwide, has written numerous scholarly articles, and lectured extensively across the globe on pediatric developmental problems. She is a former assistant professor at Yeshiva, Yeshiva University in the Department of Natural Sciences and Mathematics, and she served on the ADA Board of Advisors for the building of the new Yankee Stadium, in addition to testifying before Congress on the matters of business and pet, yeah, patents. I'm so sorry, y'all. I don't know why that word's giving me trouble today. Dr. Fallon is the recipient of numerous awards, including being named one of the top 100 most intriguing entrepreneurs of 2020 by Goldman Sachs. So welcome, Dr. Fallon. We're so happy to have you with us today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Dr. Fallon is going to be joined in conversation with our own amazing Leslie Carstens. 
Leslie recently joined the Power to Fly sales team, having spent the last 15 years selling geeky products to people wearing pocket protectors, where she learned that sliding a pizza under the door is the best way to get meetings. She hails from sunny Southern California, but now resides in Drizzly, Portland, Oregon, where she has worked tirelessly to convince Oregonians that heels are superior to Birkenstocks. I might be willing to fight you on that, Leslie. Uh, she lives with her two teenage offspring and enjoys poetry and weightlifting, though not at the same time. So welcome to Leslie and Dr. Fallon. I cannot wait to hear this conversation. I will turn the floor over to you. Take it away. Thanks, Meg. I'm so excited to be here. And Dr. Fallon, thank you. We're like just so thrilled that you made the time to join us today and talk with the Power to Fly community. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. And please call me Joan. Jo okay, thank right. you. So I was going to ask that question. Yeah. And I, you know, I'd love to get this kicked off by asking about, you know, what what brought you to where you're at today to founding CureMark? So um, I was in a clinical practice um, for 25 years. And in the last sort of stage of that, um, there seemed to be this very high uptick of, in children with autism. At first, this large number of children presented with symptoms that really weren't seen very much before, like lack of eye contact, very delayed speech, et cetera turned out to be this autism sort of, um, you know, people call it epidemic, they've called lots of things, but a very high uptick in autism. And, you know, children with autism uh, are very different from one another. So, you know, the old moniker, you see one child with autism, you've seen one child with autism, um, you know, it's true. Um, and there's a matrix of symptoms and behaviors that sort of make up that diagnosis. But what I noticed in part of what I, what I was looking at was there was something that was more similar child to child and it was what they ate. So what they That's ate was more similar child to child, unlike anything I had seen before. And so when you're in pediatrics and you're seeing all these children, you know, you see patterns, but I had not seen this one before. And it was just, um, parents called it a white diet, a tan diet. But what it was was very high carbohydrates and virtually no protein. And that, that got my curiosity. And when I asked people who were you know, deep in the field, they said, oh, it's a sensory thing. They don't like the texture of protein on their tongue. And I'm thinking to myself, all these other sensory issues are different child to child. Why would this one be the same? So then I started doing blood analysis and urine and stool analysis on these kids to see if there's anything that they had in common. And it turned out that the first nine children I did had this low level of an enzyme that digests protein. And that's what started all of this. Interesting. And I saw that observation. My brother, who was an inventor very young, said to me, you know, I think you should patent that, uh, that whole thing because if you want these children to get help, it needs to have a commercial value. You need to put this out there in a way that people will understand it and that we use it. So I ultimately left practice and started a company. Wow. Um, and uh, I started a company with 1,500 lab tests confirming what I had found and three patents. And so I started in that way. And that was 2007. We've been through clinical trials and um, hope to submit our, our new application for approval next early next year. Oh my gosh, that is so exciting. And you know, talk about something the world really needs right now. Wow. Yeah, it's a global problem. It's way, way more numbers than when I started this. Yeah. So um, I'd love to kind of double click on the products you're talking about. So is it, is it, is it at this point, it sounds like just one product or do you have some other things that you are hoping to bring out after that? Like, you know, where else does the company go? So it's a platform technology, right? It's, a, okay. it's, a, it's an enzyme replacement type technology um, that's, that's tailored for each issue, but, but in each of these issues, there's a protein issue. Uh, involved. And so we have, I, mean, I have over 300 patents globally around the technology and an understanding of that. So the, the, the drugs will be very, will be different from one another, but uh, we hope to go um, to start 
clinical trials uh, later this year or very early next year in schizophrenia and in Parkinson's. Okay, that's fascinating. And I'd love to hear more about like, you know, the, just your take for the, for a non-scientific audience on that gut brain connection. So it's, it's, it's only really just starting to be explored now. Yeah. And so I think that, that um, people have pushed it away. Traditional science has pushed it away for a long time, but now with the microbiome and the understanding of that and what we're doing I think people are much more embracing of the fact that there is a gut-brain connection. Uh, we will probably be the first gut-brain connection drug ever approved. Wow, oh my Where gosh. The initial mechanism of action is in the gut and then it translates to the brain. So I think that it's going to be an area of discovery that goes well beyond what we're doing or even well beyond the microbiome where there are things that actually uh, occur and take place, you know, in that, in that area. So for example, um, while COVID uh, affects the lungs and we have all of those issues, there's a tremendous amount of GI involvement in COVID. Oh, interesting. I haven't and, heard that. This is the first time I've ever heard that. Yeah. And if, well, in Europe, they do wastewater testing to determine where the outbreaks are going to be. Ah, Okay. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty well known. And if you're looking at that, then you know that that's it. And, and the receptors for that particular um, virus are in the gut. They're in all in different parts of the body, uh, but the lungs have a large number, but also the small intestine have a very high number of receptors. So there's way more involvement in the GI tract for, for a lot of things, that's just one of them. And, and indeed, some people only have GI symptoms and um, you can test a GI tract for COVID and sometimes it appears there before it appears in the pharynx when you do the swabs. Okay. Which wow. is why they do the wastewater testing. The wastewater testing is a really big, I mean, some colleges did it and were able to shut down dorms when they saw that it was, it was starting to increase in the wastewater before symptoms showed up before an outbreak happened. Wow. wow. There's a lot of gut brain things I think we're gonna, we're gonna look at in time. And, and so now the platform that CureMark is developing, you mentioned that it will help of course with autism. You mentioned Parkinson's. What are the other range of diseases you think this gut brain connection or at least the platform as, as you're building it could potentially influence? It might be hard to answer, but, you know, so. Well, I think there are a couple of places. Um, I think, for example, eclampsia in pregnancy. So women, you know, suffer from eclampsia and it can be catastrophic, right? Uh, where their organs start to shut down, et cetera. There's no, no one really knows why there's eclampsia and preeclampsia. Uh, we know that um, you start to spill protein in your urine. And you also have, um, uh, you know, high blood pressure. So there, there are there are symptoms that you are you, we know, but why we don't know. And I believe that there's a protein issue there as well, and we have some patent coverage for that, um, et cetera. So That's um, fascinating. Yeah. And what's interesting is that we are an enzyme, right? So the enzyme doesn't go into the bloodstream. So it. It, by definition, an enzyme is a part of a reaction that takes place and it's not consumed by the reaction. So it's utilized and then it's gone, expelled. So in this case, you know, the enzyme is taken orally and then it gets expelled by the, by the system ultimately. Um, and so it's not like it's absorbed to the bloodstream and can be dangerous uh, in, in these areas. We have a lot of great safety in our trials. Oh, that's fascinating. And I'm curious, I'd love to kind of zoom out a little bit. Um, what are the other like disruptive companies that you're seeing in this, in this space targeting, you know, autism or other, you know, neurodiverse issues? So there's not a lot going on in autism. I mean, there's some things that are very early. Uh, some of the more traditional pharma companies have tried to target a receptor with a drug that hasn't seemed to work. 
There's a lot of uh, work going on in looking for a gene, but there doesn't seem to be one gene that causes autism. It seems to be a confluence of them. So there's a lot, there's a lot of issues. And again, I think once we get an approval, it will spur other people on to look for more. So there's not a lot going on in the space that's later stage. Yeah. And there's a question from the audience, which I actually think it dovetails nicely with what you're saying right now, which is, you know, as it relates to this new development, um, do you hope to be surprised by all the uses and applications for it? Or do you think rather it's going to be more of a sales effort to get the medical industry to embrace it and try it? No, I, I think that that the efficacy we saw plus the safety will be its own catalyst for use. And so, for example, we have a uh, indication for ADHD, hyperactivity, individuals with autism, although their hyperactivity is a little different, we were able to reduce hyperactivity in those individuals. So, um, wow. but there are now more non-stimulant drugs out there for ADHD. And those are very large trials, which, um, you know, we're not really ready to do right now and put all of our, our attention to that, but we have multiple indications. Wow, that's fascinating. And then where do you see, and I realize this is going to be very speculative, but where do you see things, say, one to five years from now, you know, maybe in the, maybe in the ideal world, if it goes, you know, if it's as successful as it looks like it will be? So, so I never went into biotech to like think about, you know, sort of having a company making money. That, that wasn't what spurred me on to do this. Yeah. It was, I had something and maybe it can help children. Yeah. So my goal is to get it to children everywhere. So I want to make sure that everyone who needs this gets it, whether they can technically pay for it or not. You know, I think that every child needs to get this drug who needs it. And so that will be sort of the focus for me going forward is to make sure that, you know, it's everywhere. You know, I was a couple of summers ago with the Nigerian, um, health minister. And we were, someone said, oh, she's doing autism. I said, do you have a lot of autism there? He goes, are you kidding me? Of course we do. So there's a wow. lot of autism everywhere. Uh, China, it's about the same now as it is here. Wow. Uh, I was yeah. just going to, yeah, I was, I was just going to ask if, if we see a higher incidence in the U S or if it's, um, you know, and then maybe it, you know, kind of less elsewhere. So, um, I, the highest incidence, I believe that the most recent study shows the highest incidence is in Qatar, in the Middle East. And uh, I was there just before the pandemic came. Um, actually, it started to come there when I was there March, um, one year March ago. And, um, and they are very aggressive in doing whatever they can do to, uh, to uh, look at the children and help them. Um, their schools, their behavioral therapies. Um, South Korea has a high, high incidence. Um, I think that I, I've traveled the globe looking at, you know, places where they treat the children. How do they do what they do? Um, and so there's a need for this. And so I yeah. think that uh, being able to get it to them will be uh, an important part of what I do going forward. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And uh, I have some, uh, I have an update that says you have a book coming out in the fall, which I'd love to hear about. Yes. So I do. Um, it's called Goodbye Status Quo, Reimagining the Landscape of Innovation. And um, it's a compilation of sort of vignettes of things that I've experienced throughout this process, things I've learned about myself and things that people can apply to their, to their lives, whether that's in an entrepreneurial way or in their office setting, um, things where change is really important. And lots of people are fearful of change. And so the book is sort of divided into three sections, which is um, you know, the landscape of change, the impediments to change, and then how do you effectuate change? 
Well, I am an Audible junkie, so hopefully it will be on Audible soon I'm sure because, it will be. because then I can consume it, <laughs> just yes. being purely selfish. Yes. Um, and it was, so what would your advice be to parents? If we, you know, I assume we've got some number of people in the audience with kids who have autism. Right. You know, uh, don't give up on them. You know, I think it's a very hard road because you've got children without treatment Right. There's no there's no standard of care for this condition. Yeah. And so parents are very hopeful. But I think giving up is not if if you cannot give up, don't give up. Just keep fighting for your child, advocating constantly for the right, the right environment for their education, for the right environment at home, whatever you can do. Um, It's hard because, you know, 50 percent of incomes are lost in families that have uh, an autistic child. Um, There's all this uncertainty, there's mental health issues, there's all kinds of things. Because in some cases, it's the same thing over and over again. That's what changes very hard for those children. Yeah, yeah. And so- Well, it's hard, you know, it's hard on the siblings too, even if if they're neurotypical. Right, Right. yeah. And some parents blame themselves. It's not about, you can't blame yourself. This is not about you causing autism. It's about the condition being there. Yeah. Uh, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, okay. Someone is asking about, uh, what about adults with um, who are on the spectrum? So we didn't test what we have uh, on adults, so I can't really answer that. Um, but I, um, I, I suspect that we will do trials on older, um, uh, on adults. We have a extension study that we've done. So the kids kind of have started sort of somewhere in that three to eight range. Some of them are now like 17. They've been on this for a long time. Oh my gosh. Wow. And so, um, so we see changes in them as well. So um, we hope that maybe there's something that we can do for adults, but I, I'm not certain of where we are with that. That's fair. That's fair. And is that, I thought it was interesting when you said you have kids who've been on it for, it sounds like maybe close to a decade. Is that a normal length of a clinical no. trial? Yeah. No. yeah. no, it's not at all. FDA just kind of looks at us and uh, because the um, generally the, the, the conditions of a clinical trial are too stringent for yeah. people to follow. Like you have to come back X amount of time, you know, like every three months or every two months or whatever it is at the time. Uh, but we had a child, for example, that came from the Netherlands who had very severe autism. So the only way they could get into the trial was to come and literally establish residency in the US and stay here for that period of time before and after the the actual double blind clinical trial. And then uh, when it became a stretched out time where they didn't have to come back every two weeks or something, they would go back to the Netherlands and then fly back every month or every three months we had to get them a visa, um, help them apply for that. But the changes were for them very profound. Now, it, it's the kind of thing where if a child starts here, they end up here. If they start here, they end up here, right? So this child had very severe autism, profound autism. He didn't respond to any kind of verbal commands. He had no eye contact, no, no touching. Um, and he would run out of the house. So they had to put locks way up on the top of the doors in order to keep him from running. And, um, and he was nonverbal. And for him, he was still nonverbal, but he responded to commands. Wow. So he wasn't going to dart out in the street, right? And he would hug his parents. Oh and gosh. he did things. He could go out to dinner with them. Those are big things. Huge. for a family right so they would come from the fly from the netherlands you know during those periods of time so it, it was very um parents are motivated something is working they're motivated to, to keep them in yeah oh my gosh yeah <laughs> i would be there's yeah. another question about it's kind of a two-part question about whether you have any personal or close experience with someone uh who is autistic um you know, that's the first part of the question. Okay. So the answer is no, I do not. Interesting. I just okay. saw these children in my practice. Day in, day out. Um, mm. I mean, some of them still 
I mean, some of them reach out to me still. Um, you know, kids that I diagnosed when they were, you know, toddlers. Um, so, but I didn't have anyone um, in my family or, or specific to autism. So I was motivated by the need for children to have something to help them. Yeah, a massive, massively growing number of children. Um, the other question is, um, do you think having a personal connection to an issue like this uh, makes it better or worse for a medical researcher? So that's a really, really good question, okay? Because in some ways, it's very advantageous. Um, and I look at that two ways. One is that there's a tremendous motivation. And the other is that you have some insights into the disease, whatever that is, okay? On the other hand, right, it, that, those insights may cloud your judgment yeah. It could be helpful, but they could also cloud the direction of your research. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying what you find, but just the direction of it. So I think that um, it's, it's both good and, and not. But I do think that the things that you see, like when these parents came to me and said, my child eats a white diet or a tan diet. You know, their physicians weren't saying that to me. The parents were saying that to me because they saw the patterns. And I think it's very important to listen to that because it's, it's very much present. That's a great question, whoever asked that question. Yeah, yeah, I like that one too. And what would your advice be to, you know, the Power to Fly community or people who care about this issue? You know, are there things we can do to, you know, somehow double click or add emphasis to, you know, whoever the governing bodies are or, you know, like, like help people understand, like, we think this is worth additional research and science funding. I think one of the things that tech can do is become a major employer of these individuals who, who can be employed. So I do a lot of lecturing to companies about the talents that these individuals have. So individuals often have talents, really important talents, and um, so like, for example, UBS uh, out of um, Tennessee, out of uh, Nashville, they're like whole cybersecurity department are individuals with autism. Get out of here. No, because they can see patterns in check writing. They can, they can find uh, mistakes in code. SAP wow. is a huge employer, EY. So, you know, finding uh, the talent and then applying them in terms of employment is really something that tech could really do um, more than it does. And I think there's probably a significant number of people on the spectrum in tech already. Oh, I'm but sure. I, yeah. I'm talking about some of the more, the more severe individuals who, whose talents are going to waste. Yeah. Um, and how, like, like if you were a tech employer and you wanted to learn more about like, okay, what are the talents? You know, what, you know, what is the best way to employ people on the spectrum? Like, is there some place you can go to learn about it? Yeah, there, there are a couple. So I would look at the SAP website as well as EY because they're, they're very um, uh, heavily into employing individuals uh, on the spectrum. Um, there are a couple of other groups. I'll have to get you the, the, um, um, one called the Precisionists, and they are a group that helps prepare individuals on the spectrum to uh, the workplace and matches them. So that's one group that does that. So there are, there are a lot of groups that actually match tech companies with individuals with autism. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I'm so glad. Uh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Okay. Anything else you think the audience um, should know that I didn't ask about? I just think that, you know, when I started this, I took a huge risk, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And I think risk sometimes keeps people from doing things they want to do. And I think that if you are willing to manage that risk and understand what that's about, then you could probably do anything you want to do if you understand it and, and manage it. But both, I think I said before, my, both my brother and I have been entrepreneurs at different parts of our lives. 
uh, him much earlier, I'm much later. And people said, well, how is it that the two of you could do that? And I didn't ever think about the question, but I, both my parents were underwriters. My mother was an actuary. So oh, wow. they learned that risk is just something you manage. It's not something to be afraid of. It's just some, everything's insurable. Like there was all, all of that kind of thing. So I think that understanding your environment and what the risks are, I think is important, but not to be afraid of them. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Well, this has been so fascinating and I will be checking out your book, which like I said, I hope is on Audible soon. It, it's, it's coming out not late October. So uh, hopefully it'll be there. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll make a note to myself Thank and you. I'm going to check out the SAP and EY websites. Great. Thank you so much. This Thank you so much. It's an yeah, honor. Th thanks for the work you do in the world. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you so much to both of you ladies. That was an absolutely amazing conversation. Um, I'm so, so happy I got to, to sit in on it. Um, and I can't wait to read your book. So thank you so much for letting us know about that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, as we roll into the next chat, I just want to flag for all of you that if you are looking to earn SHRM credits um, for continuing education um, uh, from attending today's talks, you're going to look at the code that's in the upper left-hand corner of the slide in front of you. Um, that's going to be the code you'll need to redeem those credits. Um, now, as we're bringing up our next, our next speakers, I'm really happy to say hi and welcome to anyone who might just now be joining us. My name is Meg Alexander. I'm part of Power to Fly's virtual hosting team, and I'm so happy to be here with you for day two of the um, July mini summit. This is part of Power to Fly's virtual, or sorry, Diversity Reboot 2021 virtual summit series. Um, the focus for July is about tech for social impact, and I hope that you all are just as excited as we are to continue these amazing conversations that we've been having for the last day and a half. Um, throughout this upcoming chat, if you have any questions um, or comments that you'd like to, um, to send to the speakers, please, please feel free to do so. You can put those into the, um, the group chat. It's on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and uh, myself, as well as um, some of my colleagues are gonna be in that chat as well. So if you have any kind of technical issues, please feel free to tag us, you know, DM us if you have a question and hopefully we'll be able to help you. Um, again, if you're looking to earn SHRM credits from today's uh, sessions, you're gonna look at that code that's in the upper left-hand corner of the slide in front of you. And I'm gonna briefly refer you to the code of conduct. I'll be sharing that into the group chat in just a moment. It's intended to make sure that this um, experience, as well as all of our virtual events, are positive for everyone involved. So just make sure that as you are connecting with the speakers and interacting with um, some of the really great, um, you know, speaker, or sorry, some of the really great uh, community members that we have on these chats, um, just make sure that you're leading from a place of kindness and respect. Now, I'm really excited to introduce you to our upcoming speakers. Now, as we get them all joined in, I just want to make sure we don't get ahead of ourselves here. So first up, I am going, I'm really excited to introduce you to, um, let's see, Samantha Fennell. Um, Samantha is the founder of Athari Collective, a new minority-owned New York-based social impact firm with equity at the core of its mission. Um, the firm works with brands and companies to drive positive business outcomes, both internally and externally. It integrates diverse human capital into organizations and builds programming and social impact partnerships aligned with corporate social purpose. Uh, Samantha is proud to call innovative companies in the cryptocurrency space, as well as Silicon Valley startups, um, as her current client partners. Over the past 20 plus years, Samantha has held, uh, um, sorry, has held leadership positions at both major media companies and startup ventures, from the corporate enterprises of publishing giants like Condé Nast, Time Inc., and Huffington Post, to European advertising agencies overseeing global offices. She has been a trusted advisor and business growth driver to both Fortune 500 companies and pioneering startups throughout her career. So welcome, Samantha. We're so happy to have you join us today. Joining her in conversation will be Shannon Morales, who is the founder and CEO of Trabaja. Um, Shannon is a proud Afro-Latina mother of three and first-generation graduate. She started working in diversity recruiting after experiencing unconscious bias in the workplace and set out to find equitable employers. In 2020, Shannon pivoted the business model to be a community-driven talent marketplace dedicated to advancing marginalized groups in tech and startups. 
She now has 2,400 active member Slack channel and over 300, or sorry, 3,000 newsletter subscribers. Her latest accomplishments include being a founder in residence at Bubble. She was awarded Culture Builder of the Year by Technically Media and was the winner of the LTX Best Pitch Competition. So welcome, Shannon. They will be um, in conversation with Hunter Canning. Hunter is a performer, photographer, and theatrical producer. He has acted on Broadway, TV shows, and various voiceover projects, as well as assisting us in previous summits. Hunter is one of the producers of Mondays in the Club, which is a diverse group of traveling artists, musicians, and singers who perform free shows that foster community and bring folks of all walks of life together. I'm super excited for this conversation, so I'm going to turn the stage over to you. Take it away. Thank you so much, Meg, for that wonderful introduction. And um, I'm so excited to be here with uh, Samantha and Shannon. Thank you both for being here at Power to Fly Summit. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah. Uh, Samantha, I think you're muted, so just so you know, um, I want to be able to hear you. <laughs> great. There, you go. Oh, there we go. Ah, fantastic. Great, great. So, um, how about, uh, you know, uh, Samantha, we'll start with you and then Shannon, but I would love to hear both of you uh, just tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, your career journeys and what brought you to this place. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I'd say my career journey has been uh, not particularly linear, if you will. I spent probably the last 20, 25 years um, really being in the client solutions business, I like to say. So I started out in magazine publishing. Uh, I started out at Vibe Magazine and Rolling Stone, and then went on to an eight year stint at Condé Nast, which is the publisher of everything from Architectural Digest to Vanity Fair to GQ and to Vogue, which I served not once but twice. Uh, then rose to advertising director of Vogue, which I believe was the first time an African-American woman had ever held that position. And then I went on to Elle Magazine as associate publisher, uh, similar dubious distinction, if you will. Um, and then, you know, had a, a, a little bit of a corporate break, if you will, and went to work on the Obama-Biden campaign in 2008 as a volunteer fundraiser and organizer in the battleground state of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, then when I had to come back to work and make a living, I had uh, some great stints in places such as Time Inc. and Huffington Post, all in leadership positions. And then I went on to the other side. I went to the agency side and helped to run two global uh, agencies uh, that are European based. So, you know, not exactly a linear path, but I think, you know, the, the through line uh, in my career has always been helping brands and businesses figure out the best ways to connect with their consumers and really figuring out those, those challenges. Um, and, you know, if I look at my 20 year career, the challenges have really evolved. Um, and so what one needs, what a brand needs to do to connect with a consumer is really much more multifaceted. And so, as we know, uh, the consumer and the workforce is, are both really looking to support companies that have more than their bottom line uh, as their number one priority. So, you know, it's not only about um, um, stakeholders that are contributing directly to the bottom line. It's also really about what is that company doing to support the community, to support their employees, to support all the people that are in the, in the supply chain. Um, and ultimately how they can you know, help and, and hopefully support the communities that they do business in. So that's really how I came to launch Athari Collective uh, to really help brands and businesses figure out what I think are the most important problems of our time, which are social issues that revolve around equity and inclusion. Wow. Yeah, I, I really do respond to it. That is not a linear path to where you are, but what an <laughs> immense amount of experience that you have to bring to what you want to do. That's really incredible. Thanks. And uh, Shannon, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your journey as to uh, how you are where you are right now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I absolutely love your story, Samantha. Really inspiring. Um, I started my career in finance, and so I worked in financial planning and analytics for life science and pharmaceutical companies. If anyone listening out there is from New Jersey, then you know what I mean when I say that New Jersey is like the pharmaceutical mecca of the country. 
um, if not the globe, there's so many different pharma, you know, organizations within just one state. And so for me, being a single mom with three daughters, I was just looking for financial security, you know, and job security. And for at the time when I was graduating college, finance was really big. And then pharma was really big in Jersey. Um, however, you know, obviously in 2008, when all of the banks um, started to go bankrupt and the financial industry wasn't as, you know, attractive anymore, I had to really think about where I was going to, you know, how I was going to transition. And to take that a step further, um, I was really the only person of color within a lot of the finance departments at the organizations that I worked with. And I just felt like I didn't belong. Um, I, you know, ran into a lot of unconscious bias in the workplace, more specifically in the departments as well, where I wasn't getting advancement opportunities. Um, one year, my boss actually told me that I falsified information on my performance review and said that I didn't do what I said, I, you know, that I actually did in the performance review. And I was just so blown away because obviously I wasn't lying. Um, I actually video recorded all my sessions and stuff, but who needs to, you know, have to prove that you, you did what you said you were going to do. You know, I just felt um, completely, you know, put um, in a situation that I don't think a lot of professionals would have been put in. And so I, you know, needless to say, I quit, but I wanted to transition into a different type of industry. And so I went for my MBA um, and I worked at Adobe in Silicon Valley for three months. I absolutely love the te technology and innovation space. Everyone, you know, in Silicon Valley was working in tech, but they also had their own business and they were, you know, taking a, a doing a stint in entrepreneurship. And I wanted to do that on the East Coast, you know, California is expensive. So I wanted to stay on the East Coast to be able to sustain living. Um, and so I found a piece of Silicon Valley in Philadelphia, and they really have this really great diverse tech and startup ecosystem. And I wanted to be, you know, immersed in that scene. And so I decided to transition, start to work in tech. My first job in transitioning was as an innovation manager, but I quickly realized that I faced the same type of issues in finance that I faced within this organization. And it's just the leadership, it's the type of companies that I was working for. And so I said, I can do this on my own, I can find my own path. And that was by creating my own business, which was then Echo Me Forward in 2017. Um, I pivoted in 2020 after realizing that creating a scalable marketplace was a better situation than, you know, um, just being a side, having a side hustle and, you know, just doing things as a recruiter or as a contractor. I really wanted to kind of blow it out the water and have this scalable business um, that I could see thriving for years and years to come. So that is where I am today. Amazing. Amazing. And can you tell us, uh, Shannon, um, a bit about Trabaja and what that, why you made it, what, um, and what, what it is, what is it, what is it about? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so when I started my very first business in 2017 called Echo Me Forward, um, it was really just to connect professionals like myself to better career opportunities. I didn't know what that looked like. I just knew all my friends said I was really good with <laughs> career coaching and helping guide them, whether it was salary negotiations or anything like that. And so that's where I started. Um, but I pivoted because during the pandemic, I wanted to launch an app that gamified social distancing, um, got a lot of traction, a lot of awards, but what ended up happening was I, I'm not a non-technical founder. And so I was basically trying to look for someone who I could trust to build the technical side of the app. And I very quickly realized that if I didn't have the expertise, you know, in-house that a lot of professionals were trying to take advantage of the fact that I didn't know the technology and they were charging me outlandish prices for an MVP and a prototype, $50,000, $100,000, just to build something um, that I needed to validate in the market. And I pivoted Echo Me Forward into Trabaja, where it's this community of startups, but also tech talent that can help, you know, um, drive these innovations forward. And the goal is that not only will tech talent be able to, 
you know, get their foot in the door by working with these tech startups and gaining that experience firsthand. But the tech startups will also be able to build this tribe or community of professionals that are mission aligned with their brands and also, you know, want to continue to work with them as they grow. So we built this talent marketplace and community for underrepresented tech and startup enthusiasts. Um, and yeah, we're, we're we have a strong social impact, but we're not solely um, we're not solely a social impact venture. But we definitely have a very strong social impact, you know, tied to our mission. Mm -hmm. Wow, incredible, Shannon and Samantha. So, Shannon, it sounds like you're working with the people on the ground floor with um, in these businesses. And Shannon, uh, excuse me, and Samantha, you're working with the businesses, right? And you can um, tell me a little bit about what Athari uh, Collective does. Sure, sure, exactly. You know, we were <clears throat> really founded on the premise that, um, you know, modern brands and businesses today that want to be relevant and want to, frankly, survive uh, need to take a strong stand on social issues, both internally and externally, and really use their corporate social power for good. So, you know, what does that look like? Um, we are working with companies both internally and externally. Internally really translates to uh, professional recruitment, working to really help diversify their teams, their management teams, their executive teams, but also creating fellowships so that people who otherwise wouldn't have access to certain industries, particularly in tech, fintech, um, you know, Silicon Valley type of companies, uh, give them the opportunity from the ground floor to gain mentorship, experience, you know, whether that translates into a full-time job after the fellowship or not. They now have something on their resume that will speak volumes and do wonders for their career. Um, externally, you know, we are working on some really great initiatives, uh, partnering with nonprofits and bringing that public-private partnership together, which is so strong and powerful. It gives brands immediate credibility uh, and also supports folks that are doing the hard work each and every day, those nonprofits. Um, and most recently, we're really proud because we broke a major barrier in the fintech space. Uh, we were recently working on an assignment to look for a chief marketing officer for a fintech company. Give a shout out to CoinMover. Um, and as you know, tech is not so strong when it comes to female executives. I think right now the number of women in fintech um, are, is like 19%, uh, the women that are, excuse me, in um, leadership positions. So if you look at the numbers for women of color, it's infinitesimally small in the single digits. So we went out and found the most qualified person for the position who happened to be uh, a Middle Eastern woman who lives in Ohio, because now I think we've learned from the pandemic that you, you can absolutely get great talent if you look remotely. Um, and like I said, she just happens to be Middle Eastern and she is their first ever CMO. And we did that in less than two months. So a lot of what we hear is, you know, there's a dearth of talent or an inability, inability to find uh, candidates of color. Uh, and it's just not true. You just have to have focus and commitment. And we're really proud of what we were able to do with CoinMover and she starts next week. Wow, congratulations to you and to her. Yeah, she's fantastic. I have all the faith in the world that uh, she's gonna do great. Yeah, great. Uh, I just want to note that we are already getting questions from you in the audience, which is fantastic. Please keep those coming as things are coming up. Um, post away, and we're going to get to those in the last 10 minutes. So as you're hearing things that spark your interest, we'll circle back to your questions. So keep them coming. That's fantastic. Um, in both of um, both of your shares right now and in, in, what, in your past and currently what's going on, I heard a word come up both times, several times, which was firsts, right? The first person um, in your position, the first person now being hired in this position. So um, can you talk about um, a little bit for being that experience for you of being the first person, whatever that was for you, or the only person in the room perhaps? And how did you embrace your cultural identity while working in these industries that were at the time and maybe still currently not traditionally um, diverse at all. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. 
I can say that I definitely am the first at a lot of things, not only in my family, but also when I'm working in different um, organizations and things like that, you quickly realize that some places, you know, who you are is going to be accepted. And there's other places where it may not be so easily accepted. And those are the places that you want to stay away from. I think what's great that came out of the pandemic is that more and more job boards are focused on companies that are building equitable workplaces. So Trabaja has an amazing job board that focuses on companies that are vetted and looking for diverse candidates. Um, I wish I had something like that when I was going through, you know, my career journey, just a place where I felt like I belonged and there was psychological safety and, you know, I could wear my hair curly and I can, you know, be who I want to be and it feels good because we're being our authentic selves. And when we're all, we're our authentic selves, we can actually like show up and produce great work because we don't have to, you know, be, try to be somebody else in addition to trying to do work, you know, within an organization. Um, but now the way that I deal with it is very different because people find me to be their rock um, as well as, you know, their guiding light and inspiration. And so I have to show up every day as Shannon, <laughs> you know, I very often have to combat my own imposter syndrome as I reach these different milestones as an entrepreneur. Right now we're raising, you know, capital. And I, if you talked to me three years ago, did I think that I was going to, you know, go through investor funding and be a startup that was raising capital and all these different things? Absolutely not. I was very happy having a six figure income and just being a solo founder and just having this, you know, this great, you know, comfortable side hustle or, you know, small business. But I realized that it was the mindset that I was conditioned to have where, you know, I can only accomplish but so much because I'm a woman of color. I can't have a multi-million dollar business and eventually incorporate it or exit with a, you know, million to million of dollar profit at the end of the day. Um, but I quickly realized that if I show up and I represent and give everything that I have, that other people will want to follow in my footsteps and I become that representation that I want to see in the workplace and as an entrepreneur. And so today I just want to be the best version of me that I can be. And that will hopefully in turn, um, you know, inspire others, not only within the Trabaja community, but also professionals that see me whenever I speak or show up somewhere else. Well, clearly it's working. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, truly inspiring. Samantha? Yeah, you know, I'm kind of dovetailing off of something that, that Shannon said. Um, you know, for me, I grew up in Manhattan on the Upper West Side in a genuinely multicultural community. Um, and my neighbors across the hall were Puerto Rican. My best friend was half Black and half Italian. Uh, you know, I've been to my fair share of uh, bar and bat mitzvahs. So, you know, being, I, one of the few or the only one, uh, whether it be in school or in the workplace, uh, is not unfamiliar terrain for me. Um, that said, uh, you know, for me, it's really more about being culturally welcomed uh, than, than focused on, you know, uh, cultural alignment with everybody around me. So I have definitely been in, in environments, professional environments where it was truly, I felt truly embraced uh, for all of myself. And then I've been in other professional environments uh, where I was absolutely made to feel like the other. And I think, you know, 20 years ago versus today, um, I would have had a much different approach. But I think now, you know, my advice to, to any young person either getting into in different industries or trying to rise up within their current companies uh, is to really do the research, um, really understand from all the different aspects that we now can look at, you know, what the corporate culture is. And there will, to Shannon's point, there will be environments where you really don't wanna be. And so, you know, it is now, I think uh, the employees and consumers both have incredible power. I think, you know, both segments have really come into their power. Um, companies need great employees. And I think the choice is, is ours to really choose who supports you. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, it's amazing. This conversation, as predicted, we were going to say, is flying by. We're already coming close uh, to our time. So I'm going to fire off some questions, uh, Shannon, because uh, I would love to hear more about the uh, – uh, Diversitech Summit that um, y'all host. So I'm going to fire off some questions. You can just kind of cherry pick what you want to pick here. Okay. So uh, can you possibly, you know, talk about how in your, uh, in the Trabaja community is helping Black and Latinx, uh, Latinx uh, people navigate their entry into the tech startup careers and, or what support does Trabaja, uh, Tra Trabaja excuse me, provide to make the transition into tech less overwhelming for uh, the folks you're supporting? Yeah, absolutely. I think what becomes overwhelming is when you start to do a Google search and you kind of go into this like rabbit hole of like information and you don't know what's for you and what's not for you. What Trabaja does a really great job is tailoring that information specifically for marginalized groups and those who have been traditionally under supported in the tech space. Um, we provide you the information you need to be successful in your new career and your transition. And we also have a support system already built um, specifically with your needs in mind. And then lastly, we have the vetted tech startups as well as forward thinking companies who are already committed to bringing on candidates from diverse backgrounds and want to see them succeed by having um, foundational uh, programs already in place. So we never engage with a company that is in the beginning stages of being diverse, equitable, and inclusive. We prefer to engage with them after they've already done some type of work behind that and have long-term strategy to keeping that going. Um, so that's how we provide support. And in terms of diversity tech, the whole launch of diversity tech was centered around how could we drive more impact sooner for the companies and clients that we work with. And so we decided to create these really great hiring events around um, diversity and tech, you know, just as, it, as the name says. And we actually, just today, which I'm really excited about, we have um, a diversity tech exclusive with Comcast where we're helping them hire across seven of their departments, um, 300 roles. And so it's across products, software engineering, web, digital marketing, social media. So it's not just focused on the technical piece. It's not just programming and coding. It's transitioning into the industry. So if you have a marketing background, digital content, sales, how can you leverage those transferable skills to get you into an industry that's going to have longevity? Yeah, that's really, really helpful. Um, Samantha, I want to read a quote from uh, something that you said that's listed on your website. You said, I dream of a future where my personal achievements are unremarkable for a person of color and today's exceptions become the cultural norm, but it's going to take more than dreaming. Now, can you tell me what's it going to take and what can we do on an individual capacity and as a society to make that future not just become a dream, but a reality? Sure, sure. I think, you know, it, it really comes down to dispelling two myths, which I think a lot of corporate America has embraced. It's like the myth of, of exceptionalism and then the myth of scarcity. So the myth of ex uh, exceptionalism basically says that, you know, if you are a person of color who is performing at or above the level of a white counterpart, that you are essentially a unicorn and that they have found the only one there is. And so they therefore, there's no need to look further. And we know that this is not true, um, which really feeds also into the myth of scarcity, which is, okay, maybe there, there are a few other, you know, exceptional people of color that we might want to hire or include in our company, but we don't know where to find them. We, they're impossible to search for. And, you know, is it really worth the trouble? We apply, we put an application out, and they don't show up to apply. So, you know, both of these, of course, are lazy, are incorrect. And I think from a systemic standpoint are truly at the root of most of the problems that we see in corporate America when it comes to hiring. So, you know, I think, what do we do about that? I think from a consumer standpoint, um, if, if diversity, equity, inclusion is important to you as a social mission, uh, you know, the onus is on you to be aware of the companies that have strong DEI initiatives or social impact strategies. Uh, if you're an employee, 
you know, the onus is on you to investigate what these companies are truly all about and what they're doing. And also, frankly, give them uh, a little runway to understand if they have implemented programs over the years that are sustained. Because as we know from, uh, from last year, uh, a lot of brands came in hot and heavy with plans and initiatives. And one year later, uh, you know, the, the numbers are, are not so good as far as uh, who's dropped out, what's really been achieved. Um, and then I think thirdly, you know, the employers uh, really have to take responsibility to get a little outside of their comfort zone and not rely so much on their usual methods, their usual Rolodex, their friends, you know, the, the small circle that they normally fish in for candidates. And so I think with, you know, if we all did those three things uh, in a sustained way, I think that would be uh, a way to realize my dream. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, we're already out of time, which is wild. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't get to the questions from the audience for some really good ones. But uh, with these last couple of minutes, I'd love to hear from Samantha and Shannon. How can we connect with you? How can our audience connect with you? What can they do? Where should they go? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, I, <laughs> so I'll go, I'll just really quickly wrap up. Um, so I'm Shannon Morales on LinkedIn. You could find me as, you know, Trabaja CEO and founder. You can also follow Trabaja on LinkedIn and all of our socials, Instagram. We're on Facebook, um, Twitter. And then our uh, website is trabaja.co. So T-R-I-B-A-J-A.co. And we have a few social summer networking events happening in real life all across the country. So if you want to be a part of that, just join our Trabaja channel, our Slack channel, as well as our community. And I look forward to seeing you in real life or virtually. Thanks, Shannon. And Samantha? Sure. Um, I, I can be reached at uh, Samantha at atharicollective.com. That's my email. Uh, findable also on LinkedIn and Instagram is athari underscore, underscore collective. Uh, and we would be really happy to hear from, uh, you know, both talent and clients, of course, who are interested in doing this work. Uh, we are run as a collective. So always looking forward to talking to people of like minds uh, from all sorts of talent areas and please be in touch. Great. Thank you, Samantha and Shannon. Have a wonderful day and thank you for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Great to meet you, Shannon. <laughs> that was absolutely amazing. Thank you, Hunter, as well as Samantha and Shannon. That was really, really great. And um, you're right, a lot of amazing questions. Um, all right. So if you are looking to earn SHRM credits from this chat or any of the others we're doing today, Take a look at the code that's in the upper left-hand corner of the slide in front of you. That's gonna be the code you'll need to redeem continuing education credits if you are part of the Society of Human Resource Managers. Um, if you are not, don't sweat it. You don't need to worry about the codes at all. Now, as we move on into our next session, I want to say hi and welcome to anybody who might just now be joining us. My name is Meg Alexander. I'm part of Power to Fly's virtual hosting team. And I am so excited that you are here with us for day two of our Diversity Reboot 2021 Virtual Summit Series. July's focus is tech for social impact and these conversations that we've been having for the last two days have been amazing. So I'm really excited to continue them um, with this next session. Before we jump in, I wanna say that if you have questions um, for this, um, this speaker on this next session or you know, comments or anything like that, please, 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 we wanna hear them. Feel free to throw them into the group chat. It's on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and I'll be in there as well as a couple of my colleagues. Let's see, looks like Lauren Haggerty's in there as well. So if you have any kind of tech issues, please feel free to tag us um, either in the group chat or you can send us a DM. We're happy to try and help you out with whatever problems you're having. Um, now, if you are looking to earn SHRM credits from this conversation, again, please refer to the code that's in the upper left-hand corner of the slide in front of you. And I'm super excited to share with you the code of conduct as well. I know it's pretty much old hat for everybody, but it mostly just asks that you proceed from a place of kindness and respect while we, um, you know, while you interact with your community members or connect with the speakers and panelists for today's session, as well as for all of our virtual events. Um, now, I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, Eric Lee is an undergraduate at Harvard studying computer science and economics. As a second generation immigrant from parents of parents from rural China, he found his passion for social impact at a young age as he better understood how systemic inequalities severely disadvantage marginalized people across the world. 
combined with his Gen Z upbringing where he's seen how technology has changed the way people live and operate, Eric wants to use technology to catalyze positive change. He leads Harvard's Computer, Sci sorry, Computer Society Tech for Social Good, T4SG, which is a student-run social impact tech group with the mission to empower student leaders to leverage technology to tackle the world's big problems. T4SG's flagship program is their technical consulting, where they host semester-long collaborations with nonprofits, government agencies, and social enterprises. Separate from his work on campus, Eric has taken a leave of absence this past year to pursue social impact tech in industry, working at the Ag Tech International Development Nonprofit, Precision Development, and across environmental projects at the Social Enterprise Incubator X. Longer term, Eric is interested in social entrepreneurship in the sustainable development space. So welcome, Eric. We're so happy to have you. Eric's going to be joining conversation with our own amazing Sanmaya Mohanty, who is our virtual summit assistant at Power of Fly and master of the conversational interview. So please feel free to take it away, Sanmaya. Yeah. Thanks for that introduction, Meg. Hi, Eric. How are you? Glad to have you speaking with us at the Tech for Social Impact Summit. Hey, Sam, May, I'm, I'm doing well. Yeah, I just wanted to just say thank you for, you know, this opportunity to speak here. And Meg, thank you so much for the intro introduction. Um, it's uh, really excited for this. Absolutely. So uh, can we start the session by having you tell us a bit more about yourself and your career journey so far? Definitely. Yeah. So I, I think the, the story really starts with, with my parents. Um, I think as, as Meg had mentioned, you know, my parents grew up in, in rural China. Um, this sort of in poverty, my mom, you know, she walked miles to school every day and she uh, you know, it, it was always a question as to where the sort of the next meal would come from. Um, in contrast to, I think, you know, my personal background, I grew up in suburban Houston. I was fortunate enough and, and privileged enough to always know that I, my next meal would be there when I came home. You know, I had really loving and amazing parents who were always there for me. Um, and I think this sort of, you know, contrast, uh, you know, helped me understand uh, that you know, I have this immense privilege. I, I, I have this immense privilege that allows me to, you know, not have to worry about um, some of these problems that, you know, millions, billions of people across the world yeah. do. Um, and sort of some of my, you know, concerns when I was young about, okay, you know, I, I don't know, what, what am I going to eat for lunch? Or, you know, what, how, how can I solve mm -hmm. this math problem? Aren't necessarily the challenges that, uh, you know, the world is facing. Um, and I, I think with this sort of, you know, privilege, I, I think that really, um, really led me to understand that, you know, I, I ought to sort of do good rather than contribute to, you know, systems that created this sort of inequality around the world. Um, so with that said, you know, when I was younger, sort of uh, my sister and I, we, we started with a lot of community service, you know, throughout um, elementary and middle school, we did a lot of disaster relief, some, um, uh, you know, some digital literacy work. Um, and that was the sort of frame I came into Harvard with as, you know, as um, a computer science concentrator or a computer science major, I really wanted to figure out, okay, you know, I know I have this passion for technology and I wanted to apply that to, uh, you know, the positive good. Um, so with that said, you know, when, uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, I think it, you know, just personally emphasized to me how these huge systems like, you know, the global healthcare system mm -hmm. are, you know, in, you know, you, it may seem like this, this massive, like, uh, you know, operating, uh, like institution that, you know, can't go down, but it's like, there are tons of holes within it. And, and these sort of massive Absolutely. systems are like extremely vulnerable. Um, totally. And, you know, and, and throughout the pandemic, especially, you know, for me, I was, I was fortunate enough to have, you know, more time in that process. I realized that, you know, if, if I wanted to start this process of doing good, and if I really wanted to, uh, you know, commit my life or my career to, you know, social impact, I, I can't just start later on. You know, there, there's huge problems that sort of need to be tackled now. And it, I can't just wait until, you know, I've graduated, wait until I've gotten more experience or wait until um, some other yeah. thing happens that sort of gives me that. I, I should go ahead and get started. Um, and with that said, you know, that was sort of the onus behind launching Harvard Computer Society Tech for Social Good. Um, you know, that at Harvard at, at that time, there had been no space for students interested in this intersection of tech for so, tech and social yeah. impact. Um, and with the support of some really great people and, and with the support of Harvard Computer Society, our parent organization, uh, we launched Tech for Social Good and, uh, you know, have it's been able to grow with some really incredible and amazing people in it. Yeah, I mean, so your so story is so inspiring, right? right? I mean, there are things that we take for granted, right? I mean, that's not available to billions of people. I totally connect with you with that. And yeah, the thing that you mentioned about, you know, our healthcare ecosystem, it looks so big on the outside, but you know, when the situation arises, it just crumbles like uh, dominoes. So yeah, I mean, so 
people like you are taking the initiative and that's great. So we'd love to know more about, you know, uh, Harvard Tech for Social Good. So as you said, you know, uh, so Harvard is always known for its academic rigor, right? So how was it perceived amongst your peers? How was it per perceived about amongst other people? Like how, I mean, other people who are maybe more career driven. So how, how did it, uh, how did it totally unfold? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, and I think Tech for Social Good is, is unique in the sense that um, from the get-go, it was catered to really be accessible and interesting to all. Um, for some context, uh, Harvard's computer science department is very is very theoretical. You know, focuses a lot a bit a lot about math, a lot about you know theory, a lot about proof stuff like that. That sort of provides students this opportunity to you know understand okay, what's the you know what's driving the I guess sub layers of computer science, but less about the actual, okay, let's be coding like on the ground, you know, maybe building products. Um, so that was sort of uh, also one of the onuses behind uh, the development of the organization. You know, there's uh, Tech for Social Good is one of the only ways to build tangible technical skills on campus. Um, and what that means is that even for folks that, you know, are less passionate or not as passionate about social impact tech or, you, you know, may not have, you um, have that drive within them, um, they can still learn and use their work and talent and skills for, for positive impact. Um, furthermore, you know, um, uh, Tech for Social Good, our, uh, one of our core tenants is that we work with and interact with real clients. So we work with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, NGOs, uh, philanthropic organizations, um, government agencies from like the Clinton Foundation to the USDA. Mm -hmm. um, and these clients are creating real world impact. And what yeah. this means is this provides a real learning opportunity for those interested in the social impact sector, you know, not only is it, uh, not only are you doing that actual work, but you're learning, yeah. okay, you know, how is this, you know, how is the, uh, like the ACLU, how are they structured? You know, how, how mm -hmm. at a high level, what is their sort of like information technology strategy, understanding that yeah. piece. Um, and, and the last part of that too, is just, um, you don't need significant technical experience mm -hmm. um, in computer science to get involved or nor significant experience in sort of community service or social impact. You know, we want it to be a way where people can get that initial experience where people can, you know, get, find that passion, find that work, do, do that, you know, inspiring work. Um, so that was how, you know, it was initially, I guess, conceived and, and sort of as a result, you know, um, it, it was, it, it was received with a decent amount of interest. I mean, we were definitely mm -hmm. smaller in our first semester, you know, where our trial trying to figure out, okay, does this sort of model work? Um, and that was last semester. Um, and, and since then we've grown, uh, with even more clients this past semester, you know, higher quality work and, and generally having more of a foundation on campus. Great, great. I mean, I really love the idea that, you know, when you said, uh, so it's a theoretical course, so kind of masquerading the, the social impact under the utility. So yeah, I, I, I totally love that approach. So, uh, so I mean, uh, so from the time that you have taken the tenure uh, for Tech for Social Good, so uh, what are some of the initiatives that you have started? So could you run down, uh, run down a bit on that? Yeah, by all means. Um, so I, I just wanted to caveat that, you know, none of these are exactly initiatives that, you know, I myself developed, um, but rather mm -hmm. really in, you know, coordination and often led by and, and sort of pushed forward by, you know, tons of other really great people within the organizations where I, you know, just play a bit of more of a supporting role. Um, but I remember, you know, last, or I guess two semesters ago, Sarah and Milan were sort of our, you know, first project managers who, you know, I really like got our, you know, software engineering technical consulting projects off the ground. Their work has, has sort of now been taken forward and overseen by our directors of engineering or Derek and Gavin. Um, we recently started a UX, um, UX research and design technical consulting wow. a service led by Vanessa and Leah, sort of our directors of UX. Um, we launched a social entrepreneurship winter program for students interested in that space to find teams and walk through uh, what is the ideation process and, and, ide and validation process for coming up with ideas, which was led by um, Derek, who, who I mentioned was director of engineering. Um, we've pioneered a social impact um, ideation session with Harvard's largest uh, CS class um, and, wow. and are currently working on launching a fully student run class uh, to do this sort of social impact tech work and help students get course credit for it, uh, which is being pioneered by um, April, our director of growth, Tulsi, our director of marketing is, you know, creating ways for non-technical students uh, that are interested in marketing to, to still get involved and really extend the reach of this sort of social impact tech work. I um, mean, also, we're also better understanding how we as an organization, as well as Harvard as a whole, um, can engage better with tech uh, technology ethics and, and ensuring we're as, as accessible as possible. I mean, that's sort of being led by Isaac, our 
uh, Director of uh, Inclusion, Equity, uh, Diversity, and Ethical Tech. Um, so yeah, lot, we're doing lots of things in these different areas. Happy to talk talk about any of them more thoroughly, but I just also want to emphasize that you know very yeah. much a you know collaborative effort. You know, a lot of really great people within Tech for Social Good doing a lot of really great work. Totally, totally. I mean, uh, so yeah, that was a lot of you know portfolios under uh, your consulting program. So how how was just uh, you know just run me through the challenges you faced through when you were starting with the program. So with the consultancy program, so was it difficult to get the initial clients on board or how was it? Because you are still a student. And uh, so as a student body, uh, how difficult or how easy it was or how challenging it was to get those first, uh, you know, clients on board? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, it, it definitely wasn't an easy process. You know, we have mm -hmm. right now, we have like a whole team at the moment dedicated to, to, to this client sourcing to try to find what are the best projects we can work on. Um, I think one of the most interesting things is not just that um, it, it can be hard to find clients in, in which, um, you know, our, our focus is providing pro bono support. So usually clients are re receptive though, you know, it, it's, it's a balance trying to make sure that our skill sets, our, our, um, our experiences are able to be a good fit, but with the client, um, you know, so, uh, the thing about um, our work is that because we focus on custom technology develop, development, mm -hmm. that means that clients need to have pre-existing technical abilities. Um, and this is always a, this is something, you know, interesting that we found is just that like, you know, a lot of organizations want to use tech. And, and we find that a, a lot of the organizations that don't have that existing technical ability are often the ones that sort of need it most. But the problem is if we build some sort of custom website, custom platform, custom um, anything for them, what will happen is that in just by nature of how technology works is it'll, you know, break. It, you know, maybe mm -hmm. a package goes out of date, you know, maybe something gets yeah. updated by somebody else, you know, uh, and, and as a result, what will happen is just that what we built will no longer be useful and they no longer mm -hmm. would have our sort of technical experience because from our side, maybe our, um, maybe our team members had graduated or maybe our team yeah. members are no longer part of the organization. Um, so that's like one of the, you know, one, one of the things that we think about a lot when we sort of do this mm -hmm. sourcing, making sure that, you know, if we build something, can it be carried forward? Can it be maintained? Yeah. Can it be implemented? Uh, you know, what, uh, when we're thinking about, you know, if we're building a product, are, are we sure that like we can talk to the end users of this product and make sure that, you know, we're not just building for the sake of building, but, you know, we're building to solve real problems and, and you know, these will actually help real people. Um, so it's often this sort of balance, you know, um, not just understanding, you know, um, what projects we could work on, but making sure that, you know, we can provide the most value to the organization that we work with. Totally, totally. I mean, yeah, it's making sure that the work that you do stays with them for time to come. That's that's uh, absolutely necessary. So adding on to that, adding on to the onus of balance. Uh, so with your background in tech, what is the primary reason that you think is behind the misalignment of tech and social good in most initiatives? Yeah, that, that, that's a that's a really great question. I think um, I, I'm definitely no expert on this. You know, I, I'm still learning. I'm still reading. I'm still um, I, I'm, I'm still getting a better understanding of this, but, you know, from my perspective, I, I think there are um, two, two ways to think about this. Um, mm -hmm. One is thinking about the, the general tech industry. So this is, you know, the for-profit tech industry. Um, and the other is sort of thinking about efforts that try to do good um, or explicitly do good using technology. Um, so starting with the, you know, general tech industry, um, I think there's two primary reasons for misalignment. Um, one, I think is just uh, the catch-up nature of regulations on innovation and technology. You know, at the end of the day, um, government is slow. It, it, government, mm. it, you know, it, it's reactionary. It, it's it's less proactive. It, it it often is is figuring out, okay, this happened. How do you prevent this from happening in the future? Right. We yeah. can see this with like the COVID pandemic. Right. Absolutely. There was like Obama had instituted a you know pandemic uh, task force in which had been yeah. completely like abolished. Right. Um, and, and as a result, what happens is that technology is built with the purpose of like. Well, a technology is built with the use case in mind um, and the regulations to make sure this technology doesn't right. hurt people comes much later on. Like we can see this now through social media companies like Facebook, Twitter. Mm -hmm. How are they dealing with questions of free speech, disinformation, misinformation? You know, how, how are like every, every organization's policies are a little bit different. There's no uniform thing. It, it's a constant question of like, what's the fairest way? What's the most ethical way? Um, what's, the, what, what's the most equitable way? Um, so I think that's one piece of it. Um, and I think the other piece of it is just, you know, as a result of sort of being in a, um, you know, more capitalistic system, uh, you know, companies as a whole 
haven't historically needed to be accountable for what they're doing for, for totally. what sort of, you know, how they're building their products, you know, how, who is it affecting? Because as long as it affects their primary user in, in a positive way, that's all, that's all they, they're really focused on. And, and it's really not been until recently that, you know, consumerism has started to take into consideration this yeah. like idea of corporate social responsibility. Um, and just understanding, okay, you know, you're, you're selling clothes, but how are you producing these clothes? You know, are, are you sort of yeah. exploiting local labor for it? Or mm. are you sort of, you know, violating laws in, in that process of doing so? Um, you know, I, I don't think, you know, this is a perfect alignment yet, but, you know, I think we're, you know, moving in the right direction. Totally. Um, but yeah, so for the general tech industry, I would say those two things, um, just one, uh, another quick point on sort of efforts that use technology to do good. Um, I think one book that really opened my mind and opened my perspective on this uh, is this book called Geek Heresy. Um, okay. And it, it's called, it, the full title is Geek Heresy, Rescuing Social Change from the Cult of Technology. Um, and as somebody who is trying to do good social change through mm -hmm. technology, I, I think it was really insightful because it talked a lot about how um, technology is this amplifying force. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily positive. It's not necessarily negative, but what it does do, it, it amplifies the existing uh, existing patterns and existing systems, right? So we, we often think about like technology as, um, oh, maybe like Facebook has provided this opportunity for people to get connected. Well, the thing is people have already been getting connected beforehand. You know, email, mm -hmm. how different is email from like, uh, you know, seeing people's status updates, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, fundamentally not that different. And what, uh, what technology has done is it just made that um, easier, right? It hasn't necessarily yeah. revolutionized the whole game of communication. It's just made the communication in ways that we've already wanted to easier. Um, and as a result, uh, I, I think a lot about this sort of idea of like tech utopianism or tech saviorism in which, you know, we want to make sure that we don't think that we can throw technology at any problem and it'll solve it. Because at the end of the day, you know, um, what, the, the real focus on or the real issue behind a lot of these problems is, is the systems behind it and the people that are affected, the policy, the process, like what's actually happening. And if we throw like a mobile app at some community, that's not going to fix all their problems. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, throughout this conversation, I was jumping off my chair. I was totally connecting with you on so many levels. So, you know, just uh, like two or three hours back, we had this conversation with Shasha Lipman, who's the uh, founder of tech to impact so she mentioned this line that technology is nothing more than the people who are behind it. And, you know, as you rightly mentioned, technology is just an enabler or a disabler based on, you know, where you stand from, what's your perspective mm -hmm. like. So I totally agree with you. And uh, maybe we could share the, the book that you mentioned. Maybe we could share the link yeah. with uh, uh, our viewers so that, you know, they could go on and read the perspective that actually opened your eyes. So uh, moving forward, let's move to your personal journey. And uh, so, yeah, so now you'll be starting. Uh, so you have started your internship at Google recently. So we'd love to know how you tie your future ambitions as a software engineer or as someone uh, in the tech field to your work in the social impact domain. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think at, the, at a baseline, uh, my long-term goals are, you know, 1,000% in social impact tech. Um, specifically social entrepreneurship, you know, it's a field in which, you know, I, I can see, you know, firsthand how uh, you could, it, it's the most efficient way to sort of 10x impact, to really be innovating outside yeah. of the box. Um, specifically thinking about, you know, my, in my current role as Google, um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely grateful for this opportunity and, and you know, to, to be able to be at an organization like this. And, and I'm viewing it in, you know, in two ways. Um, one is an opportunity to gain technical experience. Um, you know, building, te what is it like building software, building technology at scale that's, you know, reliable, secure, safe, um, while being surrounded by some of the best engineers in the world. And, totally. you know, I, I've had a lot of really great mentorship from, uh, you know, my manager and, and my mentors and other people I've met at the organization. Um, but it's also, you know, I, I think for me, a stepping stone to get involved in some really other exciting, uh, some other really exciting social impact tech work. Um, for example, uh, this past spring, I interned as a climate intern at X, which is Google's mm -hmm. uh, sort of incubation engine. Um, and, you know, I, what had happened is I got connected to a Harvard alum working there who was doing really exciting work lo looking at what are the um, what are the environmental social enterprises that they're building and what is the, like the market strategy of their on, and, and this has been helping me in the sense of, you know, I'm interested in social entrepreneurship. I'm interested in social enterprises and uh, as well as like better understanding how to improve tech for social goods work oh. for these organizations. Um, but yeah, so I, I would just say that, you know, I think 
Um, I think I'm uh, really trying to leverage this opportunity to gain technical experience and, and sort of how I can get involved in other parts of Google uh, that, that are really social impact aligned. Um, and at, at this moment, I'm thinking that in the context of um, sustainable development, um, to build sort of healthy and resilient economies around the world, um, you know, in part inspired by sort of my climate work at X, as well as I, the, the previous internship that Meg had mentioned, where I worked at Precision Development, an, an ag tech nonprofit. Totally, totally. So yeah, basically, you know, you're using uh, it as a pathway to catapult your journey into, you know, uh, tech for social good in the future. Totally, totally in uh, sync with you. So uh, while I was, uh, if somebody goes to your link, so you have had a quite illustrious career so far, and uh, your LinkedIn is totally filled up with so many tasks. So uh, how do you manage it while continuing your undergraduate study? How do you manage a balance between academics and the numerous initiatives that you're involved with, like for, for instance, social impact initiatives. So, how do you do this? Yeah, that's a you know, it's a great question. Again, you know, it's one I'm I'm also uh, in in the process of figuring out. Um, I think for me, um, what this this past year, you know, not having been in school and, and sort of being on this leave of absence, uh, has, has taught me a lot in the sense that I've I've been able to do some really exciting on the ground work. Right, um, I've been able to look at market strategies for. Um, you know, environmental organizations that, you know, need profit streams as well as need to do impact. I have been able to, you know, work uh, to understand what are the programs that, um, you know, that the nonprofit is, is putting out, you know, how effective are they? How can we sort of uh, balance resources among those? And, and for me, I, I think I've come to understand that um, even as a student, you can make a lot of impact. And, and being yeah. a student is not necessarily just an intermediary step. It's not necessarily like, you know, I, I learn a bunch and then later on I'll do impact. What, what mm -hmm. you can do is you can really, you know, as a student, you can go ahead and get started in that. And as a student, you have this real ability to make a significant difference. So I think for me, I, I've just, um, in, in sort of my time, I, you know, I definitely appreciate, you know, the, the academic piece of it in which, you know, I'm learning a ton and, you know, I'm surrounded by really great professors, other students, and, and uh, you know, I'm really getting that sort of um, intellectual development. But I think for me, you know, I, I really want to, further focus in on, you know, what, while I am at this, you know, place surrounded by, you know, I guess 1600 other really great students, how can I, um, how can I, you know, leverage that to, you know, make yeah. an impact, you know? Totally, totally. So just you, just now you spoke about your leave of absence uh, in the past year. So what motivated you to take this decision? What was the rationale behind it? Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I think, um, I think the first push was just uh, for me personally, um, uh, we sort of went virtual uh, in the middle of our uh, of of the spring semester, um, and as a result, school became you know a lot more difficult than and definitely less enjoyable. Uh, w w when it did become virtual, you know, I think I think for me a big part of of what you know college experience is is that you know social element of it. You know, meeting other people, being around really inspiring other people, seeing yeah. um, getting those you know creative juices flowing or you know um, w with others and, and sort of having that collaborations. Um, so as a result, you know, going into the summer, um, I really wanted to at least, at the very least, keep my options open. You know, I was like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether or not I want to take this leave of absence, but I want to at least explore if I didn't, what would I get involved with? Um, and I found this really exciting product opportunity at Precision Development, where, yeah. where I'd get to really hone in on one of their new programs and figure out how can we launch a new program in sort of um, in a human-centered design manner. Um, and then going into the spring, I was still thinking about that. And I was like, okay, well, given this sort of past semester or in working at this nonprofit, I was, I was really excited about by that on the ground work and really like learning by doing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and as a result, you know, I, I sort of joined X. Um, and, and I think just really this, this, is, this has taught me that, you know, um, I, I really like this work that's, you know, less theoretical. Uh, that's really making an impact on real people and in, in which I can see that, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing this work, you know, there's this ownership of, of, you know, X input leads to Y output, right? The harder I work, the sort of more impact I can make. Um, and I'm excited, you know, I don't get me wrong. I'm excited to go back to school in the fall. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't have been happier with my, my past years and students. Totally. I mean, I, to, I totally agree with you that, you know, the, the biggest thing, the biggest factor of going to school is the network and networking thing. And this pandemic has, obviously made things a bit difficult. And I can, I totally agree with you that it, it was indeed a great decision to, you know, pursue your other interests in this, in this time. 
So uh, as we are ending towards the uh, time of the session, so let me just ask you, let me just uh, sum up this session by this final question that I have. So you are a Gen Z, right? So how come, I mean, just tell us about how your Gen Z upbringing changed your perspective towards the impact of tech for pioneering social good. How was the process like? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, that, that's, that's a great question. And I think for me, just growing up around technology, you know, um, it, it's really significantly, you know, uh, changed what life is like, you know, how, how everyday life works. Um, for example, now, um, you know, staying in touch with friends around the world. So that I mentioned, you know, is, you know, I can call up any friend at any moment. Um, and, and, you know, it's a different perspective. You know, I, I can see, um, you know, how uh, tech has this possibility to make an impact, right? Information on the internet, um, you know, oh. libraries, you know, you don't necessarily need to go to a library to find the information mm -hmm. you're looking for, right? Everything, um, everything's just like a, a second's notice that, you know, if you just, you know, search something up. Um, and I think for me, that showed me that, you know, while life has, I guess, you know, changed, uh, or while technology has sort of altered how we sort of approach life and how we walk through it, um, it also means that, you know, tech has this uh, real potential for, for impact when used correctly. And I think just having, just having been able to grow around, grow up around tech and see, you know, firsthand that, you know, has really, um, has really helped me understand I, I want to use tech to make an impact. Totally. So now we have a question from the chat. So Craig asks, uh, do people have to be at Harvard to participate in your program? So uh, unfortunately at the moment, yes. Um, we are thinking about ways, how can we better engage with other, uh, you know, other people, other schools, other, other um, organizations. But at the moment, you know, all because we're sort of Harvard Computer Society Tech for Social Good, uh, we are focused on that. Uh, we just want to make sure, you know, we fully uh, develop out our organization and make sure that we're running, operating as smoothly as possible before we think about expanding outwards. Totally. It has been a great summit so far. And at the end, I want to wrap it up by uh, asking you that for everyone tuned in, how can, how can we connect with you and support you in your endeavors? Yeah. Um, so, well, first and foremost, yeah, thank you so much, Sunmai. It's, it's been a great conversation. And it's really always a pleasure. Um, and, and thank you to the whole Power to Fly team for, for you know, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, but yeah, specifically how, how we could be supported. Um, I think, you know, following Tech for Social Good on LinkedIn, um, okay. it's just HCS hyphen T4SG. Um, you can sort of keep updated with as our projects develop, as, as our work develops. Um, and the other thing too, is we're also trying to develop a sustainable funding stream at the moment. So if anybody's in touch with potential sponsors or funders sort of look to get involved in the social impact tech space, that would also be very useful, um, but yes. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you so much for being with us uh, at the summit. And uh, yeah, with that, we wrap the session. And Meg, you can take the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric and Sanmaya. That was absolutely amazing um, and a really, really interesting program. Uh, I'm not surprised that there's interest of people outside of Harvard that want to get involved. So good luck to you. Um, and I, we're so happy and so thankful to have had you with us today. Um, as we move on into our next session, I just want to highlight if you are looking to earn SHRM credits um, for today's uh, chats, please refer to the code that's in the upper left hand corner of the slide in front of you. And as we move on in, um, I want to say hello and welcome to somebody or to anybody who might now just be joining us. Um, you are joining us for day two of our Diversity Reboot 2021 virtual summit series. For July, our focus is tech for social impact. And hopefully you are as excited as we are um, to continue the amazing conversations we've had yesterday and then leading up to uh, this afternoon. So um, throughout this upcoming conversation, if you have questions or comments that you'd like to pass along to the speaker, please feel free to do so. We really wanna hear from you. Feel free to add those questions or comments into the group chat. It's gonna be on the right-hand side of the screen in front of you. Um, and as you do so, I'm gonna briefly refer you to the code of conduct. I'm gonna share that in the chat in just a moment. That is there to ensure that as you interact with your fellow community members or you, um, you connect with the speakers and panelists, that you uh, lead from a place of kindness and respect. Um, it's something that's very fundamental to our Power to Fly community and we always get it from you all. So we just like to say thank you and hope that everyone continues that pattern. Um, now, last thing is if you are looking to earn SHRM credits for this upcoming conversation, you're gonna to wanna to refer to the SHRM code that's in the upper left-hand corner of the slide in front of you. Um, and as I introduce our next speakers, I'm really, really excited um, to get you uh, acquainted with this next set. So Chris Oliver 
is the Executive Vice President of Corporate Strategy at Pluralsight Inc., which is the leading technology workforce development company that helps companies and people around the world transform with technology. Chris joined Pluralsight in August of 2020, overseeing their corporate strategy. With a background in strategy, business development, and corporate development, Chris possesses a unique leadership perspective and breadth of expertise. Chris holds an MBA from the Yale School of Management and a bachelor's degree in public policy from Brown University. He currently serves as board, of, board chair of Community of Unity, a New York-based nonprofit that sits on the advisory board at EYP Mission Critical Facilities. He's gonna be joined in conversation with our own Dana Hall. Dana joined the Power Fly community as a job seeker in 2020, eventually landing her role as an account executive working for Power Fly's sales team. Her professional experience includes roles as an account executive and account manager at large enterprises and small startup companies. She has a bachelor's degree in business management because accounting was too difficult, so she says, from Texas A&M University, where she was also a member of the NCAA equestrian team. She loves to travel, kite surf, hike and cook over a fire. She travels around North Carolina and Central, or sorry, North and Central America with her boyfriend, Luke, who teaches kite surfing, as well as their dog and cat, Toby and Rico. So welcome to Dana and Chris. I'll turn the floor over to you. Take it away. Thank you, Meg. That was awesome. I love hearing my introduction again. <laughs> And hi, Chris. Welcome. Welcome to our summit today. So glad to have you and representation from Pluralsight. Um, actually, for everyone that's listening, I'm lucky enough to be the account executive for Pluralsight. So I get to work with Chris and other members of his team just about every day. Um, so thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, thanks, Dana. Excited yeah. to be here. No worries. And yeah, I mean, you know, we have 30 minutes here today, almost, Chris. Um, I wanted to take some time and start by having you tell us a bit more about yourself, uh, where you're based, and some insight into your career journey. It sounds like you have acquired a number of different skill sets along the way. Yeah, it's uh, thank you. Um, uh, New York City, uh, born and raised, and currently, um, nobody's <laughs> Uh, really ever asked me to do a job that's uh, required me to be uh, away from New York City, though I've traveled uh, extensively for my career. Uh, this has always been home. Um, it has been an interesting journey through tech. I, I stumbled literally into the industry 25 years ago, thought I wanted to do one thing, uh, be, a, be a lawyer like uh, lots of folks, uh, ultimately determined that wasn't for me. And, and uh, uh, fell in with a startup um, uh, back in the mid 90s. And uh, my career in tech uh, has sort of gone from there. And I've always been um, very much uh, interested in and passionate about and fortunate enough to have roles around strategy um, and operations. I've always been um, desirous of, of trying to figure out um, or guide where a particular company is going um, and also helping to execute uh, against that strategy. So it's been, uh, it's been a great career um, and I'm in exactly that role at Pluralsight today. That's amazing. I have personally been in sales in technology for the last 10 years. And you know, one of the common questions I get is, hey, can you help me with my computer? I'm having some problems. Do you get that very often? I'm <laughs> um, I'm pretty lucky um, in that in that um, as as sort of the you know strategy business uh, operations guy, uh, nobody has ever mistaken me for being um, wildly technologically proficient. Although I have picked up a few things over the years, uh, I can hold my own. But uh, no, no few few requests for <laughs> for tech support. Uh, oh, man, I must be branding myself all <clears throat> wrong. I get asked all the time and I'm like, you do not want me to touch your computer. Trust me. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. No, that's amazing to hear about you. Um, I didn't realize you were in New York. We have quite a few people um, on the Power to Fly team and our partners based out of New York. Um, Excellent. You know, turning some of your background from you told us the story of how you got started and kind of how you've made your journey along the way in your career. Can you kind of drill down into your work at Pluralsight? Um, tell us a little bit more about your, your mission there and what you're trying to accomplish while at Pluralsight. Yeah, well, um, uh, as, as you uh, accurately uh, described or as was uh, accurately uh, introduced, uh, Pluralsight is the uh, IT workforce development company, right? We are 
uh, seeking to provide um, ad, uh, sort of intermediate and advanced uh, tech technology professionals with the skills that they need um, to uh, uh, create uh, new technologies or to help transform their organizations or to deepen their own skill set um, or whatever it may be. Um, and um, in my capacity with Pluralsight as uh, EVP of uh, strategy, I get to think sort of longer term, um, you know, sort of 18 months and on uh, about, you know, where we should be uh, and who we should be when we grow up and how we differentiate ourselves uh, from the competition and how we continually um, add value to uh, our users, both individuals, um, consumers, and our enterprise customers. And then uh, a really neat part of the job is I also have responsibility for um, our M&A activity. So in the, case, in the cases where we believe acquiring a company helps us to accelerate into uh, an opportunity or helps us to more rapidly acquire mm -hmm. a capability that we're missing, um, we, uh, we, we get to do that. Um, and as you may have seen in the press, uh, we just closed uh, uh, a deal to acquire a fantastic company called A Cloud Guru. Um, and so they're officially part of the family and uh, we're really looking forward to, to working closely with them. Awesome. No, congratulations. I had not actually seen that yet. Um, so that's super exciting to hear. And I can't wait to hear more about it as well. Um, thanks so much for the background and some of the information there. As today, we're here to talk about tech for social impact. Um, you know, I noticed in some of my research that Plural Sites approach towards social good has seems like two pillars or two primary sides, closing the tech skill gap through education and support, which you mentioned, um, and then also workforce development programs. Can you help us to understand a little bit more about Plural Sites efforts um, towards ensuring social good through your product? Yeah, well, I... As I always like to say, I've I've been with Pluralsight for for just about a year now, and so it it <clears throat> Pluralsight is neat. It's it's sort of as much a, a kind of a traditional, um, you know, for profit revenue generating uh, commercial enterprise as it is a what I would refer to as a social experiment. Um, Pluralsight uh, has always believed uh, very deeply um, that closing the technology skills gap. Um, is, is an important lever uh, to really help change the trajectory of, of underserved uh, men and women um, out in the world and um, was very intentional several years ago, back in 2017, about creating a social impact organization, Plural Site One, um, to focus on exactly uh, that, that mission, right? To, uh, to both provide low cost access to our platform, the, the, uh, the skills building uh, platform that is so core to, uh, to our business and or making uh, direct cash grants to a handful of, uh, of key strategic nonprofit partners that have a demonstrated track record of being able to scale impact really effectively. So that's a, that Plural Site One is a, is, a, is a huge part of what we do. Um, and very central to uh, the founding mission and objective uh, of, of the company. Yeah. Wow. And you started that back in 2017. That's, that's correct. And so, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Dana. Oh, I was just going to say, so one might say a little bit ahead of the curve uh, of some of these other companies that might be just coming around to some of these initiatives, but have laid out an example of um, of some of the things that you can do to, to ultimately give back and, and push, you know, the social good aspect of a company forward. Yeah. You know, as, as, as I've said, um, uh, it was, you know, it was really the foresight of, of, of the founders um, who um, I think we all share uh, many of us who have been attracted to plural site. Um, there's this sort of common theme when you talk to many of us, um, that education has been super, super important to all of us. I come from a family of, of teachers and educators. Um, the founders, of course, were teaching and educating folks um, on, on how to best leverage technology. And so sort of this, this notion of teaching and educating um, and the belief in the power of education 
to change the trajectory uh, for, for folks, uh, to help change the narrative for folks is, is at the core of, of this company. And as I said, it, was, it has been embodied through uh, Plural Site One back in 17. And uh, you know, over that time, uh, the impact has been tremendous, right? Plural Site One has uh, provided cash grants of, of over $4 million yeah. and product grants uh, totaling over 60 million uh, over that time. And, and, and we continue to, to try to drive impact uh, around the world. Amazing. And, you know, I think it's, I think that's really neat the way that you put it about democratizing technology skills, right? Let's, let's, yeah, that's the only way to put it, right? Is democratizing it so that we can all level up and that so we can really um, also diversify um, within our workforce, which is what Power to Fly is all about um, and our partnership today. Um, you know, one thing maybe for companies that are, are just getting started or maybe even for companies that have had initiatives since 2017 as well, just might be considering, um, you know, taking a play out of your book um, and figuring out how to, uh, I guess, create more impact around some of their initiatives um, with social good. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, you've talked about some grants and also some of the ways that you're teaching others. Can you talk a little bit about some of your partnerships? Are there any nonprofits um, that you're working with or stakeholders um, that give benefits to these you know, actual people at the grassroots level. Absolutely. The, so we, um, uh, and I'll, I'll sort of keep it within the context still of, of, of Plural Site One, there are um, a number of K-12 and nonprofit institutions um, with, with whom we work very closely. We provide access, as I said, to, their, uh, to our platform um, for them to um, uh, uh, leverage technology in a way that's most impactful to, to either their students or their, uh, their, their end users, their, their constituents, the communities that they serve. Um, and we've got about a thousand sort of uh, customers today, as I said, K-12 and nonprofit. And then in addition to that, um, we work very closely with five um, uh, fairly well-known nonprofit organizations that have a demonstrated track record of being able to scale impact um, at a global level. And um, those, those uh, 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 strategic partners of ours include the Malala Fund, uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council, Code.org, uh, Year Up, uh, and the Computer Science Teachers Association. And, um, and so we work uh, very closely with them, again, providing access to our platform and uh, cash grants to support uh, the activities that they're driving every day um, to change the narrative and to change the trajectory of, of the communities that they serve. Amazing. Yeah, those, I've, I've actually heard of a couple of those nonprofits. It's really neat. Um, some of the partnerships that you've made. Um, and it's, it's, it's really neat because we, we get to work, you know, it, we, we really have taken um, a position that says the best thing for us to do uh, after you've, you know, you've, you've selected the right partner is to, you know, really stay out of the way, provide um, uh, our grants that are really around capacity building and sort of let them do their work. And so uh, the way they engage with us differs because uh, we've really been incredibly flexible um, based on what it is that they're trying to achieve and, and the ways in which we can add value. So Norwegian Refugee Council um, and, and their IT organization internally um, is in the midst and has been uh, for a couple of years now of a, a significant digital transformation. They've recognized that technology can help them to support the 12 million odd displaced um, people around the world that that they serve. And they are serving people in very um, uh, remote um, uh, uh, locations around the world. And they've determined that technology is a way to more effectively provide service to those folks. So, so uh, we, we've engaged uh, to, to help support and skill up their technologists to drive their digital transform transformation. Um, Malala, for example, has uh, their education ambassadors um, uh, motivated young men and women around the world who are educating uh, young women um, in various locations around the world. Uh, our uh, partnership with Malala 
provides those education ambassadors with the technology tools that help them to innovate uh, how they educate. So it all, it really, it really runs the gamut in terms of how we're working with people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm hearing a lot of wonderful things, a lot of like culture pillars, actually, as well as how you're handling these partnerships and how you're nurturing um, these relationships to ultimately facilitate this initiative, right? Uh, Plural Site One. And, and ultimately, um, moving forward, um, how you give back and how you interact with the community as a whole and with your consumer. You know, I can't help, but since I'm at, you know, an account executive at Power to Fly and you happen to be my client, um, and I know a little bit about this on my end as well, but, you know, a lot of people that are tuning in today um, would also love to hear a little bit about how some of these things that you've talked about in the way that you handle these partnerships and this um, and these initiatives intertwine or, or transcend down into Pluralsight's actual internal culture. Um, some of the ones that I've heard are, you know, really finding the correct people and empowering them, um, whether that's, you know, providing some sort of methods to upskill them, um, really putting in the time and effort to help uh, move them forward in their career. I've also heard, um, you know, some things about, uh, Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. I've also heard a lot about, you know, democratizing technology and welcoming diversity, right? That's what um, a lot of talks are happening within um, the talent community today and within a lot of community, within a lot of businesses that I'm talking to. So since we have a, a couple minutes here, um, I wanted to ask you your own personal um, interaction and, and experience at Pluralsight. What are some of the things, you know, what's it like to work at Pluralsight? Yeah, pl listen, Plural Site is, um, and again, um, what in what shouldn't come as a surprise to uh, a business that's really focused on uh, educating people and providing with them with the tools that they need uh, to be successful in in whatever their, the endeavor might be uh, or or the mission that they're focused on um, is is. Uh, a culture that's very much built on on learning, right? So uh, it's a very self-reflective culture. Uh, we are, I think, very aware of uh, of the things that we're good at, uh, the areas where we need to improve, and and uh, taking the steps uh, to engage in that in that personal development. And like learning, um, that's a that's a journey that never ends, right? And so. Um, uh, you will, you know, you'll note that about uh, Plural Site. We are always learning. Uh, we are always growing. Um, we are always trying to figure out how to do things better. Uh, we are giving people, uh, the, providing them with the freedom, right, to experiment um, and 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 to figure things out, which sometimes means um, getting answers wrong, but learning very quickly um, from those and and uh, and applying those lessons learned uh, accordingly. It's also a very uh, values-driven um, organization. Uh, it always has been uh, from the start. Um, and we really try to lean in on values that uh, really aspire toward being about something bigger, right? About a, a shared team mission versus an individual mission. Um, values that are all about um, meeting people where they are and giving them the, the, the space and the respect to be who they are. Um, uh, values that are all about uh, personal accountability um, and and striving for excellence. So uh, it's a it's a very unique culture in that way. Lots of companies talk about values. Most companies have values, but um, for many, it's just a right. It's a it's a handy PowerPoint slide or a Word doc or you know a laminated card or something. Um, uh, I think Plural Site is unique in that. Uh, we really try to live by those uh, every day. Yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely echo from my own personal experience working from the outside and not for long, um, but with a couple team members over at Pluralsight, always have been met with an understanding of where I'm at. Sometimes it takes me a little time to, you know, formulate the question. I've always received so much patience um, and undivided attention. So I can definitely echo that from the outside as well. Um, yeah, and, folks, you know, we've... Folks folks care about, uh, about, um, again, engaging at a, at a deep level. I think that's why, 
Um, you, you, you've got uh, so, so much love and respect out there in the market for folks who have used uh, our product or engage with us, right? We're really trying to help people um, uh, to, to get what they need uh, from us. Um, and, and also, right, patience. It, it takes some time to engage and listen and, um, and, and sort of figure out how we need to, uh, to, to support our customers. For sure. And, and meet people where you are, like you said. I really liked how you, how you phrased that. Um, you know, something else that caught my eye, we've talked a lot about uh, some of the different initiatives um, that you're involved in, you know, starting with your background and drilling into those talked a little bit about some of the partnerships that you've um, involved, that you are involved in um, and have, have created and nurtured. Something else that came up is I noticed that you were a board chair um, on the community of Unity. Um, yes. Could you just take a couple minutes, uh, tell us about this organization, their work, and why are you passionate about it? Sure. Um, well, first off, I've, I've had the honor to be affiliated uh, very closely with, with community of Unity or C of U um, uh, for now better than 20 years, 21 years, which is uh, the entire lifespan of the organization. Um, the organization, um, uh, medium-sized nonprofit based in New York City, focused on um, supporting underserved black and brown youth, um, uh, primarily in, in urban environments like New York City. We work with uh, uh, ages 14, sort of high school freshmen uh, to, to age 22, sort of early professionals. And the program really is all about strengthening the social and emotional skills of, of the young men and uh, women that we work with to enable them to develop uh, both a, a growth mindset and a strong sense of belonging. And we feel if we can help them to do that, um, the increased personal agency that they see as a result, uh, the, 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 the proactivity and empowerment that they experience as a result, allow them to achieve whatever objective or goal uh, that they've set for themselves um, uh, in their lives. And we engage in a number of different ways. We engage uh, primarily through one-on-one um, -on -one and peer group um, mentoring and counseling. We, uh, the sort of the core uh, program at Community of Unity are our FAM groups, which are small same-sex groups that work together um, and form strong uh, peer bonds over a number of years uh, of working together. We also have a wonderful outdoor education program, um, as well as a phenomenal uh, college and, and career guidance program as well. Wow. Yeah, that's, you know, um, it's so cool now being in the in the diversity, equity, inclusion, and HR industries. You know, hearing about some of these awesome organizations. Um, you know, I guess just personally, I I wasn't ever not not necessarily able to, but I just wasn't a part of any of anything like that specifically growing up. But what I do remember, and hopefully, Dad, if you're watching, he's probably not. But if he is, um, he I see, remember, he can see it later. He can see it later. He can send you the recording. Um, I distinctly remember him, and you know, this is something that changed my life forever. Was just saying you can be anything you want if you put your head to it, right? Um, so just again, like that growth, facilitating that growth mindset. Um, making me aware that you can do whatever you want. Um, it's not necessarily always going to be easy. You got to you got to work for it, but the possibilities are endless. Yeah, the, um, the we the way we sort of talk about it um, at Community of Unity, and and frankly also at, at, at Plural Site to a certain extent, is about changing <clears throat> your the narrative. I think in the case yeah. of Community of Unity and the and the young men and women we specifically work with. You know, the narrative has always been a negative one, right? You can't do this or you are lesser than uh, or whatever it may be, coupled with, you know, some very challenging environments and circumstances that these young men and women come from. And so we've always been about trying to provide those folks with the life skills that they need to change the narrative and to, uh, and, and, and to really sort of uh, take control over uh, what their what their destiny is, and 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 to make the right choices based on uh, what what it is they want to accomplish. So, that's that's the work. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's extremely important work, um, and it's very cool that you've that you've had it going for so long. Um, it's got to be the stuff that you. I'm sure you look forward to your work at plural sites as well, but that has to be extremely rewarding. 
it, uh, it, 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 it absolutely is. But I'll say this, the wonderful thing, especially at this stage in my career about plural site, it is, it was a really unique opportunity to sort of bring some, um, you know, personal passions uh, together with some professional uh, passions as well. And so, as sure. I said, we're, we're all uh, very motivated by this uh, mission of, of, of helping to teach people um, and helping them to learn and, and leveraging that to get to wherever they want to get to in life. Very amazing. Well, I know for me, especially um, learning this much about you already, I can't wait to see uh, what's next um, for your career and for your life. Um, do you have any plans, anything on the horizon or goals for I, the future? I, you know, there's, there's, there's sort of enough on the plate uh, right in front of me. So I try not to get uh, sort of too, uh, e- e- even though, you know, I'm a, I'm a strategist and um, the, our, our whole makeup tends to be more, uh, as they say in chess, sort of downboard uh, thinking and thinking about the future. Um, so I try to balance that with also, making sure that the, the things that are right in front of me are, are taken care of because that's what's going to enable you to get to the future. So no, no great plans other than, um, you know, trying to help uh, Pluralsight grow and, and, and sort of reach the, the potential it can and uh, to maximize the kind of impact we think is possible through, through Pluralsight One. There's, there's, uh, there's plenty there to do uh, as, you, as you peel back that onion um, based on just what's in front of me in my, in my day to day. So I'll, I'll let you know what I want to gr- uh, be when I grow up as, as soon as I figure it out. Uh, but right now a little, a little busy, uh, to, well, to it definitely, out. definitely makes me feel better that maybe you don't know what you want to be when you grow up because no, <laughs> I have I no idea. <laughs> I don't, I don't still well, figuring it out with one minute left. Can you just tell the audience, how can we get in touch? How can we connect with you and how can we support some of the endeavors that you're involved in? Yeah, well, um, you know, learn, learn a little bit more sort of first, you know, sort of the theme here, learn and educate. Uh, you can learn a little bit more about Pluralsight One at Pluralsight One, O-N-E uh, dot org. You can check us out there. Of course, uh, please feel free to engage with the uh, Pluralsight platform at Pluralsight.com. Um, check us out there. Um, uh, community of unity, as we discussed, communityofunity.org. Uh, check out, uh, check us out there and see what we're doing. And uh, there are plenty of ways to engage with us there. Um, and for folks who have, you know, questions or anything that you want to engage with me on going forward, uh, CO, initials CO at pluralsite.com uh, is my email and feel free to ping me. Um, and then you can also uh, uh, find me, um, on LinkedIn as well. Feel free to, uh, uh, to reach out and connect and, and Twitter. Um, you know, I, I can, I'm pretty easy to find these days. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, hopefully we'll get to speak again. Um, and, uh, yeah, thank everyone in the audience for attending the summit, um, more to come and I'll turn it back over to you, Meg. Thank you, Dana. And thank you so much, Chris, um, to Chris and Dana for that amazing chat. That was really, really great to get to listen in on. So thank you so much for both of you. My pleasure, my honor. Thank you, guys. All right. Keep rocking, Meg. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, As we move on into our next session, I just want to say, if you are looking to earn continuing education credits for the Society of Human Resource Managers, you're going to want to take a look at the code that's in the upper left-hand corner of the slide in front of you. Um, And as we bring on our next speaker, I just want to say hello and welcome to anyone who might now just now be joining us. You are um, joining us for day two of our July mini summit of Tech for Social Impact. We are super excited to keep the conversations going. I, for one, cannot wait to hear what this upcoming speaker has to say. So um, to get up to that, I just want to highlight for all of the people tuning in that if you have questions or comments or you want to um, take part in today's conversation, we want to encourage that as much as we can. So please feel free to add questions or comments you might have for the speaker um, in the the group chat. It's going to be on the right-hand side of the screen in front of you. And you can also call out um, myself or um, any of my colleagues from Power to Fly. I think Lauren's in there as well. Um, If you have any kind of tech issues, please feel free to tag us in a group chat message or you can DM us um, and we'll try and help you out with any kind of tech issues you might be having. Um, My colleague Arushi is also adding 
the, um, the code of conduct to the group chat right now. Um, that is just there to ensure that all of these events are um, a positive experience for everyone involved. Now, um, as we go into our next session, I'm really excited to introduce to you the co-founder and CEO of Lock and Stock, Craig Fernandez. Um, this Lock and Stock is a Dubai-based mobile app which helps students fight digital addiction through gamification. By locking their phones, users gain access to student offers at over 1,000 partner brands and scholarships at over 1,100 partner universities. Through its scholarships platform, Lock and Stock is, made, is making education more accessible and affordable for students. Since the launch, the app has transferred over $2 million in scholarships to students, becoming the largest education marketplace in the UAE and GCC. In December 2020, Lock and Stock was named Disruption of the Year at the Gulf Capital Awards. And in 2019, Craig won the Arabian Business Future Star Award, as well as being named the Young CEO of the Year at the Global CEO Excellence Awards in 2021. So welcome, Craig. Craig is gonna be joining conversation with, our, with uh, the amazing Hunter Canning. Hunter is a performer, photographer, and theatrical producer. He has acted on Broadway, TV shows, and various voiceover projects, in addition to joining us on past summits as an um, amazing host. Hunter is one of the producers of Mondays in the Club, which is a diverse group of traveling artists, musicians, and singers who perform free shows that foster community and bring folks of all walks of life together. Like I said, I'm really excited for this chat, so I'm gonna turn the stage over to you, Hunter and Craig. Thank you so much, Meg, for that wonderful conversation. And I'm uh, so happy to be back here with Power to Fly and uh, joined with Craig. How you doing, Craig? Hunter, hi, good. Good afternoon to you, I imagine, because it's pretty late where I'm at, but I imagine afternoon for you guys, yeah? That's right, yeah, it's about 4.30. I'm based in New York, but we're kind of all over here at Power to Fly. We got people <laughs> on every coast, every continent. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, thanks a lot for having me, Hunter, Meg, and the entire Power to Fly team. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, great. Well, on that note, can you tell me, Craig, like, where are you calling in from right now? Um, tell me a little bit about yourself and, and what led you to start Lock and Stock? Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're a Dubai-based startup, so I'm actually based here in Dubai. It's where I grew up, it's where I was born. Um, Lock and Stock is a one-of-a-kind mobile application, right? So <clears throat> nothing like it's seen before, and that's how we've achieved so much of what we've achieved. We're incredibly socially driven. Here, here at Lock and Stock, our aim is to fight digital addiction among students. Now, if you tell a student to lock their phone or keep their phone away, no one's going to do that. Anyone can just lock their phone normally. So what we do is actually reward students with things that they really, really want. So we tell students, stay off your phones, be a responsible human being. You know, don't use your phone in class or in, the re in a restaurant or in a theater or anything like that. And in exchange, we'll give you rewards that you can then use for offers, discounts, weekly prizes, and scholarships at any of our partners. Now, through our scholarships platform, we actually have become the largest education marketplace in the UAE. We transfer hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars in scholarships to students every year. This year, I think as Meg pointed out, so far we've transferred $2 million in scholarships to students. This year, we're actually on course for $5 million. All students have to do is just lock their phones, pay attention in class, or just stay off their phone when, when they're at the dinner table. And with their rewards, they can access these scholarships guaranteed through our app. That's really incredible. So walk me through it. So I download the app. I have it on my phone now. Teacher's about to start speaking. I, what do I do next? How does it, what does that actually feel like and look like? All you gotta do is literally pop open the application, click on the lock button and then keep your phone away. The same way anyone normally locks their phone, except when you lock your phone through lock and stock, now you're actually getting rewarded with tangible benefits. Super simple, super easy. That's awesome. So what are some of the rewards that a student can get? Uh, so, you know, you get buy one, get one free. So it really depends on the platform, on Lock and Stock. There's a lot of things that students can do. But let's say, you know, it's a Thursday night or a Friday night and you want to go out with your friends through Lock and Stock, you know, buy one, get one free at your favorite restaurants like Chili's or Applebee's or Fuddruckers. Or maybe you want to go for coffee with your girlfriend, you know, like buy one, get one free at like a Tim Hortons or a Starbucks. 
Um, if you're applying to university, as I mentioned earlier, you know, scholarships to university, again, all you gotta do is apply through the app. And even if you don't wanna do anything like that, as long as you participate in the experience, you're locking your phone, you're completing achievements, all of that stuff, you're eligible to win weekly prizes. Uh, last week, the number one student on the application won a Samsung phone. The week before that, it was like Apple AirPods. I think this week it's a Samsung tablet. So there's awesome prizes being given away every week as well. All you gotta do is lock your phone. I love that you're giving them prizes of more devices they can lock to earn more points. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's actually something that I want to clarify, right? So whenever we pitch lock and stock, people say, what, what are you doing? Like the phone is an amazing thing. You know, technology is beautiful. And here at lock and stock, like I'm 24 years old. The average age of the company here is also 23, 24. We are not anarchists. You know, we're not telling people throw your phones away and like go live in like the, the outback or something. We love our mobile phones. All we say is that you should be responsible with your devices. I'll tell you, Hunter, I actually got the idea for Lock and Stock when I was a student myself. It was my senior year of college. I went to university in the States and it was my senior year of college. And um, I walk into this one class, there were like 25 students there and each and every single student was on their mobile phone or tablet or laptop. No one's paying attention. The professor is just talking and talking and talking because it's their job. I mean, the professor is gonna, gonna teach. You listen, you don't listen, whatever. But I remember seeing this and thinking to myself, wow, like, is this how distracted our society has become? And so, <clears throat> and I was like, you know, we got to do something about this. This was way back in 2017. I imagine it's only become worse ever since, but I'd like to think that we're making an impact on this problem in our own tiny little way. Yeah, well, I love hearing about your personal experience there, Craig, because it is kind of amazing, right? Like how, expensive being a student is and you don't have any income usually most i mean some students are then working multiple jobs they're trying to pay for school they're trying to pay for supplies they're trying to pay for that cup of coffee that you mentioned and yet at the same time we're so addicted you i think you use that word like we're addicted to these devices and so we're distracted from the very thing that we're spending all of this money paying to be for paying to be at right so i love that you're offering up a solution here most people actually don't even understand the scale of the problem, right? I think uh, there have been, there's tons of research out there which backs this hypothesis, but I think some of my favorite data points are just, I think 61% of students say that they are or they might be addicted to their mobile devices. I think 26% of all classroom time at the tertiary level is spent by students on their digital devices for non-educational purposes. These are astounding numbers. That's crazy. If you think about it, a quarter of all classroom time spent on a digital device for a non-educational purpose, that is a massive loss to the individual, of course, and to society in general. Um, so the scale of the problem actually is huge. Most people don't realize it though. Yeah. So you were, it sounds like you got some, some data to back up that was, um, that motivated you potentially or helped you develop this. Can you also, on the other side of it, have you been collecting data? Like how many hours have students saved by using, um, your app lock and stock? Oh, 100%. Um, so if you actually go to our website, which is www.lockandstock.app, there's a rolling ticker of how much time we've actually helped students save. And as of right now, we're just shy of 900 years, 900 years of total time spent offline by all of our students. And that's time that we've given back to teachers, to professors, to parents, and to students themselves. Right, 900 years of total time spent offline through our application. We're very, very proud of that number. Wow, that is quite the digital detox. 900 years, that's astronomical. So to think about like how many, how many more hours for the individual, because that's like the number of all of your users. So per, per user, they're getting that much more time back for their education, the teachers are also getting that time with their students. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we, we're actually an incredibly data-driven company. Um, the average user locks their phone for roughly around 40 to 45 minutes, which makes sense because that's usually a normal class duration. So 40 to 45 minutes is the average lock time in one session. Um, and a user can lock their phone for uh, like maybe, 15 or 20 hours per week. You know, those are some of our best users. Most users tend to lock their phones maybe three or four or five hours per week, which is still awesome. 
right? That's time that the user is literally saying, I want to put my phone away. I remember six months ago, there was a student who actually dropped us an email completely unsolicited. She went to our website, she found our contact box and she literally wrote a message to us. And in the message, she said, hi team Lock and Stock. I just wanted to drop this message to thank you guys for the awesome app that you guys have built. Because of you guys, I was able to cover so much of my study material that I otherwise would not have been, not have been able to cover. And I was able to get an A in my exams. I just want to thank you guys for that. And I remember looking at that message and going, damn, like that's awesome, right? So you don't only have to be in class or, you know, at, at the dinner table. You could literally be at your desk with your books and you want to say, okay, I want to concentrate on my work. I'm going to lock my phone, put my phone away, and I'm going to focus. And that was this student, this one student's story right there. I love that story. I also, what I'm also loving about this too is, you know, on whatever phone you have, you know, there's now there's these different features that can like help you limit your time with certain apps. But what I find with a lot of them personally, in my own experience is they're kind of shame based. Actually, it's like, you know, you, you're not doing so good. You, you need to cut this out. But what I love about lock and stock is that there's this reward system and it's like, you're being encouraged as opposed to like, you know, some of these other things that are happening. Yeah, you know, when, when designing new features and functionality, as I mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm 24 years old. I, I have no shame in saying that I'm extremely young um, compared to other people in the space, but I'm 24 years old. Most of the team here at Lock and Stock is also 22 or 23, 24, 25. We actually try to hire Lock and Stock users who graduated from university to then come into the company because they understand the product. Um, but when designing new features and functionality, the first simple question that we ask ourselves is not, okay, fine, you know, how are we going to make money? or what's the biggest revenue generating feature? The first question that we ask ourselves is what would we have loved when we were students? Because we, if we, were, we were students not so long ago, like two or three, maybe four years ago, we were in that position. So we ask ourselves, what would we have loved when we were students? And that's literally how we got to offers and discounts, how we got to weekly prizes, how we got to scholarships, which today's students love. Um, I think last week alone, about 2,500 new students signed up for Lock and Stock from 106 different countries around the world. That's just purely organic, right? These students came from Nigeria, Germany, Russia, Philippines, South Korea, Brazil, Belize. We've never advertised in those markets. It's just, it's just how can we give students things that they would love? literally. And that's how we built the product, right? So no shame game or anything like that. We want you to put your phone away. And we, when you unlock your phone, you should have something exciting waiting for you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I just want to give a shout out to our, uh, all of you watching right now and listening. If you have any questions, if anything's coming up, please do drop it in the, the chat box there. And um, I can relay those questions to Craig and we can, um, you know, this is a well of insights here, so please do. We'd love to hear from you. So, Craig, you've mentioned, um, you know, that you're you're a young entrepreneur, and um, I imagine you might have had some being distracted. And so, what were some of the the challenges you faced? In you know, you're like, hey, I want to. I know I'm a student, but I want to. I want to make something. I want to make an app. I see a problem, but you must have faced some challenges. Can you elaborate on maybe some of that experience that you had and how you? Yeah. Going? Yeah. Too. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, you know, as a, as a young entrepreneur, I'm 24 right now, but when, when we launched the company, I was 21. Um, that's extremely, extremely young. You know, like Dubai is a multinational city. It's on the global map nowadays, but a lot of people realize that a lot of people don't realize that Dubai isn't quite Silicon Valley or New York or London or even Bangalore or Hong Kong. In Dubai, entrepreneurship is just not a thing, right? Especially where we come from, where I come from. I, co I grew up in a middle, lower middle class family in Dubai. Our annual rent growing up was about $1,500 per year. And that, that's, that's where I come from, right? So from that background, entrepreneurship is just not a thing. So when I graduated university, I said, you know, this is a problem. Students are addicted to their phones. And is there something we can do about this? And when I said that, I remember just this chorus of don't do it. What if it doesn't work? What if it fails? Uh, go and get your master's degree first and then launch this venture. This chorus of negativity. Um, so as a young 
when I was 21, when we were launching out, I had to train myself basically to shut out all the negativity and just focus on what the mission is, right? What are we doing? Why are we working so hard? What are we trying? What is the problem we are trying to solve? Um, and I think as a young entrepreneur, if, if there are any young entrepreneurs in the audience, I am almost very, very sure that they are going through or went through the same thing. Um, <clears throat> and if you're a young entrepreneur and you want to make it, you want to you want to go forward with your with your startup, you have to learn how to shut out that negativity. That negativity will come from everywhere, your friends, your family, your parents, even maybe. Um, but you have to learn how to shut it out, head down, tunnel vision, just keep moving forward. What are some of the things you do to help you stay focused um, other than creating an app to stay focused? What do you do personally <laughs> to keep that, that tunnel vision, that, that North Star eye on the prize? What do you do for yourself? Because does it still come up for you too now? Like you have this wildly successful thing. Does that voice still exist sometimes? Oh, yeah, so, you know, Lock and Stock has come a very long way since we first launched, right? In the last four years, of course, now we have north of 100,000 active users. Uh, we've been featured on CNN, Tech Radar, Mashable, Esquire, every single publication in the Middle East. We've, we've gotten a lot of love, a lot of attention. We were named Digital Disruption of the Year, but it's, it's still a challenge, right? <clears throat> Even if it's not a challenge for me, per se, today our team is... 45 people strong. And so it's a challenge keeping everybody on the same page moving forward. Um, with that in mind, we are actually, I, I mentioned this earlier, we're just gonna touch on it again. We're actually an incredibly socially driven organization, right? So aside from the digital addiction aspect, which, you know, 900 years, that's a remarkable figure right there. Um, it's also helping make education more accessible and affordable. Um, so just how can we broaden our umbrella, broaden our tent using the multifarious platforms within Lock and Stock? So you lock your phone and with these rewards, A, B, C, D, how can we use those platforms to also make an impact on the world, right? Um, and when I think about that, that is something that motivates me personally, as well as something that motivates the entire team. The fact that, okay, you know, I get into a meeting and I say, here at Lock and Stock, we dispersed $1.1 million in scholarships last year, $2 million in our total time so far, and $5 million is what we're on course for this year. That's incredibly motivating. I personally, personally am extremely proud of that. I remember how expensive university was for myself, and I wish there was an app that let me lock my phone and get a scholarship to university when I was growing up. So yeah. incredibly motivating. Yeah. yeah, I bet. So it's been a really bizarre year for students, right? A lot of people have been work uh, when studying from home, and I imagine it's it's even easier to be on another browser, to be on your phone, to be on your tablet. Like we have all of these distractions. Can you talk about? Have you heard from your users? Of has this helped them in this time when we have ample time to really be distracted? Yeah, yeah, 100%. You know, it's, 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 it's funny. When the pandemic first hit and everything was shut down, schools were closed, universities were closed, everybody was working from home, studying from home, basically doing everything from home. Um, we actually were puzzled, right? We were like, okay, like, you know, if people are at home, how is that going to affect behavior on the application? Are people going to find it easier, harder? We, we don't really know, right? This is uncharted territory. And what we actually saw, I think, in April of last year was when the lockdowns were first imposed here in Asia, at least. Um, and what we actually saw in April of last year when the lockdowns were first imposed was activity shot through the roof, literally. More students were signing up than ever before. Our activity levels doubled or tripled in some weeks as students religiously locked their phones and said, you know what, if we're studying from home, if we're attending classes from home, we are going to really make an effort to pay attention. We anyway can't go to class. We might as well make the most of this while we can. Let's lock our phones, let's put our phones aside. More than that, we actually had a lot of parents actually reaching out to us and parents going like, damn, you know, I can actually see, because before students would be in class, like in university or in school, but now students are at home, they're in their rooms or they're in the living room and they're actually locking their phones and parents are going like, what are you doing? And the kid's just like, you know, I've locked my phone through lock and stock. And the parent is like, oh, what's lock and stock? So we actually got a lot of parents dropping, up, dropping us messages and going like, wow, you know, what you guys are doing is fantastic. Thank you so much. And that's really the activity and the behavior that we've seen since the pandemic. And um, <clears throat> at present time, that behavior looks 
but it, it does not it does not look like it's going to be it anytime soon so fingers crossed on that yeah wow so you know my wheels are spinning as i'm listening to this i'm like wow there's so many other places i feel like that an app like this would be useful maybe not just for students is that something you guys are talking about um, we, we have explored ideas like that. Um, perhaps maybe someday a lock and drive, which maybe tracks a speedometer on the phone. And as long as your phone is locked while, you're, while, you're, while your car is moving, you're earning rewards like a lock and drive. Uh, a lock and work maybe, you know, like a corporate solution to help corporate employees stay off their phones at the workplace. There are a number of different avenues that we can take this. Digital addiction is not a student only thing. I think everybody in the world today is in some way or the other addicted to their mobile devices. Um, but something that I learned a long time ago and something that, you know, just um, <clears throat> a mentor, a particular mentor of mine told me when we were first launching is focus, right? So at present time, we're doing a tremendous job, a fantastic job. Um, of course, we'd like to go out there and just help everybody stay off their phones. But right now we want to make our mark on the world in our own small little way on this demographic that we, are, that we understand best. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. I just got a question come in um, on this topic. Uh, Meg asks, uh, are there any plans to expand this concept into more screen spaces such as TVs, gaming consoles, things like that? Um, it's extremely hard to track uh, lock time on a TV, um, but perhaps on like a PC or like a desktop or a laptop or something like that. That's, that's something that we have explored as well. Um, at present time today, and just this is again a feature of our part of the world, here in Asia, young people seem to have skipped the laptop generation and gone straight to mobile devices. So laptop, uh, just laptop uh, adoption is lower than smartphone adoption. So which is why smartphones are just our number one focus. But we have looked at other devices as well. So desktops, laptops, PCs, hopefully sometime in the future. Wow, yeah. And um, so do you have, uh, is there anything else going on for you or are you just laser focused right now with, with Lock and Stock? I mean, you mentioned get your master's. Is that something on the horizon for you or are you done with school? You're just helping other students now? What's uh, going on? Pro probably, probably not, probably not. Um, I work, in a good week, I work 70 hours. In a bad week, I work 110 hours. So I have no time for a master's degree. We're also, I think, about a month away from closing our Series A round of capital, of capital raise. And with that, you know, we significantly expand our team, onboard a lot of new tech talent, ops people as well, because this entire thing is, is demand-based, right? Students lock their phones because they get something. And the better the rewards we can give students, the more they will lock their phones, the more lock and stock will spread. So we're hopefully, you know, fingers crossed within a month or so we raise our series a and from there the sky's the limit honestly wow truly so we have a couple minutes left you know i would love to hear you talked a little bit about to the other young entrepreneurs out there you know of keeping keeping focused and, and staying true to the, their passion is there any other advice that you could offer up to people that are maybe have an idea or mm -hmm. afraid to do it or or stalled point or, you know, any, any sort of things that came up for you when you were starting out um, that you think that you wish you had heard from someone when you were starting out? Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember I was 20 years old, just thinking about lock and stock, you know, should we do this? Should we not? Should I actually take this leap of faith? And around that time, I came across a very, very, very powerful anecdote by Jeff Bezos, right, who is, I think, to me at least, the greatest entrepreneur of all time. Um, and Jeff Bezos, actually, I don't know, I, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Jeff Bezos was you know, 32 or 33 in his mid 30s, working as an investment banker in New York. And he actually he had a wife and kids um, and he actually left his job in New York, took his wife and kids, sold his house in New York, moved all the way across the country to Seattle to launch Amazon. At that point in time, he had no money. I don't know how investment banking is a very high paying profession, but he had no money, took a loan from his parents, bought a house, launched Amazon in his garage. We've all seen the pictures and whatever, you know, the rest is history. But a couple of years later, a reporter actually asked him, the reporter said, Jeff, you know, why, why did you do this? Like, what a crazy life decision when you're 33 years old. And Jeff Bezos said, and something that, that I, I hold near and dear and I advise any other young entrepreneur 
do hold near and dear. Jeff Bezos said, my one rule in life is regret minimization. I don't want to wake up someday when I'm 50 years old or 60 years old or 70 years old and think to myself, damn, you know, I wish I'd done this or why didn't I do that? Or, you know, what if I had actually given this a shot? Jeff Bezos said, I never want to have that thought ever in my life. So if I wanted to do something, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Regret minimization right there. I came across this story and I was like, you know what? This is for me. This is a problem. We need to solve this problem. If it works, that's awesome. If it doesn't work, no problem, literally. Um, so for any young entrepreneur out there who's maybe torn between, okay, fine, you know, corporate life or masters or entrepreneurship or whatever, just remember to yourself, regret minimization. I love that. I love that. And I love just, you know, giving it a shot because you're not going to know unless you try. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. And so I, I have one last question, um, you know, in the spirit of people starting new companies and stuff like that. And we were talking about, oh, there could be different spinoffs and you want to stay focused. You know, for those that have ideas that are maybe similar to something that's already out there and that's maybe <clears throat> holding them back. Um, they're like, oh, well, something like this already exists. What do you what do you say to those people? Because, you know, there's everyone's got an idea for an app and some of them seem so similar, but it also might be holding somebody back from making something. Yeah, right. So there's there's always going to be um, there's always going to be pre-existing versions, as you yourself, Hunter, pointed out. For like locking your phone, most applications out there are like shaming people, like you know, oh, stay off your phone, whatever. Those applications actually exist. Um, it's just about doing something better, right? So Amazon, I think, was the 31st e-commerce platform. Facebook was the sixth, um, the sixth uh, social media network. Google was, I think, the 12th uh, search engine. So there's always, there's always existing stuff, right? It takes someone truly remarkable to think of something extremely new. But I think the mark of true entrepreneurship is taking an amazing idea that may have been already implemented or deployed, but in a bad manner and doing it well. And that's what we do here at Lock and Stock. That's what all those other guys did as well. I'm not comparing myself with them, they're, they're legends. Uh, but that's what we did here at Lock and Stock. And if, if there is something that exists, that doesn't mean it's the end of the world. All you got to do is do it better. That's been done time and time again. Awesome. That's great advice. And uh, I love, too, that you just knew off the top of your head that the data points, if they were this number and they were that number, I'm like, here's a guy that does <laughs> research, too. So that really shines through in, in what you do. Well, uh, Craig, this has been an amazing conversation. To wrap up, can you tell us how to connect with you or with Lock and Stock websites, any other thing you'd like to connect? Uh, our audience to you and lock and stock or anything else you got going on yeah yeah you know so um <clears throat> we are a free mobile application we're on the app store or on the play store look us up on our website www.lockandstock.app otherwise look me up on linkedin if you have anything that you want to discuss or talk about if you're a young entrepreneur i would honestly love to hear from you dm me when you get the chance look me up on linkedin message me um, I'd love to hear from you. But otherwise, uh, thank you so much for your time, Hunter. Thanks to the entire Power to Fly team. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you, Craig. Thank you for your time. It was wonderful to talk with you. And we, with that, we will pass it back over to Meg. Hi, guys. That was absolutely wonderful. I loved that chat. I'm, abs I'm so, so curious now. Can't wait to go um, check out your app and see uh, you know, how many of my friends and family I'll be recommending that they download. So thank you so much for that. Um, Thanks a lot, guys. As, uh, as we move on into our next chat, um, I want to say, uh, you know, if you are looking to earn um, continuing education credits from the Society of Human Resource Managers for this session or any of our sessions today, um, take a look at the code that's in the upper left-hand corner of the slide in front of you. Now, if, um, if anybody is maybe just now joining us, I wanna say hello and welcome. You have made it just in time for the end of day two of Power to Fly's Diversity Reboot 2021 Virtual Summit Series. July's theme is Tech for Social Impact, and we have been having some amazing conversations uh, yesterday and today. So hopefully um, y'all have gotten a chance to, to take in some of those. And if not, you can always catch the, um, the replay on our recordings when we start posting those next week. Now, um, as we move on into this upcoming conversation, I want to highlight that if you have questions or comments for the panel, please share them in the Zoom, or sorry, in the group chat on the right-hand side of your screen. It's right over here. 
Um, if you are looking to earn SHRM credits from today's talk, you can take a look at the code that's in the upper left hand corner of the slide in front of you. And um, if you have any kind of technical issues or something that you would like help from the Power to Fly team for, please feel free to tag myself. Um, my colleague Patricia is also in the chat. We're happy to try and help you out if you have any kind of tech issues. Um, last but not least, make sure you refer yourself to the code of conduct. We're gonna put that into the group chat here in just a moment. It's just there to um, ensure that this session as well as all of our virtual events are a great experience for everyone involved. Now, I am really excited to introduce our speakers, but I believe the person gonna, that's going to be introducing them to you is our one of our co-founders, Catherine Zaleski. So Catherine, would you like to take it away? I would, I would. So um, of course, I've just lost my script as soon as you hand it over to me, but it's the day. So anyway, I thank you so much. I'm back again. Um, after more than 24 hours of opening up yet another fantastic summit at Power to Fly, this one focused on tech for social good. And we are ending today with a uh, esteemed panel of people who are at the forefront of this topic. We are going to be led once again by Lisi Do Canto, uh, who is a tireless panel leader, thought leader, overall wonderful human being and advisor. He also has a day job, which is more like a 24 hour job as the managing director for APCO Worldwide in Washington, DC. And Lisi and the team at APCO have put together this fantastic panel on how the tech industry can build a more inclusive future. And we come to work every day at Power to Fly with, with this mission, much of this mission in mind. And we know that there are so many leaders out there working on the same plane as we are. And yet it's rare that we get to hear what they're doing across multiple sectors on one panel within one hour. So I'm going to be taking a lot of notes today. Uh, with that said, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Lisi. And thank you very much to this esteemed panel for taking the time to share how we can not only create rep uh, increased representation in tech, but also retention for a truly inclusive future. Lisi? Thank you so much, Catherine, and welcome everyone. And, and we're back at the kitchen table, as you've heard me talk about before, two kinds of conversations that my friends in the South talk about, one that happens out in the deck, which is the more casual, and the one that happens around the kitchen table where the serious and hard uh, thinking and hard pro provoking questions are asked. That's what we're gonna have today for the next 60 minutes. Couldn't ask for a better, more dynamic uh, and extraordinary group of leaders to have that conversation with. And, then Clarence Clayton and Jennifer Madriaga, two outstanding leaders at Red Hat. And of course, Pamela Passman, uh, a former senior executive at Microsoft and Bob Winslow, former senior executive at Oracle, but together also part of the APCO um, family table as well as the International Advisory Council. If you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat. We'll be taking them along the way. And uh, I will be uh, talking with the, the panels, uh, panelists here um, uh, on all kinds of things, but we welcome your, your thoughts uh, as we get underway here um, today. Um, I want to start, um, and, my, and I want to ask, because I cannot see the panelists. There we are. If the panelists can turn on their cameras. Jenny, thank you. Thank you, Clarence, Bob, and Helen. Thank you all. All right, now we're all live. We're all in the same room. I hope you guys are having a great day. Let's jump right in um, to, the, to the conversation. Jen, I want to start with you. You've been working on these issues for a long time. You play an enormous role uh, in supporting the work on diversity, equity, inclusion at uh, Red Hat. And as I had been thinking about this panel, I, I thought about an article uh, in The Economist that was an open letter to the tech industry that concluded uh, a lot of talk, a lot of initiatives, not much action in terms of movement of the needle. Um, that was an article that was posted, uh, if you will, two years ago. And here we are today and almost pretty much you could say the same thing. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what do you think uh, is important for us to be, as we get to this conversation today, what does an inclusive future at a tech company look like to you? Jenny. Yeah, well, first of all, I wanna thank you, Lisi, for having me uh, be a part of this panel today. Um, I also wanna share a bit of fun trivia. I've actually known Lisi uh, since we were both college students. 
months at age 17. Sarah released you with braces. So uh, <laughs> it's been really, really gratifying to be able to reconnect uh, with Lisi on, on the work and inclusion. Um, so it's really interesting you mentioned that article in The Economist because that was actually an article that was reshared with me recently um, by my sister. She's actually an attorney and also working uh, with issues related to diversity, equity, inclusion in her own industry. Um, but one of the things that strikes me today about what's going on, um, not just within the industry, but also globally, is that people seem to to be ready to have conversations um, that they weren't ready to have before. And the inclusion aspect of uh, technology, well, I, I don't think I'm telling anything new by saying that um, there are issues within tech. Um, there are issues uh, within my own company at Red Hat in terms of uh, trying to build a more diverse um, and equitable and inclusive workforce. Um, and so what I hope an inclusive uh, future looks like um, is one where representation matters not just um, by numbers, but also by engaging in very authentic and difficult conversations. We acknowledge the life experiences of the people that are working in the industry and also acknowledging the voices that we have yet to bring in to the industry. And I think that part is also really, really key. Um, one of the priorities for me um, are issues related to intersectionality making sure that we amplify each other's voices. I'm the current chair of the Asian Network. I'm so glad to have my colleague, uh, Clarence Clayton, who's the current chair for, um, for BUILD, Blacks Unite in Leadership and Diversity. Um, and you know, I'm really, really gratified that people are willing to partner in that way. And those partnerships, I think, are the wave of the future, um, as well as the difficult conversations. And Lucy, I'm so glad that you talked about these difficult kitchen table conversations. I think we're in the process of learning how to have those in tech. Um, and I'm very, very hopeful and optimistic, or I wouldn't be engaged in this work, that we can affect change. Thank you for your leadership. And thank you for reminding everyone that I once had braces uh, so many years ago. <laughs> um, Bob Winslow, you spent a lot of time in this industry, in and out, obviously also working on questions of equity and inclusion. Uh, in your former life at Oracle and certainly here uh, at APCO. Why is building a more equitable and inclusive future in the tech industry so important to, to you? And, and how do we get at what Jenny just talked about, really looking at this question of intersectionality? Hi, everybody. And Lisi, thanks for inviting all of us to uh, join you in this conversation. Um, I was excited about uh, the invite, not because I feel like I'm a responsible executive who's been in tech for 30 years and frankly worked, been privileged to work for a lot of companies that um, had founders who were very sensitive to a better company is a company that has a diverse conversation. Um, at Oracle, Larry surrounded himself with Sapper Katz, uh, CEO, General Counsel, Doreen Daly, um, Joyce Westerdahl, Head of HR, uh, Judy Sim, CMO, all terrific female leaders. And, and I always felt privileged sitting around that, that table. Um, but but I'm, I have to admit, I'm a little bit embarrassed and to your point about the kitchen table conversation. Um, Frankly, I, I think I was a little bit naive until last year. Um, not just the events, the tragic events um, uh, that inspired so many um, uh, changes uh, for, for individuals and companies, but um, kind of the, the, the movement that has been built around that. You know, we all read like, Fragility, or how to be an anti-racist, or watch the documentary Thirteen, or or um, spent time. Uh, uh, a friend of mine, John Ford, who runs, uh, who's on Tech Check with CNBC, has a has um, the course, which is about uh, Black history. Um, but for me, what happened was uh, in my local community, we had a business that was um, being uh, discriminated against, uh, shut down in many ways. And um, it's the first time I got locally involved in my community. 
um, and, and part of the conversation that ultimately led to a change in the police force, a change in how we approach discrimination in our community. And it was the first time I really felt like, okay, we have to start at a local level. Local could be your own local company or the community you live in, but we have to make it personal. And, and we, we have to not rely on policy or scorecards. Uh, we have to make sure our leadership has taking this initiative personally. And so for me, that, that's uh, a change that came out of the, the pandemic that is very positive for me. I think I'm a better individual. I'm a more connected and educated individual and I'm committed to do what I can to make a change. And I just think, I agree with you that, that Economist article two years ago, have we done enough yet? I'm an optimist, Lisa, as you know, I think we are starting to do more and we're going to see more stories about the change that's that's happening in tech. Kind of as well, are we doing enough, and why, for you, is it important to to be to be doing more in terms of building an equitable, inclusive future? You spent a lot, a lot of years uh, in the industry and continue to do a lot of work uh, in and around the industry on the broader issues of social impact and diversity, equity, inclusion. You know, why are we two years later still having this conversation? Um, and, and, and what does that future of equity and inclusive tech industry look like for you? Uh, thank you, Lisi, and, and to my fellow panelists. Uh, this is a terrific conversation and I appreciate being part of it. Um, you know, we, we want a future where everyone feels uh, a part of it, feels connected, feels like they're contributing to it. And, and we are receiving the benefit of everybody's contribution. Um, the, the tech industry uh, is certainly not satisfied where it is. Uh, the law of small numbers continues to make this really challenging. Uh, and so it is critical that we stay focused on it. And we actually bring new ways of thinking uh, to drive more inclusion uh, in, in, in our sector. And I, I think there's a lot of things that we need to think about, what I would call top down and bottom up. Uh, I think our leaders need to lead with grace and really appreciate uh, that they need to approach things in different ways, that uh, you know, the, the people that we wanna bring into our companies uh, are very different, have very different perspectives, come, come to us with different levels of knowledge and experience, and we need to meet them where they are and help them where they wanna go. Um, and also a bottom-up approach. Uh, more and more in the tech, tech sector, we're seeing um, allyship really blossom uh, and all levels of an organization understand that they have a role to play, that their voice matters, that they have a, a, a way to impact and change how their institutions live day to day. So it's something that really um, is, is frustrating at its core level. Um, it's something that I know the industry has been focused on, but has not had those really kind of clinic that like really what is gonna change uh, to really change how the industry looks and feels, its tone, its manner, its people. Clarence, you have been doing this work and in the trenches, so to speak, for, for quite some time. Um, tell us a little bit about where your leadership at Red Hat, what, what is BUILD, um, your legacy, uh, in, in getting to the point where you now lead, among other things, uh, this work at Red Hat. Um, and then tell us, for you, what does building an inclusive, equitable future look like? Thank you so much, Lisi, for the opportunity, and, and Jennifer as well, um, for, for bringing me into this, this wonderful opportunity. So the BUILD community um, began about, BUILD stands for Blacks United in Leadership and Diversity, as Jen said. And our story began about six years ago. When I came to Red Hat, uh, I noticed that the, 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 the Black Red Hatters, if you will, weren't a very connected community. And I questioned why that was. And I think there was a, an, a, a need, a desire to want to connect and just not sure how to do it. And a group of us got together and just started having conversations, just really building community and fellowship with each other first. 
um, which was the beginning of, of something truly special over the last six years. Out of this has become um, a, a wonderful community that is thriving with um, energy and creativity and passion and commitment to making Red Hat's culture more diverse and more inclusive. Over the last 12 months, especially the allyship interest in our work has just exploded. And, and that's a good problem to have, uh, but also a daunting um, challenge at times to try to figure out what does that engagement of, of people and the activation of ally, allies actually look like um, without being overrun with that, because you can be consumed by trying to educate people who want to help. Um, and it's not maybe necessarily your responsibility to educate them, but you want to meet people where they are and try to bring them along on the journey and allow them to be a part of the change that is so, so very necessary. And I'm thankful that, that, that our build community shows up in such a vibrant and colorful way. We own the fact that we represent a, a, a small but mighty constituency within Red Hat. We do a lot of work to talk about the causes that are important to us and what we want the company to care about each and every day and are just trying to shift the narrative and shift the conversation. I say all the time to your question about what is a diverse and inclusive future in tech look like? It needs to look like the world in which we live from your board of directors to your executive leadership team, to your management ranks, to the early talent coming in the door. It all needs to be representative of the world that we live in and just be a microcosm of, of the society that the company operates in. And I wanna pull on that thread of, of saying every level, I think Pamela said that every level, everybody plays a role in this success. You can't just focus on the top. You also can't just focus on the bottom. You can, what is they say, walk and chew gum at the same time. That's absolutely the case. We need to be hitting on all cylinders and investing in every level of the company's uh, diversity um, so that the next generation of people coming into this organization in any organization will be um, well positioned to, to make a difference and bring about the change that's needed. Thank you so much, Clarence. Uh, Jenny, I, I can't help but to, but notice that, of course, you and Clarence have the red hat in your in your backdrops. For those of us in the audience uh, who may not know as much about Red Hat, tell us a little bit about who Red Hat is. What do you do, and and a little bit more about the work you're doing to represent such a large constituency together with Clarence. Um, tell us a little bit about the Asian network as well. But first, what is Red Hat? And, and why do you both have a Red Hat hanging? Is that a, is that a company policy? Uh, the, the Red Hat fedora is something that's given to every employee when they first come to Red Hat. And Red Hat is most well known for the most used software in the world that most people don't know about. And that's a software called Linux. Um, if you use anything related to the internet, if you do online banking, if you watch uh, a movie on the plane, uh, if your hospital uses uh, uh, an EMR, it is most likely running on top of Linux. Um, most desktop users have never heard of Linux, but Linux is prevalent in everything uh, and things like banking, the stock exchange, you name it. Uh, the Red Hat would like to be known for more than just Linux, and I'll put that little plug in there too. Um, one thing that Red Hat is very well known for uh, is the fact that it is an open source company. We're the most successful open source company in the world. Uh, and the tenant of Red Hat is that things are built on community, which I think um, is a very special thing. And I think Clarence can agree with that. Um, my work is engaging with open source communities um, within the office of the CTO, within the open source program office. Um, I'm actually embedded within the marketing organization, uh, but my work is on community building. And so the work that I do with the Asian network is actually not too different from the day-to-day -day that I do at Red Hat, uh, which is working with a, a variety of open source communities. And what does open source community mean? What are the values associated with being an open source community? Transparency, respect, 
collaboration. Uh, and those are the things that I bring into the work that I do at Asian Network. Um, the Asian Network is a very new um, organization. Uh, we were um, motivated by the events of the pandemic um, and the events of last year uh, to, to come together. There were five of us that came together um, that had an informal conversation. We realized that we needed an official organization uh, in which to build a platform to advocate on behalf of Asian associates um, within North America and also globally. And it was a really, really hard journey. Um, any, doing this kind of work is hard because first of all, you're all volunteers. Um, and so there's a lot of emotional labor that's voluntary. And as Clarence said, uh, sometimes we're tasked with having to educate leadership about issues they may have never ever thought about. To have to include uh, into their you know, repertoire experiences that they may have never personally experienced. And to let people know about the fact, uh, especially because the line between the workplace and home completely disappeared in the past year. The fact that we were bringing the things that happened to us in our personal lives directly into the workplace. So that line completely disappeared last year and it compelled me and others um, to, do the, to do the work with the Asian Network, uh, to educate our colleagues about the fact that their, their Asian colleagues may be experiencing duress, trauma, stress, do the things that were happening um, because of the pandemic. Um, and then of course, were all the conversations that happened um, around George Floyd. Um, we had it within the marketing organization. And that's when I realized, you know what? We need to have a conversation across the company with all of our different communities. And I want to be able to represent my community and the pandemic effects that were happening related to anti-Asian violence. Um, we launched our community in February of this year, right before the Atlanta shootings. Um, and so the timing in that way um, was really good for our community because they had a space to gather, to talk about these things that were painful to talk about the fact that they were worried about their elderly parents. Um, and then Clarence and then his um, co-chair Corin um, have been awesome as have the other chairs of the DEI communities where we talk about these conversations about the fact that we are now having to bring our full selves to work because that line has completely disappeared just by virtue of working from home, right? And, and, and that's the thing that probably is the upside to the pandemic is that it's catalyzed these conversations that nobody really wanted to have, but we have to have them now. And you know, from what I've heard from colleagues, uh, not just at Red Hat, but from around the uh, world, from other companies, I'm really grateful to, to get the advice from other uh, employee resource groups from other tech companies um, is that people are ready. They may not always be comfortable, but they're ready. Um, and I think that that's super, super important to note um, that there's going to be discomfort around these conversations. There's discomfort about moving forward. But as long as we're united in the fact that we're building a community together, you know, not just between um, associates or underrepresented and majority um, associates. Um, that we're actually here to build a better community together, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, try, I'm not trying to be cheesy, but I actually really believe it. I believe it because I can see the story that everyone brings to the table, not just my story, but I can see Clarence's story. You know, I, I know Bob has his own story. I know Pamela has her own story. And Lisey, I know you have your own story too. Uh, and that's what I think a lot of this work will entail a lot of storytelling, not just storytelling, but a lot of listening and leaning in uh, from folks to where all this content is really, really needed them. And sometimes the revelation is very, very painful, right? Like I had no idea any of this was going on. Um, but, you know, at least for me personally, I'm here to hold space for people's learning and I'm, I'm holding space for this, this evolution that's yet to come uh, where tech will finally be represented, representative of the world that we live in, as Clarence said. Jenny, you talked about several very important points in, in your conversation. One of them uh, is having these uncomfortable conversations, which is what we're having at the kitchen table here. I, I put it another way. The, this is the walking around with the pebble in your shoe. It's going to feel widely uncomfortable. For some of us, that pebble is very big. 
And for others, it's, it's not, but nonetheless, uncomfortable, but important conversations to have. And how important as you and Clarence have touched on in terms of the importance of education. And, and Bob, I, I want to ask you, you know, so much of, of, of what we do um, in this journey of, of, of diversity, equity, inclusion, as, as Dr. Kendi has said, is like we transform ourselves in order to transform society. But part of that's also holding ourselves accountable, which is one of the questions that's come through the panelists. In your time at Oracle and your work right now in advising uh, CEOs and other C-suite executives across corporate America on, on these issues and many others, you know, wh whose responsibility is it um, to educate uh, on what's happening and and what is the question around accountability that that Joe asks uh, in in the chat here you know what does that look like um, and feel like for for leaders and, and and he puts it mostly white mostly male in tech Bob uh, yeah well look um, I would say that uh, uh, you know, we're, we're communicators, we see. Uh, we work in a business where we help our clients effectively um, execute their strategy uh, through how well they communicate internally and externally. Uh, and what I can tell you is that CEOs, whether uh, it's Bill McDermott at ServiceNow, formerly SAP, or Sasan Ghadarzi at Intuit, Tim Cook at Apple, um, many of them have diversity reports that they kicked off around this time last year. Right. Um, in talking with all of them and preparing for this uh, panel, all of them have said they're not doing enough. So I said, so what are you going to do about that? And, um, and I think one of the things we learned about uh, events uh, over the last 18 months is systemic racism will not just change because we have a strategy in place. We actually have to have new systems and, and new choices we make. And, and, there, and some of that's starting to happen. There's, there's vendor diversity initiatives where the, in the Valley, people just won't do business with you if you have a certain don't have a certain makeup on, on your board or in your, your leadership team or in your, 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 the folks that, you know, your staff. Uh, there's um, surprisingly to me, um, when I was looking at companies that are lauded for their, their progress, GitLab showed up for the points that uh, Jenny and Clarence were talking about, which is a decision they made that they're a microcosm of the 100,000 customers they deal with around the world, and they want to have an environment that looks like that. Um, we need more than a scorecard. And we need a, a, you know, procedures in place that said businesses are not going to operate the way they used to. Um, that has to be defined. It still isn't there yet. It's just starting. Um, the conversation we're having right now, not just today, but in our environment and the leadership that is sensitive and determined to make this part of their generation, I believe we'll get there. Um, but we can't, we can't just have this conversation and go back to work. Bob, I wanna stay for just a second. Y you played an extraordinary role at Oracle. Tell us a little bit about that. You mentioned Larry, I, I, I know we know who you're talking about, but for our audience who doesn't, tell us about your time uh, there, the role you played, um, so we have a deeper understanding of, of the legacy that is so rich um, that you bring to the conversation. Yeah, certainly. Um, one of the career highlights for sure. And Jenny, to your point, um, Anybody who uses Oracle technology is running uh, a Linux kernel as their operating system. Uh, 400,000 customers of Oracle. Um, and, and you know they think more about the database, but, but the operating system. Linux is everywhere. Red Hat is the leader in, in that field. And so um, the, the impact of open source and Linux is, is just broad and vast. And I always was proud of that because um, uh, I used to be involved with uh, another open source provider. 
in my career. I will tell you that the interesting thing about it, showing up at Oracle, um, and I'll speak uncomfortably about a few topics, but um, but I think they're important, is that uh, of the 140,000 employees, we did not have enough diversity and we weren't doing enough about it. And it took lawsuits, discrimination lawsuits to make it an agenda item that went all the way to the board level. Um, we had uh, Me Too challenges. We were right in the heart of the Me Too movement and, and harassment claims and so forth. These are things that global companies deal with all the time, but when you're in the middle of those, you're, you're challenged with, you know, how to, what's our position on that? And you have to go see the founder and say, let's talk about those issues. Um, I, my boss, Mark Hurd, ultimately uh, died of a terminal illness which I had to protect during the time I was there, his personal privacy. Uh, the world is complicated. And you, just to be clear, you are the chief communications officer for Oracle. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it was a ongoing conversation of our responsibility on these important topics, our response. But I would say that the one thing about tech that we can't forget is it is determined whether it likes it or not to be leaders. Our role, tech is leadership. Uh, we, we are out there with the biggest market caps in the world for a reason. Um, and what comes with that is responsibility to be adult about it. And, and that was the, the pleasure that I had in, in managing on a regular basis with Oracle. It was, it was the right of a lifetime. Pamela, tell us a little bit more about your time in your role at Microsoft. Of course, you've continued and, and gone on to do many, many other extraordinary things, but your time at, at Microsoft um, and your perspective on uh, essentially what we've been talking about here is accountability and what Bob talked about were steps to hold accountable uh, Oracle at that time for, for the many reasons that Bob talked about. What's what was that role that you played? You have extraordinary visibility and legacy in the tech industry, given that, and help us understand that, and, and then your perspective on accountability. Thank you, thank you, Lisi. Um, I, I had a broad role across, uh, as Deputy General Counsel, I had a broad role across a number of our engagements uh, externally with, with the governments, uh, with with communities, with academia, um, uh, with a whole host of, of, of key stakeholders, as well as working very closely with uh, Microsoft's business partners, which is a huge part uh, of its business model. And so uh, we recognize that we, we as, as Bob said, we had an opportunity um, and really a necessity to be a leader on a whole host of issues. And I think was what was critically important um, was really understanding the data, if you will, really understanding and being transparent about where we were, uh, but also being ambitious about where we wanted to go and, 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 and being very clear about the roles and responsibilities. Uh, and as, the, as, a, as the, you pose the question, accountability. Um, so ensuring that you know, we were transparent, we were ambitious, that um, managers and leaders performance was based on their achievements in terms of this space, um, that all of the hiring practices included um, a responsibility to have a diverse play, um, slate and a diverse, uh, not only a diverse slate, but a diverse interview process. Um, and it really needed to permeate and be embedded across all of our business practices and integral to the business strategy. And it played an important role in, in compensation decisions. Um, and so it really needs to be, as I said, embedded in the business. And uh, I see this today. I'm on the board of a, a public company, a, a, a SaaS supply chain planning company. And at the board level, it's critical that we ask these questions, that we get certain data on a routine basis, that we have aspirations on where we want to see the company go in the short term, in the medium term. And so that it's something that is part of the muscle that we're building across the organization, and at the bottom, at the bottom line is that our leaders are held accountable for this. Again, through their compensation, promotion, uh, etc. Clarence, 
I was reading a study recently that showed that combined Black and Latinx employees represent just three to 5% of all the employees at the 23 highest grossing tech companies, which I have to take into account. Three of them are Red Hat, Oracle, and Microsoft, but I don't, I don't know. I can't remember. But the, nonetheless, 3%. The question for you, Clarence, is what are the barriers as we talk about, as Pamela just did, in terms of recruitment and getting uh, talent, diverse, equitable, inclusive talent into tech uh, here? You know, what, is that, what is the systemic barrier that is leading to this recent study that shows how few and far between um, these two constituencies, uh, Black and Latinx, are represented? And more importantly, is when we think about education, how do we create, in your view, and, and, and I wanna open this up in a moment to the rest of the panel, more opportunity for more diversity in, in tech and to get into, into tech and, and make career advancement more equitable, inclusive. Let's start with the first. What are these barriers that lead to three to 5%? And then how do we address that um, from mm. a career advancement standpoint? Um, you know, of course, colleges and others are doing a lot of that work, but there's a, there's something wrong here. What's your perspective and how do we get out of it? We could spend the next 23 minutes on this one. There's so much to unpack. I'll start with one here. A lot of times word of mouth, employee referrals are the way that a lot of people come into organizations. And guess what I hear and see with my own eyes? People tend to stay in community with people who look like them. So when you already have an organization that has a diversity problem and you say, hey, bring me your friends, refer your people that in your network, you're just gonna get more people who probably look like the people already in the organization and you're not gonna be doing very much to address your diversity problem. So think that's a particular issue, though, in, in tech. Is that what you're suggesting? I think that tech in general is less diverse than maybe some other industries. And so therefore. It's more pervasive um, because of the underlying issues with diversity that already exist in the tech industry, certainly. Um, so that would be one thing that I would say in terms of, you know, different ways to confront that problem. I'm going to hit the accountability piece and then another, you know, one idea. I um, certainly want to hear from others as well. Leaders are going to have to commit to doing something different to get a different outcome because it's the right thing to do. Even if that doesn't necessarily win them points with some constituencies within their organization, it's the right thing to do. So there is, I think that having leaders and having companies say, we're gonna commit to making these numbers better by X period of time and putting the, the, the goals and the metrics and the tracking and the transparency and the management by objectives around that pay for performance, make, a, make dimensions of diversity and improving diversity pay for performance as well. Absolutely think that that's gotta happen and that intention and commitment has gotta happen at the top. Now, beyond that, investing in you know, recruitment strategies at, at historically Black colleges and universities, when you think about the early talent strategy, I'm a product of an HBCU. I went to North Carolina A&T State University. And one thing that I will tell you, and I have to give kudos to the IBMs of the world, um, the DuPonts of the world, 3M. When I was in college, it's been a few years ago now, I won't completely age myself, but those companies were coming to Greensboro, North Carolina with the intention that they're gonna leave that campus bringing back with job offers and bringing back talent into that organization. Now, the companies that, that, that we have had the opportunity to work for are wonderful, but sometimes we can believe our own press to the point that we think we don't have to work for it. But if you want those three to 5% numbers to move, you're gonna have to work for it. And there's nothing wrong with needing to work for it because it is so very like obvious 
that you know diversity of thought, diversity of perspectives and life experiences make teams better, make communities better and make organizations better. So commitment from the top, investing in programs like you know HBCU recruitment and other you know groups that are committed to creating more exposure and awareness to underserved communities and giving them an on-ramp into um, the tech industry through preparedness. Powerful words, Clarence, powerful words. And 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 I think we all on the panel can completely agree with much of what, if not everything that you that you said. Jenny, I want to take a question now from the audience, um, and I want to continue to encourage the audience. We have 20 minutes about left, um, and so uh, please continue to submit your questions in the chat. This is unique for, for you in particular, uh, and, and Clarence, but I want to direct it toward you, um, is sort of taking a look at your role as, as leaders of ERGs, and what is this... Um, as this uh, audience member asks, sort of what are those challenges and obstacles that you run into as, as leaders of ERGs and, and how do you overcome them? So let's take, in the interest of time, let's take one or two obstacles and then how do you, what advice do you give to other leaders of ERGs in other tech companies or outside in terms of how do you overcome them? Yeah, you know, I, I think the number one question that, that ERGs probably receive is why do you exist? You know, why is there a need for, an ERG, you know, why, why would you want to, I guess, separate yourself out? And, you know, what I want to say is that, you know, when we go to work, at least, you know, in the past, when I've gone to work before um, things shifted very dramatically in the past year, you know, I was very focused on just doing my day-to-day -day job. I was actually traveling about 40% of the year internationally um, for Red Hat. And I didn't have those kinds of conversations previously because um, my attention was elsewhere. And it's, um, like I said, the loss of the delineation between the personal and work environment that really, really catalyzed the conversations that happened for me personally, as well as within the company. Um, and what became very, very clear is that uh, Jenny by herself could not talk about these issues and have them seem relevant to a larger group because people were identifying as, the story of Jenny, an individual story. Maybe it's a one off, maybe it's an outlier, maybe it actually isn't relevant to the company, but I knew that wasn't true. I knew there were other people who had stories like myself that had the same worries as myself, the same concerns as myself. And that was confirmed when I um, met with my, my four other co-founders. And then when we did an informal uh, chat room and just, you know, we weren't even officially launched, we invited people through word of mouth and the, the one thing that people said was, we're so glad that we had the space that we can talk about these things. You know, and there are things that maybe our colleagues don't know how to talk about it. You know, they don't have the vocabulary or the experiences for it, right? Um, and, and part of the challenge of an ERG is demonstrating to leadership, demonstrating to the company, why those experiences matter. You know, why is it relevant to running a business? You know, I, and, and I would say, you know, a healthy, happy employee uh, means someone who's productive, who's a, a very good contributor uh, to the company, if you want to look at it in terms of a commodity um, issue. But, but I think, like Clarence said, I think it's the right thing to do. You know, I think part of what we're, um, you know, evolving into as a society, and, I, and I, I want to thank the millennials and Gen Z for this. I'm a Gen Xer. You know, I was taught to just kind of keep my head down and keep working. But they're, you know, the new generations are, are questioning, it. well, wait a minute, you know, maybe I want to work for a company that represents my values. And do you actually represent my values? You know, so if you're looking towards the future of any company, you have to realize that your workplace is going to be reliant on these generations that are up and coming. And they're asking those sorts of questions and they take it very, very, very seriously. You know, and so I, I think that, that shift in priorities is actually beneficial to all of us. I definitely believe that it's a tide that's been rising all ships uh, because it benefits me, you know, like the Gen Xer who, who uh, kept her head down and just kept working. Now that these questions are being asked, I'm like, you know what? Those are great questions and I'm gonna keep asking them too. You know, and, and I think, you know, that's part of the difficulty of doing ERG is that sometimes you're engaging in work that the company has not engaged in before. It's questions that the leadership our managers have not asked themselves because it's a company 
um, that has a majority and it's not representative of all uh, associates ex uh, experiences right so how do you um, so, how do you how do you on that point there what's what advice do you give the other ERG leaders listening to you right now maybe sitting in a tech company and say okay I'm facing the same thing how do you overcome it yeah, I think this is where the intersectionality and coalition building really comes in. And, um, and that's why I was really, really interested in working uh, with BUILD, uh, but I also work with uh, our neurodiversity group, our pride group, our native and indigenous group, um, our women's leadership community. Um, you know, those folks are really, really important uh, to that journey too. And I think part is a lot of us are working towards the same thing which is to make sure that we increase the visibility of folks and their voices uh, in ways that maybe have not been seen before, you know? And, you know, and part of it too is, you know, like I said, it's the right thing to do, you know? And why is it the right thing to do? Well, you know, work is a big part of our lives. And like I said, we've all, we're all taking work home with us, literally. <laughs> like we're living, you know, in our households, and, you know, and we're working as well as having to manage stuff. I saw earlier in this recording, my 12 year old son, I think ran to the bathroom, forgot that I was talking. And, you know, that's real life intruding, right? Like I, um, I have to manage those things, you know, and, but what it, what it will do is it'll make us, you know, not just better companies, but I think we'll become better people, you know? I, you know and I think it's important for us to become better people uh, for this. And so when I talk to, to leadership, when I talk to folks where they're like, this is completely new to me, I had no idea that this was even a thing um, with experiences related to racism, discrimination, harassment, violence. You know, sometimes people feel like their physical safety is actually threatened. That includes myself. That's revelatory to my colleagues. In fact, they find it very, very, very frightening that that's something that someone that they know actually de deals with that. But the, the thing is, is I realize we have to make those things visible now. Otherwise, you're not addressed, like in return to work frameworks, you know, where people are going to be going back to the office and they may be subject to those threats in cities where the attacks may have happened, right? Mm -hmm. Like leadership actually has to think about that type of stuff. And I think it also contributes to better technology. Right. You know, there are and very many instances where, you know, including that in the conversation makes our technology better. And, and Bob, I want to talk to you about that uh, better technology. Of course, we've seen technology that has the capacity to bring us all together, be a great convener, and then, of course, technology that can separate and, and divide us. Let's talk about better technology platforms um, and what you think companies can do to better align products and services to more effectively uh, embrace the DEI aspirations that those companies and society at large is, is wanting them to? Um, and I, I want to answer that. I, I want to double click on something Jenny just said, if, if, if I can real quickly, is that an obstacle in, that I know we faced at Oracle and I see in advising clients um, is the fear of showing up as my whole self where I work. Uh, so creating this environment of trust is, if there's one thing that we can all do, it's creating that trust and celebrating being able to show up uh, as your whole self. Uh, and Lisa, you know this in my background from uh, work we've done at APCO, that I had a, a, a startling moment in my, my life in, in college. I'm Hispanic. Uh, you wouldn't know it with the last name Winslow, but I'm Hispanic. And um, uh, throughout my career, I was always afraid coming off of that experience to express the fact I was Hispanic. Um, and um, so we have a, t a moment in time to, to create this environment of trust and safety that allows people to show up. Um, to your point about um, technology, uh, uh, interesting um, uh, fact in that there's uh, so much focus on artificial intelligence and uh, not just algorithms, but um, creating uh, text, creating narrative. Uh, GPT-3 is a, a, one of the languages that gets a lot of the headlines. And guess what it does? It, it, it scours the, the, the known discourse uh, in the public domain. And so people enter a few lines of code or a few questions and they can generate an entire um, uh, uh, blog or an entire book 
guess what it's replicating? The bias and the discrimination that already exists in our narrative. Um, and, and we're aware of this. And, and one of the areas as we look at artificial intelligence and machine learning is how do we make sure we're not replicating the discrimination that exists in our uh, conversation already? And, and there's work being done to, to do that. But uh, that's just one area because we have a future with artificial intelligence. And, and this is going to be the dominant thing of our generation at, at some point, And we have to step up to that from a technology standpoint. Pamela, there are questions that has come in, which is about how do you, as what Bob has just said, essentially, how do you envision prioritizing or reprioritizing as this audience member is asking community and DEI in the technology itself, you know, and how to bring forth new information and ideas as this uh, audience member is asking. What's your thought? <clears throat> well, the, I, mean, I think the technology sector has realized in, in the last year and a half that we are a very privileged sector. Uh, most of us are knowledge workers and we could work from home. Um, and so that this idea of just about access to technology, we're sort of, sort of coming back to basics. Um, and that fundamentally, you know, the industry has a responsibility to ensure that everyone has access to technology. And so we're seeing in, in, in the United States and other countries, you know, governments more focused on just basic broadband services and making sure that everybody has access to them. Uh, and the industry has a huge role to play not only to, to uh, ensure access, but that, that, that using the technology is meaningful to, you know, based on your different skill set levels, based on different kinds of disabilities that you might have, you know, and based on very different perspectives that you bring to the use of technology. So all of this, I think we're, we're going to, I think we are, and we will be going through the next few years, uh, I hopefully a renaissance on how we think about the use of technology. Um, you know, the, uh, the economics of the industry have been very strong, even during these really challenging times. And I think there's a great sense of how can we reinvest in our industry uh, so that it is more accessible, more meaningful, more useful to, to everyone on the planet. Clarence, Jenny, Pamela talked about the use of technology and, and making it better, more accessible for everyone something that's on all of our minds these days, particularly those who have the, the privilege of working from home and are waiting to return, if you will, to the workplace. Technology, of course, plays an enormous role uh, in that return to the workplace. How is, and we just have a few minutes here, so if we could be brief, how is Red Hat approaching this question of, of return to the workplace as it, re as it relates to equitable use of technology an inclusive return to to the to the workplace. Clarence, I'll hit it really briefly. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that before the pandemic, Red Hat was a very remote friendly company, and I think I don't have the exact numbers, but I think I've heard up to twenty five to thirty percent of our workforce was remote even before the pandemic, and we pivoted beautifully. Um, in the midst of very challenging circumstances, you know, called up our vendors, got us a little bit more bandwidth, and then our infrastructure was ready to go. And because we were already such a remote friendly organization, we quickly adapted to this, you know, fully virtual model, which is, you know, really wonderful to see. Even for the communities, we haven't missed a beat. Um, the build community, in fact, thrived um, during that time. And, and, and use that technology to stay connected to each other when we were all supposed to be physically distant. Technology was able to still keep us connected as a community, which was wonderful. Last point I'll really make really quickly. Thankful for the fact that you know, our leadership has made it clear this return to work strategy uh, will be implemented in a way that is you know, comfortable to the associate. You know What it is that works well for you um, you'll be enabled to do it. If you want to return to the office, there'll be the means to do that. If you want to be able to continue to work remotely, the opportunity is there. And we've shown that we could still be a successful organization in this remote and, and virtual world. Clarence, thank you. And thank you for telling us uh, how 
Red Hat was already ahead of the curve in terms of remote work um, and really being a model for how successful you can run a, a global tech company, of course, uh, with that model. Um, in the few minutes that we have uh, less is le left in our kitchen table conversation, I, I want to go back to where I started with the the article from the Economist. It it while it the key takeaway was that not much has happened um, to move the needle, despite all of the initiatives and actions. The 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 key takeaway from that conversation. Um, that the most important person that could have the single greatest impact on a company in tech uh, uh, influence on DEI is the chief uh, executive officer and the executive. So Bob Winslow and Pam, uh, I want to ask you in particular, in your work with the International Advisory Council here at, at APCO and, and, and throughout your career, um, what advice would you give today's tech CEO in terms of how to optimally address what we're talking about here today in terms of building a more equitable, inclusive and diverse um, tech company, considering you both spent so much time, Bob with Larry Ellison, the CEO of Oracle and Pam, you with the, the CEO and senior executives at Microsoft, you have great insight. What Starting with you, Bob, what advice would you give? We have just about uh, two minutes, so one minute each. Thank you. Sure, um, and, and by the way, uh, the great thing about um, open source and Red Hat is exactly what uh, both of these guys described. They have CEOs that have led companies that are distributed and built communities across you know, virtual environments. And this is one thing that we believe you know, the pandemic has created is that the opportunity to, to go into neighborhoods that are underprivileged or under sourced will be easier. Uh, the one piece of advice, um, uh, empathy. Uh, have empathy towards your customers and your employees. Create an environment of, of trust and, and, and safety and being able to have this conversation and know that your career can thrive. Thank you, Pam. Pamela, what advice would you have for, for today's tech CEO in this respect with the AI, equitable inclusion uh, and tech industry, both internally and externally? And I would, start, I would end where I started with lead with grace. Really understand you know, that your employees, that your colleagues come to, come to work in, with very different perspectives, very different situations, very different life experiences, uh, and to embrace that and to... Um, you know, be confident with it. Uh, and the second would be to use your voice. Uh, the CEO has a very powerful voice, not only internally, but externally. And to use that in those instances where it makes the most sense for your company and where it's most authentic. And, and I think, you know, you can have a very significant impact on your broader community. Emma Passman, Bob Winslow, Jenny Madriaga, Clarence Clayton, thank you very much for joining us at the kitchen table here at Power to Fly for what is a powerful conversation that will continue on, uh, on how to have and, and, and embrace a more equitable, inclusive, and diverse tech industry. Thank you so much for all those uh, in the audience who listened and for your questions. And I want to turn it back to, to uh, Meg and, and Catherine um, to continue with the summit. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of our amazing panelists. This was absolutely wonderful. The comment section was blowing up on the website. I just want to say again, echoing what Lisi said, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us at this amazing kitchen table conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, as we round out the end of day two, I just want to highlight for all y'all that we will be starting tomorrow morning. Um, let's see, the channel kicks off at 10 a.m. We're going to have morning networking starting at 10 a.m. Eastern, so hopefully you'll be there to join us. And don't forget about our upcoming um, virtual job fair. That's happening on Thursday. So make sure that you get signed up for that, and we can't wait to see you back here tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Have a good night.